get back. If you could um, pull up the to come on. And this is a reminder, um, Chair Schwartz, that um, Commissioner Higgins is um, calling in by phone, um, so he will not have a webcam today. Um, but just know that you can call on him. And um, I think we have everyone. Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call to order the City of Santa Barbara Planning Commission meeting for August 13th, 2020. Before I ask Ms. Rydell to call the roll, I'd like to ask Mr. Bolton or Ms. Kokinda to please uh, put up on the screen the instructions for the public if they wish to uh, speak with us today during public comment period. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. Um, the, if you're interested in uh, speaking on one of the uh, items on the agenda today, um, you will need to raise your hand using the hand icon on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, just a note, you only have to click the hand one time to raise it, and that indicates to me that you wish to speak. Um, the When the down arrow, um, the red down arrow sh is shown, it means that your hand is raised. It's a little counterintuitive, but uh, we have a little image at the bottom right that shows the, the hand with a red down arrow means that your hand is raised. Um, so again, um, we will have two minutes to speak uh, when it's your turn, and I will be giving these instructions again at the time uh, the chair opens up public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kokinda. I'd also like the public to know uh, that we are not allowing the pooling or seating of time. So for each member of the public who wishes to speak today, whether during general public comment or on either one of our two agenda items, uh, you'll have two minutes specifically, again, no pooling or seating of time. With that, I'd like to ask our Planning Commission Secretary, Ms. Rydell, to take a voice roll call. But before you do that, could we please have each of the commissioners turn on their webcams and their audio. Uh, Commissioner Higgins is going to be participating today uh, through audio, through his phone uh, only. I think we're all set to go. Ms. Rydell, it's over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is Heidi Rydell, I'll begin the roll call. Uh, Chair Schwartz. Here. Vice Chair Wiscombe. I see you, but I, it looks like you're muted. Well, okay, that was part of me, uh, Vice Chair. It was my fault. Uh, Ellen Kokinda, you're more than welcome. You, you had your mic on earlier and I just didn't unmute you. Sorry. I'm here. Thank you, Ellen. Commissioner Bonderson. Here. Commissioner Escobedo. Here. Commissioner Higgins. Here, audio only. Commissioner Lodge. Here. Commissioner Reed. Here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rydell. Thank you to the commissioners. Uh, now we're going to go to our preliminary matters, and this is the time for requests for continuances, withdrawals, postponements, or addition of ex agenda items uh, from our senior planner, Ms. DeBusk. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. We have no requests. Thank you. Uh, do we have any announcements or appeals? 
We have none. Thank you. Uh, we're next going to go to review consideration and action on the following draft planning commission minutes and resolutions. Uh, today, we just have the meeting minutes from July 23rd, 2020. And I'll take a moment and wait to uh, see and hear if any of the commissioners uh, would like to make revisions to these meeting minutes. Not hearing or seeing anyone, uh, Ms. Rydell, would you please call Madam, for the vote on? Madam Chair, excuse oh, Commissioner me. Commissioner Lott, thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, I did send some one addition and one correction to Ms. Rydell. Um, the addition okay. explains why the, the first bullet in my minutes that um, and they, 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 were, they, were, they weren't substantive, they, in, in, except in so far as they clarified. Okay, let's, um, in, in that I don't have that, and I think the full commission doesn't have that. Ms. Rydell, are you in a position to confirm um, the edit that Commissioner Lodge has requested? I take it, Commissioner Lodge, this is under commissioner comments, and your name right. is first in the sequence of comments? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, the um, edits that Commissioner Lodge sent me were on um, page three of the document, um, and the edits were to the first bullet point, adding the words projects at 410 and 710 State Street meet stormwater requirements without issues. And then the edits to uh, bullet point three are removing the word should and such as those um, changing help to helps and adding the word disappear to the end of the sentence. So um, as Commissioner Lodge stated, just uh, clarifying uh, some of those statements and I captured all of those. Thank you, thanks to both of you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Lodge. Uh, with that, I don't hear or see any other commissioners wanting to make revisions to these. So I'll uh, ask for a motion. I'll move to approve down chair. Thank you, Commissioner Higgins. That's a motion to approve. I'll second. And Commissioner, Commissioner Lodge. So Higgins and Lodge, any discussion on that? Very good. Ms. Rydell, would you please call the voice vote in approving those minutes as amended? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll begin the voice roll call. Commissioner Bonderson? Yes. Commissioner Escobedo? Yes. Commissioner Lodge? Yes. Vice Chair Wiscombe? Yes. Commissioner Higgins? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Chair Schwartz? Yes. That is unanimous, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rydell. Uh, the next item is uh, comments from members of the public pertaining to items not on our agenda today. Um, and before we go to the public at large, Ms. Rydell, do we have any written communications from the public on items not on our agenda? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I believe the commission did receive um, one letter of general correspondence between this hearing and the last hearing. Let me just confirm that. Um, yes, it looks like uh, the commission received correspondence, one letter of correspondence um, on Monday the 10th. And that is all the general written correspondence we have received. Okay. Could you um, uh, just articulate for us the general topic of that general correspondence? Um, I don't know if you see it in I, the subject line to make it handy for you. It says a uh, charrette meeting invite to the planning commission. So it looks like it was an invite to the planning okay, commission. That's from, very good. That's from the AIA Santa Barbara chapter. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rydell. Ms. Kokinda, do we have any members of the public um, waiting in queue to speak to us on items not on our agenda today? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, if you are a member of the public and you wish to speak on items not on the agenda, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon 
Um, the red arrow pointed down means that your hand is raised. Uh, you only have to click it one time. And uh, I do not see anyone who has raised their hand at this moment. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kokenda. Uh, we're gonna now go to our first new item. This is an application of Trish Allen, Suzanne Elledge Planning and Permitting Services, agent for Rondell Dean Broom, owner of 1553 Shoreline Drive. Uh, before we begin our item, Ms. Rydell, did we receive any written communications uh, that's, that are important to identify? Um, Madam Chair, we did receive written correspondence on this item and it was provided to, um, oh, I am mistaken. That is for item B. For item A, we did not receive any written correspondence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'm going to ask uh, staff, I believe this might be Mr. Dostalek, who will be providing us the staff presentation. And we are gonna have a timer up. We see it there of 15 minutes maximum. And then we'll go to the applicant and they too will have a maximum of 15 minutes for their presentation. Welcome, Mr. Dostalek. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Schwartz and fellow commissioners. I'm Robert Dostalek, Associate Planner with the Community Development Department. And Ms. Kokenda, please jump in if my mic is not positioned appropriately. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the project before you is a coastal development permit request for a new residence on a vacant coastal bluff property located at 1553 Shoreline Drive. And the project site lies at the southern terminus of Loyola Drive at its intersection with Shoreline Drive as shown in this slide here. And next slide, please. And this shows a similarly oriented aerial image of the project site. And you can see that it's vacant or undeveloped currently. Uh, next slide, please. And as noted, just to reiterate the project description, the proposal is to construct a new approximately 2,440 square foot two-story residence with an attached 593 square foot two-car garage and accessory improvements include a new patio, pool, spa, and approximately 110 linear feet of fence on a 23,333 square foot lot. The maximum height of the residence would be 20 feet, two inches, and grading for the project would involve approximately 340 cubic yards of cut and 35 cubic yards of fill. Uh, next slide, please. And so th this project has some background that's important to note, particularly as it relates to visual resource policies that are applicable to the project. So as I go through, this will also serve as a bit of a chronology starting back last year in 2019 when the project first started out. And the, so for the, the project was first reviewed by the, sing or the project was reviewed by the single family design board on two separate occasions on August 5th, 2019, and then a few months later in November, on November 11th, 2019. And also the project was submitted prior to the August 2019 certification of the city's updated coastal land use plan by the California Coastal Commission. As I, and as I'm working through the presentation and speaking, um, we, as, as also noted in the staff report, the coastal land use plan is also commonly referred to simply as the LUP. So you'll, you'll probably hear me say that throughout the presentation. And the updated LUP, LUP included new scenic resource and visual quality policies for protection of view corridors and the preparation of a visual evaluation for projects that may affect scenic resources in general. And at the first conceptual review meeting on August 5th, 2019, staff apprised the single family design board of the forthcoming new scenic resources policies of the LUP and requested direction from the board to the applicant for preparation of the required visual evaluation. And so the SFDB defined the boundaries of the neighborhood for the project and provided building configuration and design suggestions for the applicant to explore 
in preparation of the visual evaluation. And then subsequent to the first review by the Single Family Design Board, the project received Planning Commission concept review on October 3rd, 2019. And this was at the applicant's request. And the primary purpose of the, the Planning Commission concept review was to consider alternative site layouts and provide feedback on the project's potential consistency with LUP policies related to scenic resources. And next slide, please. And even more specifically, the applicant desired direction from the Planning Commission on whether the project site actually constituted a view corridor as defined by LUP policy. And at the October 3rd, 2019 meeting, the Planning Commission unanimously concluded that the project site does not constitute a view corridor. And I'll get into a little more detail on what a view corridor is in just a few slides ahead. And next slide, please. So this slide is from an exhibit in the new LUP that shows directional public views and view quality in the Mesa area neighborhood surrounding the project site. And you can see 1553 Shoreline Drive has an arrow pointing to it. And the view cone that's sort of towards the street side of the property catches the front side of the property, but does not extend through the entire depth of the property. However, this exhibit, these are used for general purpose, general reference, and each individual project is evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis for policy consistency. And next slide, please. And these were some sites, or these were some photos from the concept review that the applicant had taken. And this shows the project site from Shoreline Drive that roughly correspond with the area shown in that previous map exhibit. And next slide, please. And these, showed, these photos show a, a more direct alignment with the project site from the north side of Shoreline Drive on the left and from up Loyola Drive in the photo on the right. And next slide, please. And so here's the definition of a view corridor and the associated policy that affords additional protections for this visual resource type. So a view corridor is a narrow view framed on both sides by existing development, including landscaping, large enough to provide a sense of contrast between the urban area and the foreground and important visual resources in the background. And the policy 4.3-6 would apply if it were a view corridor. And that goes on to explain that development shall not obstruct the public scenic view corridors of scenic resources including those of the ocean viewed from the shoreline and of the upper foothills and mountains viewed, respectively from the beach and lower elevations of the city. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Dostala, can you hold on? Sure. Oh, I think, sure. okay. I think Mr. Roy was kind of coming in and out of the webcam. I just, let's pause. Could we pause the clock for a moment, Mr. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kokinda, are we all set with Mr. Roy having the technical support so we don't have this um, kind of in and out effect? Yes, I would just ask Mr. Roy not to um, touch his webcam icon. Um, I've got him muted in case his audio started working and I think he's got the support he needs. But yes, if I could just ask all of the other applicants for the other project to please not touch their webcam icons. Um, we will, when your item is called, uh, we will do it, that, make sure that your webcams are working then. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Dostalek. Thank you. And as previously noted, the, the Planning Commission unanimous, unanimously determined the project site does not constitute a view corridor per the definition in the LUP. And view corridors were meant more to apply to broader views of ocean or mountains and were not necessarily intended to apply to views alongside narrow residential lots. And next slide, please. However, even though it was determined that the project site does not constitute a view corridor specifically, visual resource policy 4.3-5 still applies to the project as public scenic views from Shoreline Drive are protected under this policy. And as such, the requirement to prepare a visual evaluation for this project still remains. And next slide, please. And this goes over the purpose of the visual, visual evaluation. 
The visual evaluation shall be used to evaluate the magnitude and significance of changes in appearance of scenic resources or public scenic views as a result of development. And at the October 3rd, 2019 Planning Commission concept review, the applicant prepared and presented a visual evaluation that included three project design options. And next slide, please. And so this shows design option one that was presented and most commissioners were amenable to design option one. And this concept featured a, a modern low profile flat roof design, which is similar to what was proposed with the residents cited to provide glimpses of the ocean between the proposed structural development and the west property boundary as illustrated by the light blue strip. A modest portion of the building's floor area and massing was devoted to the second story element. The interior setback for the zone district uh, in, on this particular project is six feet. However, to provide expanded visual relief of the development as viewed from Shoreline Drive and Loyola Drive, the option one design incorporated a more generous interior, or also we call it side yard, setback of 10 feet on the west side. And this expanded setback between the building and property line provided a public view toward the ocean from the sidewalk. However, one planning commissioner did comment that view obstructions often come from large, large trees and landscaping. And next slide, please. And this was design option two, and this was the second design option that presented a more whimsical approach to the matter. And this design proposed a periscope near the sidewalk that would look up and over the residence toward the ocean beyond. And in maintenance and practicality comments were received from the commission on this design. And next slide, please. And the final design that was presented, the third one, involved the residents to be right up against the six foot interior setback along the Western property boundary while allowing a view along the east side of the property. And next slide, please. So just to summarize the return to the single family design board on November 11th, 2019, the applicant returned for continued conceptual review of the project with design revisions in response to commissioner comments at the October 3rd, 2019 Planning Commission concept review meeting. At this time, the project was continued indefinitely to the Planning Commission with favorable comments. And next slide, please. And I, I put this policy slide back up just to reiterate the general visual resource policies before I proceed into the current design. The city and state Coastal policies require new development to be cited and designed to protect coastal views and be visually compatible with the character of surrounding areas. And, and on that note, at the November 11th, 2019 SFD meet, meeting, the second time, the board noted that the size, bulk, and scale is in keeping with the FAR standards and that the project has the same plate height of 20 feet as the house next door. In addition, the SFDB comment, commented that the project is appropriate as there are many different types of architecture in the immediate area or the neighborhood previously defined by the board. And the Mesa has a variety of architecture and the project has other modern homes near it. Um, and therefore the project fits into the character of the Mesa neighborhood. And next slide. And so this is the site in the site for the current project and the building is cited to provide interior setbacks beyond the required six feet for the zone district. And the proposed distance between the residence and the eastern property boundary would be just under 12 feet. And this is illustrated as the blue area along the eastern property boundary. And in addition, the, the, the distance between the garage and the western property boundary would be eight feet. And the single family design board and staff were supportive of this design layout. Next slide, please. And this slide shows the proposed landscape plan and land, uh, coastal land use plan policy requires a landscape plan for new development prepared in a manner that is visually compatible, compatible with the character of the area and minimizes impacts to visual and scenic resources. And to complement the increased structural setbacks of the residents from the property boundaries, the plantings proposed in the preliminary landscape plan would allow some views of the Pacific Ocean when viewed from Loyola Drive or Shoreline Drive. And this would be accomplished by planting low flowering succulents along the Eastern property boundary. And along the Western property, along the Western boundary, two flowering trees are proposed to provide privacy between the homes 
and an ornamental five foot tall fence is proposed between the residence and the east property boundary and a five foot tall fence with gate between the garage and the western property boundary. And it might be a little hard to see on the plan, but they are noted there. And this is a safety requirement due to the swimming pool that would be constructed. And however, the, the fences and the gate would be visually open with iron pickets separated four inches on center. And additionally and importantly, a condition of approval has been added to ensure that the plant materials and associated improvements, such as the fence, between the residence and the eastern property boundary do not screen the public view from Loyola Drive or Shoreline Drive. And this condition would also serve to strengthen the project, project's consistency with the applicable visual resource policies. And next slide, please. And so just to wrap up the visual portion, this is a rendering pulled from the landscape plan that shows a front elevation view. And you can see the open areas between the building and the east and west property boundaries. But just do note that there would be an iron picket fence that would exist on both sides. And that there is a fence detail that is provided along with the, the landscape plan. And next slide, please. And Chair Schwartz, I, I may need to go over just a little bit. The, the rest of the report or the rest of the presentation isn't much longer. Okay. Also and, keep in mind, Mr. Dostelek, your presentation doesn't, uh, that time does not cut into, of course, any questions the commissioners may have for you. Sure, thank you and noted. And so now moving on to the po policy consistency related to coastal hazards namely because the project site is a bluff top property. City and state coastal policies require new development to minimize risks to life and property as it relates to geologic impacts, particularly on coastal bluffs. And next slide, please. And so the project site is relatively flat with a gentle slope from Shoreline Drive to the coastal bluff edge. And this slide shows the coastal bluff edge in red. And the coastal bluff edge is a predefined delineation that was certified by the California Coastal Commission several Coastal Commission several years ago. So using this predetermined coastal bluff edge as a starting point, a geologic investigation, also known as a shoreline hazards evaluation in the LUP, was prepared by the applicant's geologist to address geologic conditions of the site and potential impacts related to the proposed project per applicable LUP policies. And the geologic investigation was appropriately prepared using the LUP policies to determine an appropriate coastal bluff edge development buffer from the defined coastal bluff edge. And next slide, please. And so some folks uh, out there may be wondering what on earth is a coastal bluff edge development buffer? And so the purpose of the coastal bluff edge development buffer is to establish a setback from the coastal bluff edge, the distance needed to one, ensure slope stability, also known as the slope stability buffer, to ensure the development is, is not endangered by erosion, uh, the coastal bluff erosion, erosion buffer, and three, to avoid the need for existing and new slope and shoreline protection devices over the expected life of the structure. And just for your own benefit and knowledge, the expected life of residential structures is a minimum of 75 years per the coastal land use plan. And for this project, the geologic report recommends a 76 foot coastal bluff edge development puff buffer. This means that any new permanent structures, such as the residence pool, decks, drainage, must be located a minimum of 76 feet from the coastal bluff edge. And as this slide illustrates, all the proposed permanent development is positioned landward of the coastal bluff edge development buffer. And next slide, please. And however, temporary development such as pavers and fences that can readily be removed may be placed within the coastal bluff edge development buffer pursuant to LUP policy. And so the oblong red circles in the slide identify these areas for the project. This includes approximately 110 linear feet of 42 inch tall black vinyl coated chain link fence set back 10 feet from the coastal bluff edge, which is a requirement, stepping stones and portable furnishings. And these would all be consistent with LUP policy. And before moving on, it should be noted that the city's master environmental assessment references a probable mature landslide on the subject property and neighboring parcels. 
However, the geologic report provides substantial discussion regarding this potential slope movement feature. And based on the site inspection of the property and review of historic aerial photographs by the consulting geologist, it was concluded that the subject property is not located within a landscape, landslide area as the MEA suggests. And getting towards the end here, next slide, please. And so to touch on the stormwater and drainage plan, the Coastal Land Use Plan also includes policies that require new development to prevent an increase in water percolation into the bluff and to have drainage systems that convey stormwater runoff away from the bluff. And the project requires a tier three stormwater treatment plan to meet the city's requirement for water quality treatment. And a stormwater drainage analysis was prepared for the project. And this slide illustrates a stormwater control plan designed to capture the runoff from the proposed structures and other impermeable surfaces, such as roofs, patios, and decks. And stormwater runoff from the main structure would be conveyed to a permeable paver driveway installation in the northern portion of the property. And the hardscape runoff from the new patio and pool areas would surface drain to proposed treatment planters with impermeable liners. And these planters would be routed to the proposed storm drain that would tie into an existing 36 inch public storm drain that is located within a, an easement along the western property line on the neighboring property. And the, the location of this tie in is shown as the oblong yellow shape in the slide, as you can see, that it would be landward of the upper extent of the coastal bluff edge development buffer. And incorporation of the recommendations of the geologic and stormwater technical reports and the proposed landscape plan into the project design would result in a project that minimizes risk, risks to life and property. Additionally, the project was designed to avoid construction in unstable areas and proposes drainage improvements that reduce runoff toward and over the bluff edge. Therefore, the project can be found consistent with the applicable Coastal Act and land use plan policies. And next slide, please. And for environmental review, staff determined that the project is categorically exempt from further environmental review pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act, guidelines section 15303. This section allows for construction of one single family residence in a residential zone, as well as accessory structures. And next slide, please. And to conclude, the project would be consistent with zoning and applicable Coastal Act and LUP policies and recommends the Planning Commission approve the project based on the findings and subject to the conditions contained in the staff report. And that concludes the staff presentation and we are available for any questions and please pardon me for going over a little bit and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dostalek. Uh, Ms. Allen, will you or another member of the applicant team be providing your 15 minute presentation today. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Schwartz. Thank you and thanks to Mr. Dostalek for a very uh, thorough presentation with excellent background. I think he hit all the salient points. I would just like to introduce my project team and then hand it over to them to make uh, the bulk of the presentation. So with us today, we have architect Tom Oxner, also landscape architect Kim True, uh, Tom and Kim will be giving the presentation. We'll go um, quickly through our slides. And on hand, we have uh, our civil engineer, Wes Barber with Flowers, um, for any questions you may have about the stormwater plan. And also we have our project geologist, Adam Simmons, uh, in the sidelines in case you have questions for them. So that's it for me. And Tom, take it away. Welcome, Mr. Austin. Me too. There you go. Now you're unmuted. Good afternoon, Chair Schwartz and Commissioners. Um, well, I tell you, my presentation just got um, incredibly shorter after hearing Robert. That was great. He really touched on everything. But what I've, I've got slides here now with uh, with not uh, words for all of them. So I think what we'll do is we'll just kind of uh, go through them. And I just want to make a couple of points on some areas that um, I'd like to enhance on what Robert had said. So if we could go through, um, move past to slide number five. So I just wanted to touch on this, just since you had seen this project back in October, the um, really the only change to it has been that it, as Robert stated, it got moved 12 feet um, into the lot from the easterly property line. And then that, that did change the 
the FAR from 71 down to 65 as it is now. Um, otherwise, it's the same project. Next slide, please. And so this just really illustrates um, the second story mass, of course, is in the same position. And we've located some solar panels on the first floor roof of that mass um, at approximately 13 feet above grade. Um, I just wanted to point that out. Next slide, please. And then as the architecture did get developed a bit, we've got simulated wood siding around um, this structure. We've got the deep overhangs with a, uh, um, a, a dark anodized fascia and, and matching windows. And we've carried that throughout. And I think that'll be a, a fairly soft treatment for this site. Uh, next slide, please. And again, just the other elevations of this building. Next slide, please. And then this just um, just reinforces the plate heights, uh, nine feet uh, ceiling on both of the levels that are of two story. And then of course the one story has a um, 11 foot plate with a 12 foot height to the roof. Uh, next slide, please. And I just wanted to point out the story poles. I think um, not everyone was out at the site visit, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that the story poles were set at the edges of the overhang and not at the uh, the face of the facade. Um, and that's really the only point I've got behind this. I've got several uh, photos of the story pole site that I'll go through with just a very simple direction uh, comment on. Next slide, please. And so this would be um, with your back to the ocean looking north through the site with the story poles up and the adjacent house to the east um, in view. Next slide. And we've got looking towards the ocean. It's cloudy, so you can't see it, but it is there. And this is from the street looking through the site. Next slide. And then this is directly across the street looking right into the site with the, the trees on the frontage there. Next slide. And then this is up um, La Jolla looking down um, and you can barely see the story poles, but um, I thought I would include it. Next slide. And this is a little closer. This is the first intersection and you can, I think now you can see the story poles. Next slide. And then this is directly across the street at the intersection. Next slide. And so I, um, Robert said everything there is to say on this. I'm going to, I just want you to know that we have Wes uh, Barber here, our civil engineer, and he can speak to this stormwater tier three stormwater plan if you'd like. Next slide. And um, I'd like to introduce um, Kim Truly. She does, I think she can take a little time on the landscape plan. I don't think anyone has really um, uh, uh, looked at this closely. She's done a great job and I'm excited to hear her talk her way through it. So Kim, you're up. And part of my interruption, uh, Chair Schwartz and Mr. Oxner, it looks like uh, Kim just got cut off line. Um, so I, she might need another moment to try to log back in. Um, I will monitor, but I might suggest, um, I don't know if you're able to um, carry on. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best without the technical terms. So great, yeah, so, so the, the concept here is to create um, the focal point here is really about creating separation from the one story mass um, from the street. So the graduation of landscaping and the subtle transparency of the landscaping from the sidewalk when you look into the property to screen and, and add a bit of privacy to the to the um, one story glass mass is, is very important. And then also the owner wants to main utilize the 12 foot separation along uh, between the easterly property line and the building to create sort of a visual connection there of the ocean and be very inviting um, through that corridor between this structure and the adjacent structure. Um, and there have Pardon been some, uh, Mr. okay, there we go. Now, now we got pro. Okay, I tried doing it without you, Kim, but you take over. Oh, we're in landscape? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, beautiful. Um, so <laughs> I don't know where we left off, but the landscape plan is proposing to create a beautiful water wise tropical style generous landscape buffer between the street and the living room, which is substantially set back from the road. 
This large buffer of layered landscape will create an attractive separation between the one-story pavilion and shoreline drive. The layers include palm trees, tropical accent plants such as cycads and giant bird of paradise, raised planters with tropical foliage plants, bold succulents and colorful flowering shrubs and ground cover. The single family design board strongly supported the landscape plan and the plant palette. The water-wise tropical succulent plant palette is carried through to the back of the property, wrapping around the pool and spa deck areas. A drift of low flowering shrubs, which include bougainvillea and sages, blends the landscape into the beautiful California native bluff plantings and irrigation system, which are proposed to be consistent with coastal land use policies. Existing ornamental and non-native plants landward of the coastal bluff edge, such as the Russian thistle, mustard, mallow, and freeway daisy would be removed in a sensitive manner and are proposed to be replaced with our native plant palette, which includes many flowering species to provide habitat as well as low growing woody species, which are known for their slope stabilization qualities. All existing native shrubs, such as the atroplex and the lemonade berry would remain. The intent is to provide an attractive landscape to maintain the ocean views and be consistent with the landscape conditions of approval and coastal land use policies. And that concludes our presentation and our team is here to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you all. Very good, so we can stop the clock. Presentation is concluded. And uh, I'd like to first go to staff to see if there are any members of the public waiting to speak on this item. Um, so Mr. Oxner and Ms. True, you can go ahead and close your webcams for the moment. And to Ms. Kokindo. And thank you, Chair Schwartz. Um, okay, for those of uh, members of the public who are joining us, um, if you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand um, by clicking on the hand icon on the control panel. Uh, just know that you only have to click the hand one time and a red arrow that's pointed down indicates that your hand is raised. So if you look in the bottom right corner of your screen, um, that indicates a raised hand. Um, I do not see anyone at the moment who has raised their hand. Um, and Forgive me, I can't remember if you've already asked um, Mrs. Rydell if we received written public comment on this item. I don't Not see anyone. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kokinda. Ms. Rydell? Yes, um, I just wanted to reiterate what um, I said at the beginning of this item, which is that we did not receive any written correspondence for this project. Thank you, thank Ms. You. Rydell. All right, so now it's back to the commission. I wanna first go to Commissioner Higgins by audio, just cause I'm not sure how long he'll be able to participate today, hopefully for the entire hearing. Commissioner Higgins, did you have any questions for staff or the applicant team at this time? Uh, Madam Chair, I have no questions. It was a great presentation. We've obviously seen the project before in a prior hearing, so no questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from other commissioners and as I'm waiting for the webcams to come on, just to remind us that today the required application uh, that we'll be deliberating on is a coastal development permit. Commissioner Wiscombe, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple quick questions. Um, I think the first one is for Mr. Barber since he's here. Um, I just want to understand the um, the uh, the drainage is shown on sheet C1, and um, is all the runoff that's south of the pool hardscape um, going to go downslope to the block? Is that is that how it's designed? Yeah, that's correct. <clears throat> that's uh, just going to be a natural vegetated area following the basically undisturbed slope for the most part. Right. Okay, great. That's what I thought, but I just I just wanted to to make sure of that. Um, then um, thank you, Mr. Barber. I think that's um, oh, I actually do have a question on the drainage system while I'm while I'm on with you. I'm kind of taking these out of order. Um, 
uh, on page 52 of 88 in our report, drainage systems policy 5.1-39A talks about phasing out drainage pipes partially or fully down the coastal bluff face. And this, this project is connecting into a city drain, from my understanding, that is going down the coastal bluff face. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And um, so the next step in that is, since this is a city-owned pipe, was there any consideration to the policy, or is it simply infeasible to phase out this pipe? I, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear it officially from the expert. Uh, well, we did, an, uh, as far as phasing out the pipe, it's my understanding that uh, that pipe is... Uh, it's, it's in use and I haven't heard any plans for the, an alternative type of drainage system for surf to that entire area. Okay. There's quite a bit of offsite tributary area that train that, that drains to that from uh, westerly on shoreline drive and then uh, uh, northerly um, up towards the, that portion of the Mesa. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't heard of anything as far as phasing that pipe out. Okay. I'm, I'm really just, dotting my I's and crossing my T's because this is a um, new land use policy for us. So I, I wanna make sure that we cover it so and get it on the record. So on that same policy, and thank you, Mr. Bolton for putting this up, the same policy says if infeasible, so let's consider it infeasible given the number of neighbors that are hooked into this system in one way or another. Um, Pipe is permitted if it meets all the criteria listed. And I just want to make sure that these criteria that are listed here, um, that it meets all of these criteria so that it can remain. So the question is, is does the pipe meet all of the criteria? Right. So if we consider this infeasible to remove it from the coastal bluff base, which is what A is, is saying, if, if to to the maximum extent feasible removing it from in other words they're discouraging these pipes going down the coastal bluff so so if it if it's infeasible to do that then these criteria in b one two and three need to be met and i just want to make sure that that um you can check all those boxes uh, that would probably take a bit of study to be able to give an accurate answer. Um, but I think at this time, I would say it's infeasible just, you know, just off my understanding of the project area. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll accept that then. And then there was one more question um, on that. Uh, um, oh, in Mr. Simmons' report, um, a recommendation 6.4, erosion and drainage control, noted that the pipe has an equipment clean out without a cap. And I'm wondering if there will be a cap installed and by whom. It recommends that there be a cap installed. Yeah, I'm sure that, uh, when we get into final engineering, if we need to uh, install a clean out with a cap, that that could be done. I don't see a problem Okay. There. Mr. Simmons, that was your recommendation, right? That, that a cap be installed? Uh, yes, uh, Vice Chair, uh, that's correct. We want to make sure that is sealed so that uh, there are no critters falling into our drain pipe there. Oh, okay, great. That's great, thank you. And um, I just have two final questions. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I wanted to go to the fence details and, and maybe one of you can answer this. Um, there's a proposed fence, um, the, uh, the chain link fence, the 42 inch high fence. Um, and I'm looking at the fence detail and then I'm looking at the flowering shrubs that are planning to go along the fence. I think that's right. And it's true, right? And, Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and I just want to make sure with that drainage going down towards the bluff, the natural area that, mm -hmm. um, that these shrubs, you know, that drop flowers and leaves, et cetera, um, that they're not going to trap debris and impede water flow. No, it would be the same types of native vegetation we have there. Um, so we're not creating a large dense 
mass of leaf okay. litter on the edge uh -huh. so that we can continue that natural drainage pattern. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. And then um, my final question is um, uh, Mr. Simmons in his report uh, under recommendations, this is page 76 of 88, uh, continuation of 6.5 recommendation vegetation recommends the implementation of revegetation program as soon as practical. And um, what do what does one consider a practical time? Obviously, the revegetation is going to help with the um, as the project moves along as construction moves along. So. Um, I don't didn't find this conditioned in the conditions of approval uh, that it be revegetated as soon as practical. But are you planning on making this an early part of the uh, project? I mean, my that, that statement's more to do with areas that are being uh, impacted by uh, uh, development for the most part. Oh, okay. Right? okay. But whatever's whatever's on the south side of the setback line, uh, those will all be hand dug, replacing non-native with native. Uh, so that'll be a, uh, a very uh, small impact to their overall plan. But I, I think my, my idea is to make sure that if there's something being removed vegetation wise in the area where construction is to be occurred, that replanting uh, as soon as practical, so we don't have uh, excessive erosion for the most okay. part. Okay, there's, there's not much vegetation on the site right now. No, so. no, just grasses. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all of you, and thank you, Madam Chair. That's the end of my questions. Thank you, Commissioner Wiscom. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any questions for staff or the applicant team? I'm gonna wait a minute to let technology work its way through for us. I am not seeing any webcams coming on. Uh, I would like to come, uh, I'll then go next and uh, we'll move forward from there. I wanna come back to a question Commissioner Wiscom had. Uh, this is on page 52 of 88 in our packet, policy 5.1-39. And it's this item B with several sub bullets connected to it. And the reason I wanna press for what I would like is kind of a more certain answer, clear answer, is that when I look at this last sentence in that paragraph, where infeasible new drainage systems on coastal bluff faces may only be permitted if each of the following criteria are met. So let's look at the criteria. We have um, I, double I, triple I, and then we have two sub items under triple I. I would really like to hear some concrete responses to a commitment assurance that each of the criteria will be met because that's what's incumbent upon us with this new policy. Could someone speak to that on behalf of the property owner and the applicant team, please? I would like to go ahead and offer that we are not actually proposing to uh, develop or construct a new drainage system on a coastal bluff face. We're, uh, what we're proposing to do is to connect uh, the new drainage system, which is beyond the limit of the coastal bluff face setback uh, to an existing drainage pipe, which is ex currently positioned on the coastal bluff face. So, so it's, uh, in my mind, it, it makes it uh, that these really aren't applicable. Uh, Ms. DeBusk? Yes, thank you, Chair Schwartz. Um, I would like to just clarify that, yes, this policy is related to when new drainage systems are proposed on the bluff. In this case, the applicant is using an existing drainage system, which is um, item two there. Um, but that's if it's not feasible to use the existing drainage system. So these are all um, policies that we need to look at if they're proposing a new pipe off the bluff. 
Okay, so when Commissioner uh, Wiscom used the phrase, I think, checking the box, in other words, we've reviewed this and we're in compliance is the bottom line there. Correct, Correct. staff Mr. finds Bus that the project okay. is in compliance. Yes, yes, very good. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll ask um, at this time for a thank you to all of you. You can go ahead and uh, turn off your webcams. I'm gonna ask the commissioners to turn their webcams on. It's now time for comments and deliberations. And just to recap for us in terms of what is before us, which is a coastal development permit. And uh, by way of reference, let's just look at the findings uh, that we need to make. Uh, so on page eight of 88 in our packet, Roman numeral nine, we have findings that we need to make coastal development permit. The project is consistent with the policies of the California Coastal Act, et cetera. I'm gonna wait and somebody can ultimately make a motion and, and read that language into the record. And Commissioner Higgins, are you still with us as well? Okay, we'll, we'll see if Commissioner Higgins can join in just a moment again. Uh, so with that, comments, deliberations, let's hold off for a motion until we uh, allow everyone to express themselves. And then I wanna also, I'm looking for Commissioner Lodge. Is she with us by audio staff? Do we have her available? So I, uh, Chair Schwartz, I sent uh, Commissioner, there you are. Okay, perfect. Very good. Okay, Commissioner Lodge is with us as well. Um, so let's just, um, go down the line, Commissioner Wiscom, and then we'll, as I said, we'll just go right down the line here. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my comments are, are really very brief. Um, I think the architecture is elegant and fits in well, and I appreciate the, the um, shifting to create that Eastern uh, view, <clears throat> view corridor for the public. Um, I uh, thought the, I think the landscape plan is very thoughtfully done. And um, I also appreciate the um, thoughtfulness to uh, the drainage and how that's all going to work. I think, I think that's worked out well. And I'm uh, very happy to support uh, the findings and the project. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Escobedo, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to echo many of those same sen sentiments. I think this is a thoughtful project. Um, I'm happy to see that solar was incorporated. Uh, I, I loved the landscape plan. Um, so I, I'm also happy to support the findings in the staff report. Thank you. Commissioner Bonderson. Thank you. I'm not going to add much to it because I think uh, Vice Chair Wiscom took the took the words out of our mouth and then said it so nicely. I just want to uh, emphasize one point that she did make that I feel very strongly about, and that is that the architecture is very beautifully done and executed. Um, so nice to see um, designs like this in our community. I have no problems with the findings as they've been presented. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Reed. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, support the findings. I think it's a good project. Um, I think the applicant went above and beyond in uh, accommodating the visual resource policies. Um, it's impressive that they are so far below the maximum height, the maximum FAR, uh, that they've widened their interior setbacks. Um, in doing so, reducing the FAR from already a reasonable FAR to a, a, a pretty drastically reduced uh, in comparison to the maximum. So quite an effort and uh, I, I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do concur with Commissioner Wisdom's remarks and I just want to add that I appreciate the effort to minimize the size of the second story. So I'd be supporting the project. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lodge. I'm going to come back again to see if Commissioner Higgins is with us by audio. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, 
nothing uh, really material to add, just uh, congratulations and acknowledgement to the designer and the owner, applicant team for a less is more uh, project and uh, respectful of the, um, the neighborhood. So um, I'll support it. Thank you, Commissioner Higgins. Uh, I agree with all of the comments my colleagues have made. And when I think back to the October 2019 concept review that we had and how responsive and respectful the applicant team has been since then in working with the single family design board and staff and consideration of the neighborhood, uh, this being a much beloved area for pedestrians and bicyclists, tourists, locals, uh, in terms of shaping the shaping and siting the orientation of the home, along with uh, the very attractive architectural design. Uh, very much appreciate that. And I quite frankly can't recall in recent years, a single family residence that's come to the planning commission with such modest floor area ratio calculations. Um, and so that the property owner uh, in conjunction with the applicant team has been willing to do that, I think expresses uh, their good neighbor values and commitment. So my appreciation to them for that. Uh, so with that, I'll look to my colleagues to see if anyone would like to make a motion. Commissioner Wiscom, uh, please uh, go ahead and turn your audio back on. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will make a motion. Uh, did you want me to repeat one and two here for the record or just I make think the that, I think that, No, I think that would be good just okay. as we see it on page eight of 88. Okay, so I will uh, make a motion to um, make the findings as found in um, section nine on page eight of 88 of our staff report and um, also move the conditions of approval as uh, prepared. Second. Very good, we have a first and a second. Any discussion? from the commission on that motion. Um, and I don't see or hear any. So Ms. Rydell, would you please uh, conduct a voice vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin the voice roll call vote. Commissioner Escobedo? Yes. Commissioner Lodge? Yes. Vice Chair Wiscom? Yes. Commissioner Higgins? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner Bonderson? Yes. Chair Schwartz? Yes. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so to the applicant, uh, you have an approval from the Planning Commission today on the Coastal Development Permit. Uh, this is in the appealable jurisdiction of the Coastal Zone. Uh, so I'd like to announce a 10-day appeal. And uh, with that, uh, I think that we can move on. What I'm going to do at this time regarding our second item is to read the item into the record right now. Uh, and then Commissioner Reed is going to come online and make a statement. And then we're gonna go to a break and return at 2.15. Uh, so our second item is the application of Paseo Nuevo owner, LLC, agent for city of Santa Barbara, owner of 739 State Street, Paseo Nuevo Mall. Commissioner Reed, would you please turn on your webcam and make your uh, statement before we go to a break? Thank you, Chair Schwartz. Uh, I will be recusing myself from this new item. Uh, due to a financial interest at 801 State Street. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, Commissioner Reed. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, take a break, returning at 2.15 to begin that item. We're going to go ahead and put our recess slide up on the screen.
We'll be back at 2.15. Thanks you everyone.
afternoon. I'm going to reconvene the City of Santa Barbara Planning Commission meeting to order. Today is August 13th, 2020. I'd like to ask the commissioners to please turn their webcams back on um, so that I know that we are back from recess. And I'll also ask Commissioner Higgins if he is still with us by audio. I am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Okay, it looks like we have everyone here again. Commissioner Reed uh, is uh, recused from this item. So we're going to continue. And just to recap, uh, this second and last item in our hearing today is an application of Paseo Nuevo LLC, agent for City of Santa Barbara, owner of 739 State Street, Paseo Nuevo Mall. Uh, and I think we're first going to go to a staff report uh, I've prearranged that the staff, um, combination of staff likely, will have a total of 30 minutes for their presentation. And then we're going to go to the applicant team and they too will have uh, a total of 30 minutes uh, for their various representatives all together to make a presentation. And again, any questions following from the commission does not cut into this time. So it's uh, separate and in addition. Uh, do we have staff ready to begin their presentation? There's Ms. Connect and Ms. Kennedy. Uh, let's wait till the clock resets and you let us know when you're ready to begin. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm Kathleen Kennedy, Project Planner for this project. And the item before you today is the Paseo Nuevo Development Agreement. So I will start the staff presentation uh, and then Ms. Connect from the city attorney's office will um, present the key provisions of the development agreement. And then I will uh, finalize the presentation. I wanted to let you know that we also have Alan Coton, real estate economist, as well as Dennis Roy, outside legal counsel, available to answer questions as well. Next slide, please. So the purpose of today's hearing is to review the proposed development agreement. We also refer to it as the DA. You may hear people referring to it that way. And it's between the city as the owner and ground lessor and Paseo Nuevo owner, the ground lessee, prepared in accordance with the term sheet that was authorized by the city council. And to make a recommendation to city council to either approve the DA, approve it with modifications or disapprove the DA. Next slide, please. So I'd like to clarify the scope of review. It is limited to the review of the development agreement only. There are no changes proposed to the 75 year lease that we'll be talking about. And that extends from 1990 to the year 2065. Unlike other development agreements that you may have looked at or will be looking at in the future that require um, new residential or non-residential buildings as part of the project. This particular development agreement uh, does not have any development approvals attached to it. Next slide, please. California government code provides some guidance for cities to enter into development agreements. And this provides applicants with greater certainty in the approval process without jeopardizing public agency controls. Our city council here in Santa Barbara approved resolution 89-120, which established procedures for city review of the development agreements. And that included that the planning commission would recommend approval or approval with modifications to the city council, or they would disapprove the development agreement, which would be a final action unless that's appealed to the city council. Next slide. Here's an aerial photo of the Paseo Nuevo Mall area outlined in yellow. You'll see that um, the development agreement only includes those areas. It does not include the Macy's building, which is to the uh, lower section of the photo, nor the Nordstrom's building closer to the top. Next slide. So I'd like to give you a little background of the Paseo Nuevo Mall and some of the um, things that have happened since um, this was developed in 1987. So the redevelopment agency in Santa Barbara and the Paseo Nuevo Associates entered into an agreement that provided for the development of the mall and parking facilities. 
And then in 1989, three 75-year term leases were created. The first one for the open air mall and that terminates December 31st, 2065. And I just made a note here that we uh, stated incorrectly in the staff report that all three leases would end in 2064. However, it's, it's correct that uh, this particular one for the open air mall would uh, terminate in 2065. And then the second lease for the Ortega or Macy's building, and then a third lease for the uh, Nordstrom building. And just a reminder that this development agreement that you're reviewing today only pertains to the open air mall section. Next slide. Some additional background. In 2015, JP Morgan, as the mall tenant, sells a minority interest to Pacific Retail Capital Partners as managing partners to revitalize the struggling Paseo Nuevo Mall. And the mall lease was assigned to a new entity called Paseo Nuevo Owner LLC. And it, we refer to them as PO, and we'll be doing that throughout the presentation. In 2017, the mall was nearly 30 years old, had not undergone any renovations, and the industry standard calls for a major reinvestment approximately every 10 to 15 years. PO approached the city at that time with a proposal for a significant mall renovation but indicated they could not proceed unless the city provided a 28 year lease extension to a lease that had 48 remaining years at that time. Next slide. In 2017, the city retained Alan Coton, a real estate economist to evaluate PNO, PNO's proposal. Paseo Nuevo and State Street commercial core area were beginning to face a mounting decline in sales and loss of tenants at that time. Staff proceeded with negotiations on the basis that substantial reinvestment to the State Street anchor would revive State Street and the commercial core. However, then Macy's closed, creating even a greater concern regarding Paseo Nuevo. Next slide, please. At the end of 2017, the Thomas fire and its aftermath caused significant decline in sales during the holiday season for all of the downtown core. In 2018, Macy's lease was purchased and assigned to Paseo Nuevo Owner 2, which was comprised of JP Morgan and the Pacific Retail Capital Partners. In February 2019, last year, Council approved a non binding term sheet negotiated by staff and PO and directed staff to negotiate the development agreement. PO reimbursed the city $150,000 for outside legal and consultant services. Next slide. Negotiations continued in good faith for the next 18 months. During this time, retail closures on State Street and the downtown commercial core accelerated. On April 28th of this year, council received the status report on the renovation project and directed staff to continue preparation of the development agreement. After that, Nordstrom's closed, leaving the mall without an anchor tenant. Then the coronavirus pandemic appeared with its significant economic impacts. Then in June of 2020, a few months ago, the development agreement was finalized and submitted to the planning division for review. Next slide. I'd like to talk just briefly about the design review and environmental review as it relates to this project. All the renovation work that was done in this currently um, under construction at Paseo Nuevo Mall was granted approval already by the Historic Landmarks Commission. They went through that process um, from 2016 up until just um, December of 2019. And the development agreement has been determined to be exempt from any further environmental review. Next slide, please. So the renovation project is almost complete. It consists of a number of items listed here. Um, if you went to the site visit, you would have noticed the progress that's being made. Essentially, it's the replacement of all paving, installation of new tiles, uh, replacing uh, the lighting, new paint, new landscaping and planters, some new hardscape elements such as the fire pit, a uh, new interactive water educational exhibit as well. Next slide, please. 
Here's an overall site plan of the site. Um, I will not go into much detail of this. Um, I know the applicant team will be presenting uh, these in much more detail. Next slide, please. This just shows a rendering of the Canon Perdido entry area that's being um, renovated. Uh, you may recall if you were at the site visit that we stood out there and um, looked at what had been done so far. Next slide, please. Okay, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Connect, who will talk about the development agreement in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Uh, as Ms. Kennedy said, I'm Sarah Connect, Assistant City Attorney. And I wanted today to go over a couple of the key provisions of the development agreement. Um, and also I'm available to answer questions that may come up later. Um, so as Ms. Kennedy mentioned, the development agreement does not amend the ground lease. And the ground lease was entered into in 1989 um, with a 75 year term uh, with the original uh, lessee was Santa Barbara Associates. And since that time, it's been assigned, I think five times until it finally ended up with uh, Pasea Nuevo owners um, and they're the, the current applicants today before you. Um, so the, the purpose of the development agreement is that it shifts some of the monetary obligations that um, were uh, assigned to the city of Santa Barbara when it assumed and took ownership of the underlying property from the redevelopment agency when the redevelopment agency dissolved in 2012 and the city took ownership of the property in about 2015. Um, also, the, um, what, what, we, what we intend to do is it also enhances some of the operating obligations under the lease that I'll, that I'll go into in further detail. So uh, Paseo Nuevo owners is obligated under the proposed development agreement to invest $20 million in renovation work. And $18 million of that has been expended, as, as, as you can see, as you saw on the site visit. $2 million of that in tenant, tenant improvement work is, is about, about that is left. And that's required to be completed by year five of the development agreement. Um, uh, um, an important facet of the development agreement has to do with the parking business and improvement district assessment um, shift. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit further detail. And um, so uh, part of the agreement in 1989 was that the agency was obligated to construct parking structures two and 10, and also provide ongoing public parking to uh, in the, in the amount of a hundred and or a thousand 1,100 parkings, public parking spaces to customers of Paseo Nuevo. And that's an ongoing obligation contained in the parking covenants for 75 years. It's concurrent with the terms of the lease. Um, the city is obligated to maintain and operate the public, parkings, public parking lots. Um, the lease agreements contain a provision that Paseo Nuevo is obligated to pay up to $100,000 a year in PBIA payments. Over and above that annual payment, the agency and now the city is obligated to pay that PBIA payment. Part of the development agreement is that over and above $100,000 payment shifts back to the San Nuevo or, or PNO, excuse me. So um, when we originally negotiated this agreement, uh, we, had, we had thought that over the course of this agreement, it would probably, we, we capped the agreement at, at $300,000 as PBIA's obligation. Um, and that's what the agreement uh, provides for. So, so the agreement provides that PN, that PNO will be obligated to pay up to $300,000 so they're already obligated to pay $100,000. So the maximum requirement, in addition to what they have to pay already, is $200,000. And we also have a CPI um, trigger on that. Um, but 
we have um, realized that um, with the closure of Nordstrom's, with the closure of Macy's, with the uh, now kind of significant uh, economic decline of the mall and the fact that it's probably maybe no longer a regional mall, it's unlikely that we will ever actually see a $300,000 payment over the life of this 40, 45 year old or uh, 45 long year long development agreement. So we've had to recalculate, you know, what we will likely, um, the payment we will likely receive over the course of this this agreement. So we think that in 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 real terms, what the city will likely receive on an annual basis is probably more like we I have here one hundred and thirty thousand is probably more like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in payments on this. And that's that is actually that's that is a, a gross figure. So that's including the hundred hundred thousand they're already paying. So if you subtract out what what you know they're already obligated to pay, it's probably more like fifty thousand net benefit to the city. So uh, this is important because we also have a finding. You will see um, what is the the net benefit to the city, and we have said that the city will will get about a net benefit of about three hundred thousand dollar direct benefit from this, and um, we need to change that figure. And Ms. Kennedy will talk about that later when she gets to the findings. But we need to um, lower that amount to about 150,000. So we'll we'll get to that later. But I I wanted to bring that to your attention. So uh, next slide, please. Um, also, more monetary costs that we've shifted to PNO through this agreement is the agency now the city has been paying. The, the recycling and the waste charges to the tune of about sixty thousand dollars annually. We're shifting that to PNO. Um, Paseo Nuevo PNO has agreed to make a one-time two hundred thousand dollar payment to the city to assist in uh, city's programs with regard to helping homeless programs. Um, the PNO has agreed to assume uh, this program that the city has been engaged in, where the city pays 40% uh, of a discounted parking rate to Paseo Nuevo employees. So that 40% discount will no longer be paid by the city, it will be picked up by PNO going forward. So that um, amounts to about $30,000 annually. So that'll get shifted over to PNO. Um, PNO has agreed um, to operate and maintain uh, Paseo Nuevo Mall in a first class retail, as a first class retail commercial center. Now that, that obligation is already in the lease. But um, what we've done is we've added in five or six specifically named comparable first, what we consider to be first class retail commercial centers in the Southern California area that we, they're obligated to maintain their centers comparable to. And if they don't, we have specific um, provisions in there that we can we can enforce. And we have a liquidated damages provision that we've added so that if they don't maintain the center, we can impose liquidated damages. We also have a provision where um, we have an inspector that can go out every three years at their at PNO's expense and inspect the, the center to make sure that these obligations are being complied with. So we've added teeth to the development agreement where the, where the lease doesn't really have that kind of, of teeth. Um, we've also, we've added a, a clause where there's an annual monitor, monitoring provision. Um, the, this, this kind of, this monitoring provision is already in um, the, the state statute and it's already in the, the uh, resolution that the city requires. Next slide, please. Um, PNO is obligated to pay all of the city's 
out-of-pocket costs, both for enforcement and implementation of the development agreement and also implementation of the ground lease. That's a provision that's new to the ground lease. They weren't obligated to do that before. Um, another new provision is this, uh, what we call a home run protection clause, so that if PNO sells or assigns the ground lease, the first sale assignment of the ground lease to a third party, a defined third party, the city has some opportunity to um, share in the proceeds of that sale. 10% of the net sales proceeds. Now that is a highly defined uh, provision. And um, I just need to be clear that with the declining sales and with the loss of the two anchor tenants, uh, we think it's probably highly unlikely that the city will ever see any benefit from this clause. Next slide. Um, the, 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 city, the city also has agreed, and this was a, a key provision to PNO, that at the end of the 45 year term of this development agreement and the end of the ground lease, PNO will be entitled to a one time executory right to extend the ground lease by 28 years. And, 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 and what that means, what an executory right means in legal terms is it's not a right that vests now. It is not an option. And you may hear uh, PNO define it as an option, but it is not an option. What an executory right means is it means that it's something that depends on something else happening first. It it is it is depends on uh, other things happening before that right is vests. So in this case, it depends on first the DA going through 40 a 45 year term. It also depends on the lease going through all of its 45 year term. And it depends on both of those agreements, the, the, the lessee and PNO abiding and performing all of the obligations in both of those agreements but, and not terminating either of those agreements and there being no breaches or defaults in either of those agreements that are uncured before that right vests or before that right becomes a right. And they have to timely exercise that, that right to exercise you know, their right to extend the lease. So it's it's very much uh, to be determined kind of extension. Um, and I wanna make that clear. Um, also, if PNO defaults, which would result in a termination of this development agreement, not only would they lose that right to exercise the 28 year extension, but they would also be obligated to continue to make this PBI, P, PBIA payment, the trash payment, and the reimbursement of the city fees for the duration of the ground lease. So these things continue on. Um, if PNO breaches breaches the de development agreement, their sole remedy against the city is for specific specific performance. Next slide, please. So um, there were some questions from some of the commissioners about the, the, the timeline, because I know the timelines on these various agreements are long and they're kind of confusing. So we wanted to just clarify. And with regard to the ground lease, um, it, the ground lease is 75 years long and it, it actually was executed in 1989, um, but, the terms of the ground lease say that it didn't actually take effect for one year until the memorandum of lease recorded. So it really began in 1990 for 75 years until 2065. Um, the other two leases, as Ms. Kennedy said, began, it began a year later. So they're like 2064 or a year earlier. So, and um, 
in 2017 is when negotiations of this development agreement began. At that time, there was 48 years remaining on the lease. Uh, PNO came to us and said, we want to restart the clock. We want a new 75 year term on the lease. That's why we, they wanted another 28 years on their lease. So that, that is why they asked for this extension. They wanted to restart the clock. Um, 2020, and, and I know yesterday there was some mention of a, the, the mall's 30 years old. So in 2020, the mall was 30 years old. It took a couple of years to construct the mall. That's where that comes in. So 45 years remaining on the lease. 2065 is the end of the lease. If it's extended for 28 years, it, it from 2065, that terminates in 2093. We're, we're, we're kind of, you know, these are long, long years out whether or not the mall is going to still be functioning as a retail center in 2095 is anybody's, you know, crystal ball. Um, next slide. And I think uh, at this point, I will turn it back to Ms. Kennedy. Yes, thank you, Ms. Connect. Um, I'll go on to the general plan and zoning consistency portion of the presentation. Uh, the development agreement is required to be consistent with the general plan. So staff did an analysis of general plan policies and uh, determined that these listed here, uh, the development agreement would be uh, consistent with those. I've provided them in your uh, exhibit G, part of the staff report. Um, and I'll just read them, but I don't think I need to go into each detail at this point. Um, economy and fiscal health element, uh, policies from the land use element, housing, open space, parks and recreation element, the historic resources element uh, due to its location, uh, environmental resources element. And then also the development agreement needs to be consistent with the, um, with good zoning practices. And in this case, it is consistent with the zoning designation of the site, which is commercial general. Uh, it's intended to provide a wide range of commercial uses serving as the city's major retail professional and service zone. And this project um, is consistent with that. Uh, next slide, please. So council resolution 89-120 uh, has a list of development agreement findings that are required in order to approve the development agreement. And they are here that the development agreement is consistent with the general plan and any applicable specific plan that the development agreement is in substantial conformance with public necessity, convenience, general welfare, and good zoning practices and that the development agreement provides assurances to the developer of the right to develop a project in accordance with the terms of the agreement and that adequate consideration is provided to the city. Next slide. A staff has provided uh, language in the staff report in regard to each of these findings um, that you can um, use when you make your motion. You can refer to those. So there are three actions available for you today for this item. The first would be to recommend approval of the development agreement to the city council as proposed, making the findings in the staff report. Or you could recommend approval of the development agreement to city council as modified as you see fit, making the findings again in the staff report. Or you could disapprove or not approve this development agreement. And at that point, it would be a final action and would not go to city council unless it would be appealed. Next slide, please. So our staff recommendation is that the Planning Commission make a recommendation to Council to approve the development agreement as proposed, making the findings in the staff report. But we'd like to make that one change to finding number three to change the number listed from $300,000 to $150,000 as um, explained by Ms. Connect earlier in, the, in our presentation. So that is our staff recommendation. That concludes staff's presentation and um, we are of course available for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Ms. Connect. Uh, at this time, I'm going to um, turn it over to the applicant. Uh, we're going to reset the clock for 30 minutes. 
Uh, and again, the 30 minutes, however you want, I want to divide up among the applicant representatives. And Madam Chair, Ellen Kokenda, I would just ask the members of the applicant team to turn on your webcams. And then you can unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon. And if you're not speaking, just please remember, um, since we do have a larger applicant team, to uh, please mute yourselves when you're not speaking so we don't pick up background noise. Thank you. Who's going to take the lead from the applicant team today? So I'll introduce myself. This is Steve Plainy, Managing Principal of Pacific Retail. I'm here with our CFO, Oscar Parra. Um, good day, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Ms. Kennedy and Ms. Connect, thank you for your time today. Uh, we're going to start off with a brief introduction with Scott Schumann from AGG, our council. And Scott, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll uh, we'll start. And sure, could thanks, you turn Steve. up the, the volume, please, on your audio? That would help a bit. It's coming sure. in a little, dis little distant. Thank you. Does that help? Is that better? Thank you. Great. All right, and thanks, Steve, and thank you, uh, Ms. Kennedy and, and Ms. Connect, and good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm Scott Schumann, as Steve indicated. I'm counsel for Paseo Nuevo. And before I turn the presentation over to the Paseo team, as I know you'd much rather hear from them than from me, I want to take just a minute to focus on two very important components of the development agreement, um, as there may be some significant misunderstanding on terms of the development agreement amongst the commissioners. Sarah did explain some of this, but I really want to put a finer point on it. First of all, the development agreement is not a deal for free rent for the next 60 years. The development agreement does not use the specific term rent, but it does provide uh, significant cost shifting from the city to the Paseo team, which is really just the equivalent of rent in a different name. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, up to $300,000 per year uh, in the PBIA is shifted from the city to Paseo. And I understand historically that this number was closer to 300,000 and Sarah indicated that number is now, they're anticipating it to be lower given that uh, the Ortega building and Nordstrom are closed, but that number will again go up once those two buildings are reactivated. And in any event, regardless of the magnitude, this is a saving or rent to the city that was not a part and is not a part of the existing ground lease. Secondly, there is a cost shifting of somewhere between 60 and $70,000 a year in shifting the obligation for the trash removal fees. These fees are currently and have been historically paid by the city. And then thirdly, as Sarah mentioned, approximately a $32,000 a year cost shifting or savings to the city per year for parking subsidies that are provided to the workforce at Paseo Nuevo. So the workers who work at Paseo Nuevo so that they can then afford to be able to park in the city parking lots. Um, these amounts have all, uh, are all currently paid by the city. And so this is really a, uh, up to $400,000 or approximately $400,000 you know, cost shifting away from the city to uh, Paseo Nuevo. And um, so I wanted to underscore that while it may not be called rent, you can call it a cost shifting, you can call it rent, you can call it whatever you like. The idea that this is a, is a free deal and that there's no rent or consideration going back to the city, just simply not true. Um, the other thing to keep in mind that there is no rent in the ground lease. So if, Absent this development agreement, we go back to the ground lease and there is no rent to the city. The city has to maintain uh, continuing to pay for those expenses, you know, for the next 47 years of the ground lease term. Um, the second point that I want to really underscore is that the development agreement does not prohibit or preclude housing, office, or any other commercial uses that to say in a way about. I mean, I know there's concern over that. The development agreement specifically does not address or prohibit housing or other commercial uses on the site. However, the existing ground lease and REA actually both prohibit housing at the site. Now, 
to change any of those uh, documents, the ground lease or the REA, which by the way, the Paseo Nuevo team would 100% endorse, would require a modification of the ground lease and the REA, and that would require the approval of the city and Nordstrom as the ground lessee under the Nordstrom pad site. So again, the development agreement does not change the status and it does not preclude housing or other commercial uses. We would be in favor of modifying the existing documents to allow for that. Um, but those aren't the documents we're here to talk about today. Um, so before I turn it back over, I just wanted to underscore that we're really here today to talk only about the development agreement, that the development agreement applies as Sarah indicated only to the mall portion of the project. And that there are two critical facts that need to be cleared up, that there is significant rent as a part of this deal, as a part of the development agreement that is not in the existing ground lease and that the development agreement does not preclude housing or other commercial uses at the site. Um, so with that, and the, uh, for the uh, more interesting part of the presentation, I'll turn it over to Anne-Marie. Uh, well, actually, I'll start um, prior to Anne-Marie here. Um, thank you, thank you, Scott. And uh, again, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, first off, I, I just want to say that we're really pleased to be close to f finalizing our renovation of the, of the property. Um, this is a journey that started roughly four years ago when we first started talking to the city um, and working with the city staff on coming up with a request for an extension and how we would work through that. Um, we feel that we've had a collaborative and positive outcome uh, working with the city and hearing what the city's needs and, and concerns were. Um, we are working with the HLC um, with Gensler and coming up with a plan that was thoughtful and necessary for the revitalization of, of Paseo Nuevo. As you saw, it was a 30-year-old project as of August 17th on, uh, I think it's Monday. And, you know, we, we believe in this project. This is a project that uh, we've been tracking since J.P. Morgan first acquired it uh, a number of years ago. Um, you know, the trials and tribulations of retail in the retail world continue unabated. Um, this is probably one of the most severe downturns that have occurred in the retail space in modern times. Um, but we expect to navigate the evolution of this appropriately. First and foremost, we're committed to Santa Barbara. We believe in this community. Uh, we think that this is a single point within the downtown core on State Street. It can be the nucleus and the catalyst for re renovation and revitalization throughout State Street and throughout the, the Santa Barbara core. Um, once upon a time, Paseo Nuevo was criticized by retailer, retailers as being too insular, too off State Street, and uh, not the place for a lot of retailers to be. Today, retailers are looking at this location as a great place, is contained, and is basically safer than the rest of State Street, and is a basis for them to kind of populate and start their businesses in a contained environment that has been refreshed and revitalized appropriately for the marketplace. We hope that the retailer's consensus and, and feelings change as we continue to, to lease space in this area and bring in proper, you know, bring in tenants that we think are quality retailers that are appropriate for the marketplace. And you know, we've heard uh, concern from the community that they don't want high-end retailers. And we don't want high-end retailers. We want the appropriate retailers to come into this marketplace that are a quality mix of local, regional, and some nationals. Uh, we're, we're very much focused on trying to get better quality dining experiences, um, you know, other, other entertainment type uses, as well as other good tenancies that are quality and, and fit the, uh, the, the pedigree of, of the marketplace. So, First and foremost, we, we hope we are that catalyst for the transformation of not only uh, Paseo Nuevo, but a greater part of State Street. You know, we're, we've worked hard at creating gathering spaces um, with a good experience or experiential piece um, with the fire pit, uh, with the educational piece, uh, with a small water feature that we have, uh, but they're just good gathering places 
that will facilitate outdoor dining and, and, and community. We are also looking at you know, the ability to uh, do adaptive reuse for the project later on. We have uh, a major commitment to the leasehold of Macy's. We own the leasehold interest in the Macy's. Uh, we've been looking at different ideas for that, for that building. Um, it's not a building we think should be torn down. It's a solid building. Um, it works for a number of different uses. We've gone through looking at structural integrity as well as layouts with, with Gensler. And we think the possibility um, that a major movie theater, a quality movie theater with dine-in uh, would, be, would be an interesting use. Um, we were more interested in that pre-COVID. Um, we think the theater industry is challenged. Uh, there's going to be a number of headwinds to the theater industry going forward. Uh, so we've, we've looked at other opportunities now. We think office could be a, a very good area to, to explore, and we continue to do that. This would be a first-class office space on two, two levels or more uh, that would have open, open space. It would be more creative office. We think it would work well for, for uh, the uh, tech guys and tech companies. Um, so we will continue to, to work on that and see, see how that progresses. But that is that is for a future date to come back to to the planning commission and discuss. Um, having Nordstrom close was a was a blow. Um, we think that was uh, unfortunate that Nordstrom decided to leave. But as part of a wider strategy for Nordstrom to close up to 20 plus stores around the United States, uh, as you've heard, we do not control that building. Um, we are in conversations with Nordstrom right now to try to get control of their leasehold position. We have looked briefly and preliminarily at what the, um, the structural integrity of that building is and of the layout of that building. Uh, you'll see later on in the presentation, we have a couple kind of general ideas on what that could look like. But we do think that that building could be conducive for housing and on the ground floor, something like a grocer and essential use such as that grocer drug would be would be great. Our long term vision for the property is just that it's long term. It's a commitment to the community. It's a commitment to Paseo Nuevo and State Street to come up with appropriate tenants and a design that is effective and needed for the community. And that does not need that does not mean it needs to be department stores. We think the era of the department store is declining quickly. Uh, we think there are other uses that can anchor uh, an open air plaza like this, an inline space such as this, and we think office and housing are excellent um, anchors and excellent catalysts for the live, work, and play. So we are continuing on that strategy. We think it's the right way to go. Uh, we will continue to work with the city and the community and with retailers, listening to what the needs are and you know what what obstacles we may face and uh, making sure that we we work through those to everybody's satisfaction. So with that, I'm gonna let um, Anne-Marie Brittenall from Gensler, who is the lead designer on the project to date, uh, walk you through some of the things that we've, we've achieved so far. Great, um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll quickly kind of go through the design presentation. Um, as Steve mentioned, um, we'll walk you through how Albaseo um, Nuevo is really a catalyst for economic revitalization. Um, next, please. Um, we have basically five big ideas. Um, number one being the catalyst for reinvestment within the community. Um, number two, creating great um, gathering spaces with good quality retail um, and outdoor dining. Um, we looked at, as Steve mentioned, um, a couple adaptive reuses of the existing Macy's, one being um, a state-of-the-art multiplex theater, as well as a Class A um, office conversion as well. Um, and then we also um, took a look at the Nordstrom building and how we can convert that into urban residential living. Next. Um, this just kind of highlights the overall plan as far as the way the community gathering spaces occur throughout the Paseos, and then it being anchored with both the transformation of the Macy's and the, the potential with the Nordstrom building in the future. Next. 
And then I just wanted to highlight, we actually, throughout the renovation of the Paseos, we have lots of artisan ceramic pottery that you will see throughout, as well as elegant landscaping. Um, the pottery was um, selected locally at Eye of the Day Pottery. Next. We also included lots of different lighting elements. Um, a lot of the uh, lighting elements were um, brought in and then also fabricated locally um, at Ironwood in Santa Barbara. Um, they hang throughout the trees and you also see them feature throughout the landscaping throughout the Paseos. Next. And then we also have a lot of decorative paving. Um, the paving, um, as you notice, the patterns um, transition throughout. Um, they are all hand painted and they are also um, produced locally within Southern California. Next. And then we have a series of gathering places throughout. Um, Steve mentioned the fire pit. We also have a bocce court. Um, and then we also have an interactive um, educational feature that's noted on the screen. And you can keep going. And then next, we just have a series of um, photographs before the renovation took place. Um, and then I'll kind of walk you through the, the transformation. So obviously this is the Chapala Steps view. And then on the next slide, you'll see um, we added a lot of decorative um, paving throughout um, brand new landscaping as well as decorative light features to really enhance the existing Chapala stairs that is you know, photographed um, socially. And then the next one. And then just the enhancements also along Chapala that you'll see um, with the restaurants and outdoor dining. And you'll see that on the next slide. So lots of new landscaping as well as the decorative paving that's throughout. And you can keep going. And then this is just highlighting the existing um, condition before the renovation of Center Court. And then the next couple slides um, will illustrate um, how we actually are adding um, additional landscaping as well as elements for outdoor dining um, adjacent to Center Court. Brand new trees that have feature lighting as well as the decorative paving and brand new um, furniture as well. Can you keep going, please. And then another view, um, all of the, ba uh, the buildings throughout the Paseos were painted white to, to really kind of highlight the actual retailers and restaurants as well as the, the landscaping. You can keep going. And then a close up view um, at eye level perspective showing you the reconfiguration. There's a small um, water feature adjacent to the planter that has the feature trees. Um, we also have pendant lights that are hanging up above um, again, they were produced um, locally. You can keep going. And then just an aerial view of what it is like today um, in progress during the renovation. You can keep going. And then um, next um, view um, of the, ex the existing condition of Delaguerra. And then the next view shows you the view of um, how we added decorative light features within the trees and added a uh, activation area of the bocce court. You can keep going. And then some of the original photographs of the Paseos themselves. You can keep going. And then um, another existing uh, photograph towards the um, adjacent to the south court. Um, and then the next one shows you the interactive um, feature that we have um, the interactive educational feature surrounded by landscaping, um, very um, reminiscent of the tide pools um, from the local area. And you can keep going. And then just the current shot of the condition under construction, keep going. And then you can keep going. Um, the next slide shows you the fire pit um, that's also highlighted with landscaping, a great gathering spot within one of the Paseos in the South Court. And then next, please. And then the current condition with the addition of the landscaping. Next. 
Um, and then I'll transition next um, to talk about the Macy's building. You can keep going to the next slide. Um, the idea um, is that we would encourage outfacing cafes to really um, suggest that people would um, be invited in from State Street into the Paseos. And then the next slide, please. And then this really gets into the, the Macy's building. So Steve mentioned we explored a couple options, one being the theater, and I'll kind of show you that and plan. Next. And you can keep going, please. Um, keep going, please. And then just the idea of it being um, turning into a cinema, restaurant, bar, and cafe. So some images that kind of evoke the feeling of the interior of the space. Next, please. And then you can just kind of go through these quickly, just showing you the ground level of the addition of retail and cafes and restaurants that would face out on the Paseos. And then the next one um, slide just shows you the addition of the state-of-the-art theater and how it would lay out within the um, confines of the existing building. And then creative office um, was the um, other alternative that we looked at. Um, so really trying to attract a class A office tenant that you see in some of the images. And then you can see on the next slides how it actually lays out in plan. And then on the second floor, you can see how the, the building um, is nicely translated with um, great openings in the center, allowing lots of natural light into the interior spaces. And then for the next slides, you can kind of, kind of quick um, click through very quickly. This just kind of shows you the section of that space with a central atrium space that we would add in. And then these, you can just um, click through quickly, just some interior shots of how the building transitions into a class A office building. Okay, and then the last, just to conclude, um, you can keep going to the next slide. We just quickly looked at what happens, you can keep going um, with the existing Nordstrom buildings and how we could potentially convert it into residential. You can keep clicking, please. You can keep going. Next, you can keep going, please. Um, so some images that alludes to um, converting um, the, the existing aesthetic of the Nordstrom building into residential. Um, you can go to the next one that would have an interior courtyard space um, with added landscaping in the central spine of the building. And then the next couple slides shows you um, if you take the existing Nordstrom buildings and you added the courtyard in the center of the space, how that would actually potentially work as well as the plans. Um, and then the last um, two slides is just showing you the potential of the grocery store um, that would occur at the base of the Nordstrom building. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Amory, that's great. Uh, Jonathan, why don't you uh, go next with a couple of comments? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank, thanks for everybody's time. Um, if we can skip forward one slide, please. So this is just an overview on the Planning Commission as we see it. Um, the review of the development agreement for architectural guideline compliance, general plan consistency, zoning compliance, and design consistency. Um, as, as Ms. Kennedy mentioned before, we believe we are consistent uh, with the general plan. Um, and today we are seeking a recommendation from the Planning Commission to the City Council to proceed with the development agreement um, to, to present that in front of Council. Next slide, please. Uh, so the goals of the development agreement, review the Pasea Nueva, you know, the whole purpose of, of our investment in downtown is to attract new tenancy uh, and, and revitalize the downtown and the community, as, as Steve mentioned before. Uh, we invested $20 million of private investment on our side. We did not seek public financing for that at all. Um, our original budget for this project was $12 million. And then fast forward to today, we spent over close to a uh, little over $20 million when this project is completed. Uh, we are looking for a 28-year lease extension uh, as an option for this project. Next slide, please. So I want to just spend one minute walking through the process on our side. Uh, when we acquired this or a portion of it and we teamed up with JP Morgan, 
we had a vision and what we needed to do was actually implement the vision and the strategy, as I mentioned, for revitalization of, of downtown as a project and to build a community and a hub for the local communities to and the local public to come um, and, and participate in. Uh, so we had to build that, that, that plan and, and create that vision and, and proceed with the development side. So we're just at the tail end of completing that, that plan, as Anne-Marie mentioned before. Um, and then it's, it's welcoming the community to our project. And ultimately that will translate into leasing and remerchandising for the entire project as well. And it will have a residual effect for the landscaping and the, the neighboring tenants and then the downtown as well. And then it's completion with an execution of their all, overall vision and the business plan for the project as well as downtown revitalization. We'll go to the next slide. Um, as, as Scott mentioned earlier, Scott Schumann, the full focus today is the development agreement. And what we highlighted here is everything that's in blue. Macy's, as, as Anne-Marie just walked us through the, form, the Ortega building, that's not part of this development agreement, nor is the Nordstrom building and all the other surrounding projects that's, that's in white. So we're purely focusing on the area in blue. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, again, the, the redevelopment agreement review main mall renovation is consistent with the city's general plan. It's consistent with zoning. We had no changes to the zoning use for the development agreement, no change into zoning, no change to height or density. And the project is consistent with uh, a, close to two years of work with the Historical Land Commission uh, that we received uh, unanimous approval from them as well. Next slide. And then it's, it's inconsistent with the design review guidelines with landscaping and urban design guidelines as well. Principles of sand community planning it complies with the city charter and municipal code, um, as well as the Santa Barbara traffic management of downtown policies as well. No, no adverse change to uh, heights or uses. A uh, quick timeline, as I mentioned, you can go to the next slide. Oh. We did a recapitalization with JP Morgan in 2015. We started the process with, with the city and HLC from uh, a renovation point of view, working through HLC. Um, in 2019, we received unanimous consent uh, by council to move forward with the development agreement. And in the uh, beginning of 2019, we commenced the re redevelopment and renovation of the project. Uh, based on a good faith effort that, that we had with the city and staff at that point in time. And right now we're currently about 90% complete with the renovation. Next slide. Uh, we can skip this one as well. And then I'm going to turn it over to Oscar. So the, the, the development agreement itself, we just want to point out that it was stated before. We've got 45 years on our existing ground lease. It expires in 2065. What I'm going to cover is not, those are new features that are not currently in the existing ground lease. So number one, our obligation to maintain the asset has been expanded significantly. And you, you'll see here a couple of examples that are actually listed in the development agreement. So now there's specificity around how we should maintain the asset. So we're compared against, you know, uh, properties like the runway fly, uh, Playa Vista and Playa Vista, which is a brand new asset, very beautiful. The point at Rosecrans is Sepulveda, also brand new, very beautiful, and you've got some other examples there. So um, on top of that, there is, we pay the, the, the city's cost to actually have a consultant review the asset to make sure that we're complying with the, the maintenance obligations in the development agreement. So, and there's also expanded, um, you know, penalties should we not comply with that uh, development agreement. Um, as it noted before, we're taking on some financial obligations, $31,000 rounded um, per year uh, to provide subsidies for employees parking in the parking garages. Uh, we're also taking over the obligation to pay for trash collection fees for both the, pay, the, the pavilion building and the Canfield buildings. Uh, that's about $63,000. Um, next slide, please. And so also we are taking over, as was talked was talked about earlier, our, our cap on the PBI assessment goes from $100,000 to $300,000.
Although the Macy's and Nordstrom buildings are closed today, in the future, we believe there will be significant economic activity in both of those buildings as the project evolves. Um, we've also agreed to provide a one-time contribution of $200,000 to the city's homeless initiative. And we've agreed to reimburse the city for its consultant and third part and outside legal counsel uh, as part of negotiating this agreement. Um, if the conditions are met in 2065, as, as, as Mrs. Uh, Connect or Ms. Connect uh, described, we would have um, the ability to extend the lease for 28 years, assuming that we met all of those conditions that, that, that Mrs. Connect or Ms. Connect uh, outlined. Also, we've included a new feature, uh, a participation feature, that should we hit certain financial um, um, hurdles, the city would receive 10% of proceeds over those hurdles. Um, there's also uh, very stringent limitation, limitations on the assignment rights that we have. Um, any buyer has to meet qual certain qualifications that are outlined in detail in the development agreement. Today, the city does not have that right, and we do not have that obligation. We can sell it to someone else, and the city really doesn't have the ability to kind of limit that. Um, we've agreed to, to limitations in our ability to sell based on those qualifications. And finally, we've made a $20 million uh, or agreed to made, make a $20 million investment in the asset itself. Uh, next slide, please. And Mr. Parr, if you would begin to wrap up, please. You have, if you can see yep. the clock on the screen, thank you. Absolutely, and so there, there we've got a summary of those obligations, financial obligations over the, the 45 year uh, term of the agreement. Um, you'll see the, the uh, one-time payment for 200,000, the $150,000 uh, uh, reimbursement. Next slide, please. Um, we also just wanna point out that we did get lead certification for this project. We invested a lot of time and effort um, in water conservation, adding LED lighting, um, drought resistant plantings. And so uh, we did get lead certification. Thank you, that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so at this time, I'm gonna ask you to turn off your webcams if I could, please. We're gonna come uh, back to staff because uh, we're gonna go to public comment. Uh, if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to the commission on this item and Ms. Kokinda is going to facilitate that for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, if you would, uh, if you're joining us uh, in the webinar and you'd like to speak on this item, please click on the raise your hand icon and that indicates to me that you wish to speak. Uh, you'll have two minutes to speak and no time may be donated to another speaker. Um, just note that you only have to click the hand icon one time to raise it and a raised hand is indicated by a red arrow going down. If you look at the bottom right hand screen um, of the screen, you'll, you'll see what that looks like. Um, I'm going to uh, call on Carl Gregory first and then Ed St. George and then Hal Conklin. Uh, so uh, Mr. Carl Gregory, I've just unmuted you. If you could please unmute yourself uh, by clicking on the microphone icon on your GoToWebinar control panel, and I will call on you. Um, it looks like you just unmuted yourself. Uh, you have two minutes whenever you're ready. Could you try to speak I'd like up? you guys to take your time to educate yourselves about the detail contained within the terms of the lease since they aren't changing. Having read a great deal of lease documents myself, I can tell you that they're complicated and very one-sided. I'd like to also caution you to make a note of the $2 million loan that was made to the city in 1989, accruing at 10% per year only payable in participation rents to the San Nuevo. And as you've been informed, it's highly unlikely, if not impossible, to ever achieve a rent roll that ever pays towards this loan. As far as our city records indicate, this loan continues to accrue to this day. I'd strongly suggest that you request the prior 30 years of financial statements from San Diego and make yourself aware of the fact that the city has made literally no money to date from this lease. There's something else that you need to be aware of that hasn't been discussed. PNO has already secured a $121 million loan from a foreign bank. Let that sink in for a minute. Our city administrator had already subordinated your lease. That's extremely troubling, to say the least. PO keeps saying that they're putting $20 million of their own money into this project. They're not, full stop. That's money coming from this, this loan. And guess what? The city's gonna be stuck with the debt at the end of the lease, regardless. 
We all know that they'll continue to extend that debt into eternity. p and is trying to make you think that the expenses that they're paying are rent. That's absurd. These expenses, these are expenses that wouldn't exist if not for the lease and the subtenants contained there. There is no financial benefit for the city here. You ask yourselves, why in the world would you ever consider extending a lease that makes no money, period? Be careful. The p is just another LA capital firm. They don't actually care about our town. They're just looking to skin a profit off of us and move on, sell it to the next person after they extend the lease. I'd put a stop to this right now if I were you guys. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. So next, um, uh, Ed St. George, I've just unmuted you. If you could please unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon. It looks like you just did. You have two minutes whenever you're ready. Hello, Madam Chair, Planning Commission. I have said many times that there's something very suspicious in the fact that the citizens of Santa Barbara receive not a penny in rent for this prime, prime real estate. And I bet all the stores on the wharf and at the harbor would love the same deal. And better yet, why we charge for even boat slips if we're going to give rent free? The mere fact that our Sir Paul Casey is pushing so incredibly hard for this development agreement that grants an additional 28 years of free rent is in my mind criminal. And I mean in every sense of the word criminal. You have to ask yourself, why would somebody whose only job is to preserve and to protect our community be pushing this unbelievably one-sided proportion? Is his $400,000 a year salary not enough to pay and something on the side is being worked privately? Am I supposed to believe that he's just a very naive businessman? Neither scenario is acceptable. And with the huge salary Paul Casey receives, he must be held accountable for negotiating the best interests of the city. To reward PO with a 28 year lease extension on the Paseo Nuevo is encouraging to continue down the same road that they've been traveling for the past years. The Paseo Nuevo is by all means a miserable failure and has been living proof long before COVID. Even now, as State Street is slowly coming back alive, the Paseo Nuevo lies in a coma, slowly withering a painful, silent death. And by granting p and a lease of another 28 years is only going to extend the cancer to the rest of our downtown. Today, I would like to cur encourage the Planning Commission to ask p and to propose a viable plan to help jumpstart our mall. And no, adding new pavers and new light fixtures is not going to be sufficient to breathe life back into our downtown. The mall needs major surgery, not just an aspirin. Listen, p &O, the reason we have a housing shortage in our beautiful little town is because everybody wants to live here. And that means people will be willing to open businesses here. So figure it out. I don't want to hear that it's too difficult to build here in Santa Barbara. You've always got some connections with our city attorney and Paul Casey. So please take advantage of that. Turn this mall around and I bet you can get a great deal. Thank you. Okay, uh, next I have Hal Conklin and then I'm gonna call on Jamie Rodriguez. Uh, Mr. Con Conklin, um, it looks like you're unmuted. You have two minutes whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much and thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Schwartz. And Members of the Planning Commission, I, you know, I'm very aware of the fact that uh, this coming Monday is the 30th anniversary of the opening of the mall. And uh, although some people may think the mall has been a miserable uh, failure, I would say it's been a remarkable success because I look back on why did we spend so many years as the city, as the developer of this project? It wasn't Reinecke or uh, p &O. It was the city that developed this project and brought in outside uh, partners to make it happen because we had three objectives in mind and all three of those objectives were actually achieved and I think are as needed today as they ever were. The first was to stop the building of a, another mall the size of the Thousand Oaks Mall at the Glen Annie off ramp, which uh, was proposed and the county was going to approve it. And we got the county to hold off on that approval pending our trying to put something back downtown and revive downtown Santa Barbara as the center of the South Coast economy. The second was that there was $140 million a year leakage of sales tax out of Santa Barbara. So what does the city get out of this? It actually was able to not only help reverse that process, but increase it back to the city of Santa Barbara. And why was that important to me and anybody else who was a part of this? 
to get it started. It was because that tax base is what pays for police and fire service in Santa Barbara. And we actually were able to achieve that reversal. So I would encourage you and, uh, and compliment the city staff on its uh, development agreement negotiations. And I would encourage you to adopt it because I think those things that we achieved 30 years ago are as critical today and this development agreement helps to get it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conklin. And next I'm going to call on Jamie Rodriguez and then after that, Micah T. So Jamie Rodriguez, I've just unmuted you. If you could please unmute yourself. It looks like you just did. You have two minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you. So on the note of the 30 years ago thing, that's exactly that. It's 30 years ago. It's 2020. So get with the times. Uh, number one, uh, Nordstrom is an indicator of what is coming to retail in general. So when we think about this nationwide in our city of Santa Barbara, why are we focusing on retail? This thing needs to go. The whole thing of San Nuevo needs to go. Retail's not coming back here. Look at State Street. There's a reason why Lululemon relocated out of Paseo onto State Street for frontage. Shocking. The reality here is that we have to ask ourselves multiple questions. One of is, why are we signing a long-term agreement during a global pandemic? Why are we not stopping? Think about what's happening here. We're going to enter into a recession. We got to think about the presidency, we got to think about every little factor that's going into what you're signing. You're signing today's document. It's going to be different three months from now in November. It's going to be different January 1 when all these protection plans goes away. So you have to think about why are we signing this agreement now? Uh, we got to put a major pause on what's going on right here. The other thing is we don't have a long-term plan for the development. They don't have a long-term plan for the development, frankly, because Norsham just left. Macy's is gone. All right, so you got to really think about that. And then the other question too is you got to ask yourself, where is retail going? It's not coming to Santa Barbara. All right, retail is not coming to Santa Barbara. This is a tourism based town. It's a second, third or fourth community for most people. And we need to actually create an environment that's good for the local economy and community. That means housing, major redevelopment so we can get bodies in our central business district and get over it. What we have right now is we're applying 30 years of failed logic into 2020, and we're prepared to do another 75 years of failed logic. Think about it. Really think about what we're doing here. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. And then um, the last person who raised their hand. Um, so after I'm going to call on Micah T and then maybe ask Timmy to go back to the um the instruction slide in case anybody else wishes to raise their hand so micah t i've just unmuted you um you have if you could please unmute yourself there you go and two minutes whenever you're ready hello yeah just to piggyback off of what many have already said i recently learned about the owners of this mall and essentially not paying rent while profiting what could be predicted as upward of a million per month with the way Santa Barbara's economy has been trending, this feels wrong on several levels. The mall has so much potential, yet year to year, this potential has been wasted and squandered. The mall is not appealing to younger or older people, as it's continuously dry, boring, and overall not creative. None of the attempted changes have been indicative of a positive change or direction. The stores are continuously shutting down and turning over, and it's been an issue far before the pandemic. As someone who deeply cares about Santa Barbara's well-being, I would be extremely disappointed in the Planning Commission if the issue does not get addressed properly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. T. And then thank you, Timmy. Um, again, this uh, would be the last opportunity. If you do wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand by clicking once on the uh, raise your hand icon on your GoToWebinar control panel, and I will call on you. The symbol uh, shown in the image at the bottom right of the screen, the uh, hand with the red arrow down is actually a, a raised hand. That's what a raised hand looks like. And Chair Schwartz, I don't see anyone else who's raised their hand for this particular um, matter. So back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, Ms. Rydell, would you like to uh, bring us up to date regarding communications? Yes, thank you. My microphone is up. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. Um, uh, I just wanted to state that we did receive written correspondence on this item and it was distributed to the Planning Commission prior to this hearing. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Rydell. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna bring it back to the commission. We're gonna start our first round of questions. I would like to suggest to the commission that because the term sheet was approved by the council on January 29th, 2019, as I understand it, uh, and we're really focusing on the development agreement and the staff report for the commissioners to consider either wrapping their questions from the term sheet into questions on the development agreement or setting aside uh, any separate term sheet questions until we get through first round of questions. Um, again, just a suggestion, uh, it's at the commission's discretion and Commissioner Wispin, would you like to kick off the quest first question period? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, I have a whole list of questions. Most of my questions do relate to the development agreement. So um, I think I'm in tune with what you're saying about not looking at the term sheet, but looking at the agreement itself. Um, I was just gonna see if I had, I have one question for Ms. Kennedy and I think the rest are probably for Ms. Necht and the PNO team. Um, Ms. Kennedy, uh, the staff report on page three of 118, and I'm probably, excuse me for having to go all around here, says over the years, several amendments were made to the ground leases. And um, what are these amendments or are these the ones that we've already seen and you sent us the uh, successor agency uh, information yesterday? So um, are, are these the ones that you've already covered? There's nothing new here, right? Actually, I'd have to defer to uh, Ms. Connect regarding that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, through the chair, uh, vice chair, those those amendments were insignificant um, to this discussion, and they really just had to do with minor operational matters with regard to the the lease, but but nothing having to do with with this topic. Okay, um, right. Thank you. Thank you for the answer to that. Now, uh, Madam Chair, forgive me, but I'm gonna ask my questions in sequential order of the development agreement, if I may. Um, I wanna go to the Coton memo first, Mr. Coton's memo of 725.13. We had a question from the public about that, and I have a question about where that $2 million loan stands with the 10% interest. Is Mr. Coton available for, for that? Do we have a particular yes. document that Mr. Bolton could pull up, um, Commissioner Wiscom, to help us all orient ourselves? Well, he he references it and discusses it in his memo of uh, July 25th, 2013 on several different pages of that memo. And that memo has been distributed to the Planning Commission. So I, I just like him to, I, the loan is still outstanding. Is that correct? And it is. And, and uh, it still has a 10% interest rate. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And the, the, so the interest rate on the loan is what is, is the interest on the loan is, is in lieu of paying the rent. Is that right, Mr. Coton? Yes and no. Um, if I may, let me spend about two minutes giving you some background as to that how the loan- That would be wonderful, yeah. Now the loan came into being, why it was negotiated in the form it was, et cetera. Uh, this, gr the ground lease was negotiated at considerable length and expense uh, by a team that consisted at the time of uh, uh, myself, on an outside attorney by the name of Herbert Weiser, uh, the city attorney's office, uh, including Steve Wiley, who was at that point a fairly young attorney uh, in the office, uh, and Dave Davis, who was the community development director. We spent a lot of time shaping the agreement and it had both a significant base rent and a uh, percentage rent. Now the percentage rent, and I have to say this because I was quite new to ground leasing at the time and I'm not anymore. Uh, percentage rent was subordinate to a return on the asset value, on the asset cost that the uh, developer would incur. 
I'll come back to that in a moment because it has a great deal to do about why we never got anything paid on the uh, $2 million loan. Now, how did the $2 million loan came into being? It was not part of the original ground lease. What happened was that uh, the, the beautiful parking garages that you have on State Street and adjo adjoining that, 1,100 spaces, all of which were the city's obligation to build under the development agreement at that time. And by that, by the development agreement, I mean the DDA, the, the, the agreement that the redevelopment agency right. made with the developer actually broke the back of the CRA's treasury. They did not have enough money to finish it because the cost of, of it, like many things at the time, went up. So the easiest thing to do, or it seemed at the time, uh, was to ask the developer to front the money, which was $2 million. And so the developer fronted the money and he said, and this is where it gets kind of interesting, actually. He said, well, why do, in return for that, why don't you eliminate the minimum rent? Now, let us remember the context in which this was being done. We had two department stores. We had a great location. We had quite literally an award-winning design, as it turned out. And everybody thought that we were going to go absolute bangbusters as far as the earning the revenue to this center was going to go. Nobody had any understanding at the time, and I, uh, there are two there are two people in in this meeting that were there, uh, myself and the, the then Mayor Lodge, uh, and at that time uh, it was thought, well, we're we're covered if we we still get percentage rent, so we waived the minimum rent, which is why there it's free, and we then said, and it was a fairly high interest er, era. Uh, yes, the developer can get a 10% interest. What then ensued, and which is why we're in the situation we are and why we've never gotten any rent, what then ensued was that the building came in at an almost 80% overrun of its original cost. That meant that the return on cost threshold, even though the center was by traditional measures fairly successful, but the return on cost did not meet the threshold that they had to get in order to pay us minimum rent, uh, percentage rent rather. So we never got any percentage rent. Uh, what seemed like a reasonable trade-off at the time turned out to be a, a, a form of giveaway and is why we have never received any rent. Now, since, we, since the only source of repayment for that loan was to be from rents paid, the fact that there were never any rents paid meant that that loan was never repaid and it ran the clock at 10% interest. Okay, it's currently something north of $20 million and will be close to $40 million or more by the, uh, you know, by the end of the lease. That was one of the reasons or the primary reason why we have never received any lease, any rent. Now it does expire with the lease. Uh, we don't, in other words, it isn't an obligation of the city. It is an obligation only of the city as from payable from the rent received on that, uh, on that site. Now, I, I've talked too long. I hope I've answered your question, but it, it, it all has to be viewed in a context. I, I appreciate that. So I just want to understand, is there, so you're saying that the, it, it's, gone up to $20 million, so, and it expires with the lease, but that's the principal amount. In other words, the interest went towards the rent, right? And the principal no, amount- No, it's the other way around. No, you got it back. the other way around, okay. Yeah, yeah. Interest continues to accrue because there's no rent to pay it down. Okay, okay. There's never been any, there's never been any rent due. That, that, that's the missing part of this thing because the original concept was we were going to get both percentage rent and ground rent and base rent. We waived the base rent and we agreed that the percentage rent would only be payable after the developer got a certain return on his cost. Because his costs went up, he never got that return. We therefore never got paid. Okay, so the principal is rent and the interest keeps accruing, right? Right, that's why it's 20 million or plus, more now. Okay, okay. And um, it, and then so what happens at the end of, uh, what happens in 2065? 
when the well, lease. What happens is the land, the, the land, the property reverts to. You ought to ask Sarah, but yeah, the land reverts to the city and the loan goes away. We don't okay. owe them. You don't owe it to yourself, is what you're saying. Okay. I get it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that explanation. I think that really clears it up because it's it's it is pretty confusing with the participation rent and the base rent. So I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so let me move on here. Um, so I'm just going to go in order and then I'm going to go to the development agreement. Um, at the site visit, uh, P P and O staff emphasized that over 50% of the businesses in the mall are local. And I'll come back to this later, but, um, and I appreciate your sending out, uh, when you send out the, the tenant list, uh, that, that's really great. I wanted to know, just make sure. So the local vendors that participate in the weekend markets are not counted uh, in, in this. Is that, is that correct? That would be a question for p and staff. This is only, the list that we have is only the vendors that operate the interior spaces. Is that correct? Do we have someone? Yes, okay. Yes, that, that is correct. The, the, the vendors in the market are not included in that list. When we run the, the calculation of percentage of tenants that are local, we're excluding those market tenants. Okay, so 50% local and 50% national is what we got in the in the memo. Okay, thank you Correct. for that. Um, okay, so let's move on to the development agreement. Um, page two, which is page 21 of 118 in our packet. Um, this is in section G number three. Uh, it states that the renovation work uh, will benefit both parties by generating significant economic business to both the citizen, city and its citizens and company. So I just wondered, how do we justify that statement given the steep decline in on-site retail and nationwide on-site retail sales? Well, we believe that the investment of $20 million into the Paseo Nuevo Shopping Center generally is going to ignite um, economic activity on State Street. There was a caller that mentioned that, you know, there is uh, kind of a recovery happening on State Street. And we think the 20 million that we invest in Paseo Nuevo was, is gonna generally benefit the area. And that is our, our rationale. Okay. And then how does this benefit the city and its citizens when no rent is collected? Um, so are you saying that the value of this development agreement to the city and its citizens is in the trash collection fees and the PBIA, which doesn't start for five years and, or the escalation of the PBIA doesn't start for five years. Those types of things are, are the benefits to the city and its citizens. Is that what you're implying? That's correct. In addition to the actual increased economic activity, you will have increased retail sales of which the city participates in. Yeah, I mean, the short term benefit for the city certainly are the, the specific items that have been discussed. Long term, it's the overall revitalization of the property. As some of the callers mentioned, and as the staff has looked at, uh, the property needs to be renovated. We think retail is still viable. We think retail being viable. Um, in the direction that we're planning on taking it as far as a, from a leasing standpoint is cutting edge. We're a national firm. We are looking at what is the trends going on in retail across the United States. Uh, retail is not dead. Retail is being transformed and retail is being reinvented. We think we've been on the forefront of that reinvention and those transformations on many projects across the country. We tailor our, our, our interests. We tailor our our renovation, we tailor our focus per community. And we think what we've done here in Santa Barbara is appropriate for the marketplace. And we think it's going to be a, a good catalyst for revitalizing the area. And as we've revi as this project gets revitalized, it'll increase sales 
sales overall in the project, which will increase the sales tax basis for the city, which the city will have a direct benefit of. Ms. Neck, did you have something to add to? I, I did, thank you. Um, and I'm not sure who your question was directed at, but I, I would like to comment on that, that um, you know, when we first started to negotiate this this agreement at the direction of the city council, I think that the, the economic benefit to the city was clear. We thought it was clear, um, but obviously as time has gone on, that has changed as I think we, we, we demonstrated in our presentation. And so um, it's, it's, it's less clear. And I think that that is, is part of the judgment that the commission needs to make. Okay, thank, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. Um, and and I, Ms. Kennedy stated that PNO stated that it could not go through the reno, could not go through with the renovations uh, after 30 years without a lease extension. So I'd just like to know from PNO staff why you did proceed with the renovations prior to obtaining a uh, development agreement with a potential lease extension. Sure, the discussions with the stakeholders involved on the investment side, which are the investor and the lender, um, were that we received uh, unanimous approval from the city council through the term sheet um, that allows for the negotiation of a development agreement, which includes the ability to extend the ground lease. That term sheet, although it is not a binding term sheet that grants us the right to actually extend the, the, the ground lease, that term sheet to us, as we described it to the investors and to the lender, it was evidence that we had a willing partner in the city of Santa Barbara um, with respect to moving forward and investing additional capital into the main mall. And so um, what we did is we recommended to the investors and the lender that given that we do have evidence of, of goodwill and a willing partner with the city of Santa Barbara, that we should move forward and not wait for the uh, full negotiation and execution of the development agreement, because even pre-COVID retail was challenged and our um, position was that to sit still and do nothing and not invest capital was not the right decision, that we should invest capital. And that in fact, although we don't have an executed development agreement, we do have evidence that we have a willing partner with the city of Santa Barbara. And so we convinced the investors and the lender to move forward and invest the $20 million, um, you know, in, in Paseo Nuevo um, to revitalize the asset. Does that answer the question? I, I, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're, you're, you're negotiating, you're, you had good intentions when you started because of the term sheet then, is that correct? Yes, correct. We, we move forward in good faith is, is the way in that good, we. In good faith. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, and then, um, I just want to go to page three. Um, it's on, it's, uh, of the development agreement. That's 22 of 118 and it's section N as in Nancy states that the company has a commitment to a balanced redevelopment plan. Now you spoke about your redevelopment plan. Um, a, a, well, you spoke about developing a redevelopment plan, but given the fact that we now have COVID, we now have remote um, office workers that may never go back to office space and we have declining on-site retail, it, have you started to develop a, a balanced redevelopment plan for the whole the whole area or? Um, yes, we, we have created, I think, a holistic and balanced overall vision for the project that we're excited about. Um, we look at the redevelopment though in phases um, and all the phases are not necessarily dependent on each other. They, they are going to be building blocks for the future phase and all of them will be, I think, synergistic in their effect. So the first phase is main mall. As we've described, as we've done, is, is executed a redevelopment of that. So 
COVID or not, that renovation was needed. We think the direction and the completion of the renovation as done is appropriate. We think, you know, given the feedback with the HLC, um, with the community, we've come up with a plan that really looks good. We think it fits appropriately and is going to resonate really well with the new breed of retailers. Yes, retail is challenged. Retail is still, still around. Um, it's just evolving. And we, our job is to make sure that we lease it and curate the, the project appropriately. Um, this is no different than anybody is facing across the country, whether it's Simon or Rick Caruso. Everybody is working through this right now and making sure that we end up with an appropriate balance of tenants that work with the neighborhood and the community. The second phase is going to be Macy's. Macy's is something that we control now as far as the leasehold. Um, as I mentioned previously, we certainly were looking at a movie theater. We thought that was a great use at the time. Um, we thought it, there was a real demand in the marketplace for a first run theater. Um, right now in Santa Barbara, you got to go a long way to get a really good movie theater um, with good seats and dining facilities. So we had teed up a lease with a major operator. Um, we thought that was going to be a good fit. We're rethinking that right now because we're not sure about what the movie theater business looks like going forward. And that's just being commercially reasonable to the times right now. Um, I'm certainly not going back to the movie theaters anytime soon, but my three daughters can't wait to go back. So we'll, uh, we'll see, you know, where that shakes out. In the meantime, we're looking at other options and we think that office is a viable option. Uh, we've been working with the uh, local leasing brokers in the marketplace and yes, because of, you know, the zoom era that we're in right now, um, a lot of people aren't going back to work, but the market seems to have a real, um, hole in this in this in the in the area for first class office space that is of creative design open floor plan and is a I'll call it a Genslerized design. Um, we think that that could make a lot of sense. We still have work to do in exploring that, but that's that's our goal is to come up with an effective anchor for the Macy's building. Um, third and the last phase is Nordstrom. Again, we don't control that. Um, we're working with Nordstrom and we're going to make sure that we, we figure out how as best we can working with the city that we can control that. We believe that housing makes a lot of sense. It's the next wave of the evolution of these sort of projects. They become mixed use department or department anchored retail is not really relevant going forward. And there's a surefire way to have uh, a problem later on. But we think going, going forward into the 21st century, having potentially office and housing anchoring a curated selection of quality retailers is a terrific way to go for the long term and it's going to be financially successful for us and for the city. And just another quick to, to put a finer point on that and put numbers around it. You know, right now, Paseo Nuevo was 460,000 square feet of retail. We agree that that's too much retail. If you repurpose the Macy's and the Nordstrom into office and multifamily, then you're left with the inline shops, which are 156,000 square feet. That represents a 66% reduction in retail on this property. Now that's going to require the city's approval to do that. So it's not, we're not saying that we would, you know, attempt to do this unilaterally. We couldn't, it, it's going to require the city's input, but you would reduce 66% of the retail on this footprint. That's number one. Number two, one thing that we've learned as we've developed the mixed use prop properties around the, the, the nation is that if the retail is dilapidated, that is a fundamental deterrence to bringing office and multifamily to the site. It needs to be refreshed. It needs to be vital. It needs to be viewed as an amenity to the office and an amenity to the multifamily. So, and also the comment about office, you are correct that office is challenged, but what we've seen in a good example is the gallery of white plains, 32 minutes from downtown Manhattan. What we've seen is office in the core markets, downtown New York, downtown LA, San Francisco, that is mightily challenged. It's very dense and people have figured out that you don't need to be in the core. Where they want to be is 32 minutes from downtown Manhattan in White Plains. Where they want to be is an hour from LA in Santa Barbara. And so office, although challenged, it's primarily challenged in the core downtowns. Office investors view these type of markets a little differently than the core. Okay. 
Thank, thank you for the answer to that. I appreciate it. I see Mr. Coton on. Did you have something that you wanted to say, Mr. Coton? Oh, okay. Okay, good. Um, okay, I'm on, I'm on to page eight. Um, this is 27 of 118, 1.42 renovation work costs, uh, which include tenant improvement costs plus common areas capital improvements. I wanted to know, do your lessees pay a portion of their rent to support tenant improvement projects or capital improvement <coughs> projects. And if yes. they do, how much of your $20 million in capital improvement projects were obligated through these payments? So to answer that question, the we've obligated to, to invest, we're obligated to invest $20 million in, in the shopping center. 18 of that, is our earmarked for capital expenditures. So those are not tenant improvements. The reality is we're actually spending $20.5 million on capital expenditures. We're going to exceed the $18 million budget when all is said and done. We're not going to stop there. Although we're gonna invest $20 million in, the, in capital improvements for the shopping center, we don't stop there. We then move on to investing tenant improvement dollars. Those tenant improvement dollars, the, when you structure a lease with a tenant, you don't specifically allocate the rent to the tenant improvement dollars. So there's no specific allocation, but it is generally understood that rents are supported by the capital that the landlord invests. What is that proportion? It's unclear, but generally that's the thought process. And just to add a further note to that, I mean, when a, when a retailer comes into a space, they expect what is commonly referred to as a cold, dark shell. So that shell has HVAC stubbed in into it, has electrical stubbed into it. There's cost to create that box for the retailer to utilize. That is generally the landlord's cost to create that cold, dark shell. And that is part of our overall capital budget. On top of that, when the tenant comes in, they'll have various degrees of cost, um, typically equated on a cost per square foot basis. They can range from $30 a square foot on the low side today to maybe $200 or $250 a square foot for a restaurant, which will be improvements that you'll provide them, you as landlord, as part of their lease negotiation. Now, the tenant may spend considerably more beyond that, but you as landlord, as part of the overall negotiation for rent and tenant improvements, will will negotiate that you know separately. Okay, thank you for that. That that explains that. I'm I'm not in that business, as you can see from my question. So, okay. Um, on, and then uh, on page eight, pages eight and nine, twenty-seven and twenty-eight of one eighteen, uh, section one point four eight, tenant improvement costs funded by the company after the effective date. So after the effective gate, date of the um, uh, development agreement. Uh, uh, so what what are you obligated to fund in tenant improvement costs after the effective date? And are you going to change your form so that um, tenants actually do pay into a fund? Or what, I, I'm just trying to understand your commitment to this and i'm not looking for the word commitment i'm looking for the word what are you obligated to fund in tenant improvement costs after the effective date so i mean what what this is is kind of continues on with the the previous discussion um tenant improvements are exactly that you have a retailer coming in you've negotiated a lease they're paying you x dollars per square foot and then on top of that, you've negotiated some improvements over this cold, dark shell that you're providing the tenant to incentivize them to come into the space. It varies from tenant to tenant. Um, restaurants right. demand significant improvements and so a smaller store that maybe an apparel store will, will ask for less. So our, our commitment is to basically lease the space, number one, and lease the space that will require tenant improvements by default because you cannot lease space today without providing tenants some sort of tenant improvement allowance. So it's going to vary space by space, use by use, but the goal is that we are going to fund those and we're looking at 
creating a successful tenant mix to the center that's going to have an overall attractiveness and has a general um, guidelines within the retail industry of, as it's stated here in, the, in this particular clause. Okay. A, good example, a good example is Orange Theory. We just funded those tenant improvements. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Where? Orange, Orange Theory on the, I believe on the Topolic side of the asset, we funded those tenant improvements above and beyond the capital expenditure that we put into the property. We funded tenant improvements to, to construct that tenant. And facilitate that lease. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. That's a good answer. I appreciate, I appreciate the, the actual example of, yeah. of your answer. So, um, okay. And then on page 12, it says compliance. This is section, this is 31 of 118 and 2.5.7 compliance with law states that renovation work entirely on lease premises, no encroachment upon land of others or any easement or right of way. And I'm just, uh, this is a small point, but during the site visit, did we not review some work that's actually proposed, that that's actually on city property outside the lease premises? Well, the, the one, uh, De La Guerra Paseo is city property. And, okay. we, have, and we have worked with the city to, um, and, and the HLC to basically go through and talk about, we were initially gonna replace all the pavers in the whole concrete Paseo there. Um, it was turned down by the HLC. Um, we were required to work uh, under their guidelines and auspices to come up with a, a plan that worked for the HLC and worked for us. We thought it was a, a good, a good uh, compromise uh, because that's a thoroughfare and you have to have uh, life safety and fire trucks, et cetera, to be able to access that. We've decided to, to stain the concrete um, an appropriate color. Um, we made sure that the width of that Paseo stays as it is. Um, the bocce court, for example, has been pushed off to the side. Uh, there's no encroachment with uh, the lighting and so forth. But we have improved that and we are required by uh, the REA to maintain that. So, but it is property owned by the city. We did receive oh. approval for that. And we did it, we received approval for that work. And, and it right. was our no, money, I, I, and it was our, sorry, go ahead. I understand that you received approval for it, but it, it's part of your your twenty million capital improvement project. Then, yes, that's good. Yes. Okay. That is. Uh, it, it, even though it's not in your leased area, okay. Correct. Um, okay, and then on page fourteen, um, and this is the. Uh, uh, page 33 of 118, 3.1.3, payment of parking and business improvement area assessment. I, I just, I want to understand why this is not effective, why the increase in this is not effective on the effective date, but but is waits for five years. What is the logic behind that? Maybe Ms. Neck can answer that question. I can take that from the PL perspective if, and then Ms. Ms. Necht can okay. follow on it. But the idea was to give us a little bit of time to let kind of the effect of investing $20 million, there's going to be a lease up period where, where we go and lease up the spaces and invest additional tenant improvement dollars. And so the logic was just to provide a little bit of time before we're obligated to pay that increased amount. So this isn't. So this right now is not a benefit that the that the city would receive under this development agreement immediately, like they would with trash or Correct. or with parking, um, the parking discounts. But we, we would need to wait five years for this, and this is a pretty significant one. So, Ms. Neck, did you have something to add? Yeah, I would like to add that that could be changed. We we can modify this agreement, and as I said earlier. Um, it's unlikely that we will reach our cap in uh, the cap, the $300,000 right. cap. And yeah. um, we can modify this agreement. It's not final. So in my recollection, this was our beginning negotiating place on the basis of PNO's position that from what they just stated, that it would take some time. They wanted to, to get funding. They made that argument that it should wait for five years, but at this point in time, you know, if the commission wanted to make that recommendation that it be modified to start on the effective date, 
that might be a, a, a good modification. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, on page 15, uh, Ms. Neck, stay, stay on, please, because okay. you were part of this. Um, we're, this is page 34 of 118, 3.1.5, use covenant. Company will operate the mall as a first class retail center and the comps are listed. So, and I believe Ms. Neck, you said that this added teeth to the clause. So um, my, my, I'm going to start with something that I apologize I didn't get to you before. Um, I, I actually just found it last night when I was doing some more research. But one property on the list is the Simi Valley Town Center. And the Ventura County Star on June 4th, 2019, so just a little bit over a year ago, published an article entitled, Long Struggling Simi Valley Town Center Has New Owner Who Plans to Redevelopment. And the article goes on to say that a notice of default was recorded for $42,675,000 $42, and subsequently sold to Bayside for twenty seven. dollars $0.5 million. And the city manager was quoted in the article as saying, the way I look at this is that we've now pulled off the Band-Aid and we're going to start the healing. So I would like to know from someone, what is the criteria used to define a first class retail center? What are the comps that, what, what's the criteria that you used and why is it not in here? It seems at this point, very subjective in terms of defining a first class retail center. And not only puts this, it puts the city, but puts P&O too in a, in a um, potentially litigious position by not defining what a first class retail center is. Uh, th thank you for that. And um, I'll, I'll start, Mr. Coton, on this because these centers, we um, actually negotiated quite uh, vigorously uh, on defining and we looked at centers with comp comparable square footage of retail. Um, and I think that was that was kind of a, a and at the same sort of um, uh, locationally that that were that started off comparably uh situated i think you know um in in terms of they weren't too too far different um shall i say and and we really fought over each one of them i i'm and i have to say i'm sorry about the simi valley town center because i didn't know about that and at this point i'll defer to mr coton because he knows all of these centers far better than I do. Um, so he can talk about probably each one of them and how they made it onto the list and the specific criteria that we used. Well, basically, uh, the first of all, the list is an old one. Uh, this is a really interesting transaction because the, the core term sheet uh, is quite old at this point. And uh, you are, in fact, uncovering one of several things that were we to do it over again, we might have changed. Uh, I, when we were negotiating this, the city team made an initial effort to include very high-end, well-established centers. And the PNO people represented with some justice that it was not appropriate, given the fact that this was Santa Barbara, not Beverly Hills, et cetera, et cetera, that we should not use such high-end centers. What then ensued, and Sarah Connect has alluded to this, was an extended negotiation. Several of these centers are new and elegant, but they're very small. Uh, the, only, the only center, quite frankly, on the list that really more or less looked like this one, only it does. Now that our anchors have closed, it did not, is a center called Victoria Gardens, uh, which is also an open air center, uh, which ours is, and uh, has had at least at the time some, uh, somewhat overlapping tenants. Uh, I think the short answer to your question is this was kind of the best list we could get after a lot of negotiation. Uh, it has in it some very new, nicely maintained centers that are considerably smaller. 
It has Victoria Gardens, which I think is a pretty good model for this. At the time, Simi, Center, Simi Town Center seemed like a good one because it also had some open air features. Uh, we, a lot of these centers in question are enclosed malls and they behave quite differently. Okay, uh, so- can, can, I, can, I, can I just add to this? Um, for a couple of inaccuracies from Mr. Coden's statement there, this is not that old of a negotiation. This is about 18 months ago that we, we really got into this. Um, certainly the retail world has changed and the concept of coming up with a series of visuals for what a first class uh, center was, we, we agreed with. We thought that was a, a good idea, especially looking at something 45 years in the future. Um, you know, it's, it's something. And uh, the Victoria Gardens, as, as Alan pointed out, is a great project. It's a major open air center over a million square feet out in Rancho Cucamonga. Los Toritos Mall is a billion dollars square, well, billion dollars in sale mall owned by Mace Rich and Los Toritos. Big asset. We wanted to have a reasonable series of bookends of what this thing would look like, or what, what we should uh, benchmark get against the runway at Playa Vista, is smaller, Whole Foods anchored. Great. We think this is still a fantastic one to benchmark against. Point at Rosecrans and Sepulveda right here in El Segundo. Another one, a great one to benchmark against. Relatively small, 110,000 square feet. But however, as Oscar pointed out, we expect to have under 150,000 square feet of retail here. This will be a pretty small retail project. Um, Simi Valley is a project that, you know, that wasn't really our ad. Um, so we we accepted it. It's fine as far as another one. We're happy to take it out. Um, that's not one that really I think adds much to the benchmarks. So look, we think we still think that the rest of the um, properties here represent viable benchmarks for the future for what a first class center will be. Um, what a retail center will look like 40 years in the future, I don't know, but what it looks like today, and if, if this is looked at in the future. I think you have to look through the lens of what was appropriate at this particular time and in this particular moment for a quality retail establishment. And I think these provide a good range for which the city can push against, against and, and qualify what a first class operation is. And, and over time, as, as I imagine, Sarah Connect will, will point out that the development agreement has been negotiated that this list can also uh, be updated over time and evolve. Uh, over time as well. So that's already built into the development agreement. Well, I, I guess I'm I'm concerned about the word negotiated. If the list is negotiated, <laughs> you have to have criteria to negotiate the list. And the criteria for negotiating the list are not here. So I don't know if they're in your heads or where they are, but they're not here. Um, um, we tried to actually include it here by making sure that the language that is um, first class retail and commercial center uh, consistent with projects of similar size and type in Southern California. I mean, it's, it's relatively broad. Um, and I think again, why we listed specific examples is to create a template in which we could say, okay, this represents a reasonable list of retailers or, or retail projects that are appropriate for Southern California. We didn't want to use New York City we didn't want to use Texas. I, we I understand. Yeah. yeah. No, I I totally <laughs> understand that. I, I I don't understand the negotiation process to develop the list. And I think it's important that that negotiation process be transparent to develop the list. And Simi Valley Town Center should not be on it based on the mm -hmm. information that I found out. So we don't um, disagree. We don't disagree. So, um, but the criteria should be there. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm gonna move on because I, I know my fellow commissioners have questions. Um, page 19, um, okay, um, page 19, this is 38 of 118, uh, 3.2.11 project entitlement states that the city certifies that the project is consistent with the general plan and applicable land use regulations. So in reviewing the applicable general plan policies in exhibit G in our package, which is at the very end, I think it's 117 of 118, um, we have several econo 
uh, economy and uh, economic and fiscal health element policies. One is EF4 that gives priority to existing, uh, gives priority to retaining existing enterprises and working with local businesses to initiate a buy local program. And then there's policy EF21 that encourage the encourages the continued economic success of small businesses in our community. And I, I want to know how you intend uh, in this development agreement to ensure that these policies are honored, our small businesses and our buy local programs. What, what have you put in place uh, in your in your strategic plans for this mall that would that would drive me to say, I could check that off my list. Well, I think that Pacific Retail, as an organization, we've actually created an initiative that we call local leasing. And so we have a head of local leasing, uh, Cynthia Check, um, who focuses on that. And part of the result of that is what we were talking about at the beginning of the, uh, of the, uh, the question and answer section uh, of the presentation was that you know, we do, we ended up with 50%, you know, of our tenants are local tenants. We believe that to have kind of a cookie cutter national tenant mix is what got the mall industry in trouble to begin with. You know, you had kind of leasing teams that were based out of, you know, national headquarters and they created the same tenant mix in all of these communities. And um, when you look at Pasteo Nuevo, it's not bad. You know, it, it is truly 50% you know, local tenants. We, it's in our DNA and we don't plan on changing, changing that anytime soon. So what do you do to incentivize local businesses and, and uh, buy local programs? So primarily, you know, when we open new tenants uh, on the local side of the business, you're going to see, um, you know, that it's not big tenant build outs for those particular tenants. They're, they're what we call capital light. They're not coming in and spending five, $10 million to, to redo a space. Um, and so we're open to that, we encourage it. And like I said earlier, the, the results really speak for themselves and that we ended up with a very heavy contingent here of local um, tenants. Well, and I think also to, to put a finer point on it, to really get to the leasing strategy and the merchandising mix that we're trying for, is look, we, we think there should be a great, great wine bar. We think there should be a tasting room. We think there should be a good bakery. We think there should be a fantastic deli. Uh, we think should, there should be a great flower shop. I mean, all those are uses that we're gonna target and we're gonna look for those from a, from a local and a regional prospect because that's, that's what, where they are. Yeah. So we're, we're gonna focus on those because that really connects with the community. Um, that's something that is not only gonna connect with the community, we think it's also gonna produce great financial results for us as well. Okay, thank you for that answer. Okay, um, I just have a couple more questions. Um, I'm sure my commissioner, my fellow commissioners are saying, thank goodness, she's almost done. Um, I'm on page- Commissioner, uh, Wiscom, Commissioner yeah. Wiscom, we're going to take a five minute break after your questions. Okay. When we come back, a Commissioner Bonderson is next up. We will see where that takes us. Uh, I'm in communication with our staff planner, Allison DeBusk, and I will make a determination as to um, an appropriate time to bring our hearing to a um, conclusion today with a continuation, because clearly it is now 4.18 p.m. Uh, and we do not want to rush through this very important matter. And uh, so just know, please take your time and we will uh, need to continue the item for deliberations on a second day, so please don't feel rushed. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, I'm gonna go on to page 24, which is 43 of 118. Uh, number six, city profit participation net sales proceeds threshold. States that it shall mean, uh, let's see, states that it shall mean an amount of the net sale proceeds sufficient to produce 12.5% unlevered internal rate of return and this is compounded annually so so my understanding from reading this several times is that the city may receive 10 percent in net sale proceeds in the event of a sale um, that are in excess of the net sale proceeds threshold 
of 12.5% compounded annually and as illustrated in, in the table referenced. Is this, is, am I getting this right? And yes. if I am, I would love to know where 12.5% came from. I, I, that is an astronomical figure to me. Well, we believe you read it correctly. It is 12.5%, a 12.5% annual return. Um, and it was a result of, of extend, extensive negotiations with uh, city staff. Does Ms. Neck, do you have anything to say to her or Mr. Coton? I think Al, uh, Alan, is, Alan needs to describe the negotiations on this because the defined terms are, are very important. And I think, Alan, are you muted? Yes, Mr. Coton, if you could please unmute yourself. We've sent you an unmute request. Thank you. Is that better? Okay. There you go. Yes. All right. Uh, let me make the first comment, which was made vigorously by the PNO people early in the process. Most ground leases do not have a profit participation. On the other hand, it is a growing trend among public private ground leases to have some level of what they call home run protection. That is to say that if the developer were to walk away with a very large profit, having uh, achieve significant concessions from the public agency, the public agency should share in the profit. Uh, notwithstanding other discussions, the fact that they're not paying rent is still arguably a concession. Uh, so we began with a significantly different threshold and a significantly different rate of return. Uh, and we encountered substantial resistance. So the city negotiating team, to some degree on operating on my advice, said, look, the best we're gonna do here is true home run protection. They've gotta hit a grand slam, they've gotta do incredibly well, or we won't get any money. And that was when there were, there was an anchor. And that was when the prospect of this being a, a, a successful quote, regional shopping center uh, justifying a very large cost basis uh, was realistic. That is no longer realistic. Mr. Like, Cohen, may, may I interrupt you for just one second? You say that was when there was an anchor. Are you referring to Nordstrom's, Macy's, or both? Well, at the very beginning, both. But it, as okay. negotiations materialized, it was Nordstrom's. And, uh, and the idea that there was a viable retail reuse, if not a if not an anchor, there was a viable retail reuse, which they, which they they proposed and we share uh, for the uh, for the Macy's building. And as I said, even at that level, it was a very very long shot that we would ever participate. It is now that clause is essentially irrelevant. I mean, right. there's, there's no there's we we can spend time talking about numbers, but. It is essentially irrelevant in a market where it has gone from being a regional center with a cost base that reflected a regional center to basically uh, something that's going to be very, very different. So, so, uh, so, so again, I have to dis disagree, though. I mean, because look, I, I can uh, today, because we are in the financial world in this space, and if you were to try to sell this asset today, given the way the, the, the market is, you would not get an investor on an unlevered basis if their projections were showing a very high teens to 20% sort of IRR today. There would be no takers. We do not envision, as I pointed out previously, that the long-term viability of Paseo Nuevo is simply a mall. We look at this as a series of phases that will produce a mixed-use project hopefully anchored by a grocer, hopefully anchored by office and housing with very productive and good solid tenancy throughout the main mall area. Those projects today, if they even, even in this world today, if they were to hit the market and they have something like a Whole Foods anchoring it, can get very aggressive pricing. They can get pricing that is sub 10% on an unlevered IRR. So that exists today. I mean, we, we've seen this, you know, um, the major brokerage firms like Eastill can collaborate this sort of thing. 
So I do not think this is pie in the sky. We would love to make sure that this is something that um, the city gets to have a chance to participate in in the future. Um, we think this is a reasonable number given where we are in the world of finance and what returns are required by lenders and investors. We think this is a, a very modest return and we think it does have meaning and bearing on the project as we move forward. Oh, okay. Um, wh when the negotiation started um, on, on um, the net sale proceeds threshold, what, what did we start, what did the city start with or, hmm? Well, basically the, I had a model based on some other public private ground leases I used. And my model was uh, basically a 10% share above a 12% return on equity. And they insisted that the, I actually asked for 10, but uh, they, they, they insisted and uh, they were quite adamant that they would not let that calculation be made on equity that it had to be made on the entire cost base. And that is what made the agreement uh, from the very beginning a very unlikely thing. I mean, they, there is a word in this business and it was exactly appropriate. It's home run protection. It's not the it's not the prospect that we'll ever that we're likely to get money. It was a protection against the fact that this thing would go through the roof, make a whole lot of money for the current owners, and if it did, we should get something. Okay. Um, so basically, home run protection, Mr. Coton, then is is really doesn't in this case doesn't benefit the city because it's unlikely to happen and it greatly benefits PNO. Is that, would you reasonably agree with that? They come from the position which has some support in the marketplace that participation clauses are not that common. If we were to, if we were to reason from the best participation clauses that exist in public private ground leases, the statement you just made would be correct. They don't reason from that. I kind of understand why they don't reason from it. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I get it. So I, I, the statement you made really quite literally depends on which side of the argument you take. Because right. uh, I have been on a private side and participation clauses are difficult. They, they pose real problems. Uh, so, the, the, the solution, quite frankly, and, and we've been over a little bit perhaps further than we would have liked to, is that all you get is home run protection. You, 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 it, is, it, it really means a super profit. Could I just add one comment, though, that, that from the very beginnings of the negotiation, this was always framed as a home run protection and, um, you know, never really considered to be anything more than that. But as time has gone on, it has become more unlikely and the negotiations have become more difficult. So, so it's not that it, 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 the conception of it changed, you know, radically from the beginning to the end, it was always considered something that was, you know, kind of unlikely that the city would participate in, but because of the, you know, more difficult circumstances with the anchors going and the, the more difficult economy, it's become even more likely that we will participate. Even more unlikely. That Not more unlikely. Yes. Correct. That we Sorry. Yeah. I, I, wish, I wish your first statement was true, but it seems <laughs> yeah, to even more unlikely. May I ask you then, uh, just as a follow-up, as, as, negotiations continued and you got to this point where you went to uh, city council with your term sheet, was your term sheet really not that much change from, I mean, the circumstances in, in retail and commercial and uh, losing our anchor stores has changed so much. So did the term sheet ever evolve or was it just what it was? So that's a great question. And actually, Scott Schumann wanted to point out a couple of things. 
I, I think somebody needs to unmute him now. Sir, sir, no, let, let me let if I would just like to sure. answer that question, though, that the, the when we went back to council, the last opportunity in April was before uh, Nordstrom Nordstrom's had announced its closure and um, the final term sheet was um, negotiated in January of 2019 and um, that's the one that was council approved and we, we didn't change it from that point on. So it didn't, it didn't change. We just went directly from that to the negotiating the development agreement. Um, and we, you know, kind of followed council's direction after that. So we didn't go back to that term sheet. Right. After in that in other words, right. In, in other words, what we did was we spent the better part of a year negotiating the term sheet. We presented it to the city council. The city council approved it unanimously. And then we we went to drafting this development agreement based specifically on the terms of, of the term sheet that was unanimously approved. That's taken the better part of 18 months to get to here. So to answer your question directly, Ms. Vice uh, Chairwoman, um, the figures were negotiated at the outset. They haven't been changed since they were approved by the city council. And, and one other point to make there, not to get too technical on the finance side, but the home run protection should have some relationship to the return expectations for equity to be invested in retail in the market. And with what's happened with COVID and with what's happened with the closure of Nordstrom, any equity investor in this space would actually require a higher return now than they would have when we negotiated the term sheet. That gap between what the investor would require to put money into a, a project like this versus the home run protection has actually diminished over time. Investors require a higher return to invest in this type of asset today than they would have a year ago. I would like Thank to you. comment on that. I absolutely agree with what Oscar just said expectations in the retail space have risen. Equity is extremely expensive these days, okay? Debt is relatively cheap. Therefore, the combined rates are a great deal lower than the 12.5% that is in that analysis. I think it is somewhat disingenuous to, to take the equity rate when they were so insistent that the that all the calculations be made to the full total cost of the project. Thank and, you. And, that's, and that is true, Alan, but the last point is there is no debt available for inline shops today. It's very difficult to raise that debt. And I think you would agree. Thank you for that discussion. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, I'm just gonna move on with my final questions. Um, so given the incredible value of a 28 year lease in uh, in extension, if the leaseholder in good stance opts for the in for the extension, uh, was there any discussion about a provision in the development agreement for the city to collect rent during that 28 year period? Sarah? I think we did discuss it, discuss it initially um, in, the, in the very early days, um, but, but it, was the, it was clear that we didn't want to amend the lease. So, um, and I think a rent provision would have required a lease amendment. Um, at least that was the thinking. So um, we, we did not pursue a rent clause in the development agreement. Um, PNO was, I believe, pretty adamant that there wouldn't be a rent payment. And as they've expressed here tonight, they believe that their payments that they that they are going to be or would be making to the city are the equivalent to a rent payment. Wow. Okay, um, 
I, I would think that you know, from a legal standpoint, and, and again, I'm not an attorney, but I would think from a legal standpoint, there would be a way to add that in, just like you added in the home run clause, there would be a way to let, to add in um, a, um, that if the, if the uh, option to extend was, was applied for and granted, that there would be consideration or there would be requirement to have some financial benefit from that. Well, you, I, you don't I, have to call it rent. I don't know what you call it, right. but it should have a financial benefit. I guess that sh probably should have. And, and we, and, right. And we could, we could certainly add that to this agreement and we could definitely amend the, um, the lease at any time. And we could amend um, we could amend that the existing ground lease at any time. We could amend to, to add that that if there is an extension, that it will include a lease provision. And we could include a clause here in the DA that if it's exercised, it will include a lease provision. So we could include something in the DA to say that if there is an exercise of the extension, that there will, there will include. A negotiation with regard, or there will include a lease clause or a rent clause. And and would you would you be able at this point in time to make that specific? Just as you've made the home run clause specific to um, uh, unlevered internal rate of return, make this specific to something that's appropriate. Yeah, it would have to be negotiated, and at, at this point in time. Yeah, it would have this. This it would have to be negotiated at this point in time. Okay. Um, it would be a it would be a tricky negotiation had in order to figure out what that what that amount would be. But we could do it. Okay. I'd like how, to how to determine what the amount would be? I, okay. I'd like to add to that that I, I've been in that particular position and the most. I'm not recommending it. I'm merely saying the most common situation is to set up a way for determining fair market rental value, which right. is analogous to fair fair market sale right. value. And that would, it, you'd negotiate a little bit about the terms of doing that, but the, the most likely way, if, if, if such a clause were to be added or as it has been added in at least two other ground leases that I've done, where they have, have extension provisions, you reset the fair market rental value. Okay, right. so you don't you don't actually set a specific number. You, no. you do the same thing, and you have uh, you know a you have a yeah. Okay, I, I get results. it. That's yeah, that's great. Okay, I I like that approach. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And then um, just another question. I didn't see it in here, but I didn't get into all the legalese at the end of this. But um, in the event of a sale of the lease by P and O, does the development agreement transfer with it, or are new terms put in place? Does the does so if they were to sell it in ten years from now, and there was a development agreement in place with the lease extension, does that transfer to the new owners? Sell the lease? Does it develop? The leasehold. The lease they sell the yeah. leasehold. Right. Yeah. Right. If they, yeah. if they assign the lease, again, I'm not a alert. I'm not an attorney. Right. They they would assign the the DA as well. They and they would. can, there's very, there's very um, defined provisions in the DA that regulate, um, we have control, s some ability right. to, yeah. right, yeah. So there's assignment for provisions in the DA that are right. more restrictive than the assignment provisions in the lease. So yes. they would both apply. Okay, okay. But the, the, the new leaseholder would have the benefit of the 28 year um, extension uh, under the same terms that were in the current development agreement. Is that correct? Assuming same that we condition. approved the yes, assign E. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Assign and, and assuming I mean, we approved the DA assignment. Yes. yes, I I understand. I I did read through the um, assignment process, so I thought that was pretty thorough. But um, okay, mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair, I think I'm done. And thank you very mm -hmm. much for for all the time. So.
Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Wiscom. Uh, it is almost 440 and we are going to take a five minute break. And then we're going to come back and Commissioner Bonderson is up next with questions. We're going to continue on after Commissioner Bonderson with all of the other commissioner questions, including my own. Uh, and I'm sure Commissioner Higgins is still with us by audio. We'll also ask if he has questions. And uh, then at that point, and we'll see, hopefully that's close to six o'clock, but we'll do a time check. I am going to ask um, one of my colleagues to make a motion to continue this item. Clearly, we have more work to do, um, more questions and deliberations. And so uh, staff will be looking ahead to another date as soon as possible for continuation uh, on deliberations. So let's do this. It's 440. Let's come back at 445, please. We're in recess. Thank you. 
question. I know that you were next in line. Um, Commissioner Escobedo, Commissioner Higgins, who is participating remotely today by audio because of a family matter, may he go after Commissioner Bonderson and then I could take you. He has um, he has a, a family uh, need that he needs to, uh, he could attend to, please. Is that all yes, right? Yes, Madam Chair, yeah. That's okay, fine. very good. So Commissioner Higgins, you're gonna go after Commissioner Bonderson. And if we could- I need, uh, one, I need one more. Yes. Yes, sure, Commissioner Bonderson. And so um, when Commissioner Bonderson returns, if we could please have um, Ms. Connect and Mr. Coton come back. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Mr. Coton? I don't want to mangle your last name, Cotton, Coton. I, please help me with that. It, it's Mr. Coton. Mr. Coton, excellent, thank you. <laughs> Try to get that correct. And uh, let's see, what else would I like to announce? Just for those who are um, joining us just now, I want to make sure the public knows that I'm going to do a time check at around six o'clock with the intention of continuing this item to a second day staff will be working on making that happen as soon as possible. Um, we'll do a time check. We, I'd like to get through questions. So we're gonna be as efficient but thorough as possible. And then the continued uh, matter will be deliberations on the second hearing date. Ms. Uh, Commissioner Bonderson, if you're ready, and I don't wanna leave anyone out. Commissioner Bonderson, if you would like any of the applicant team to also be available, uh, that's, that ball is in your court, okay? Absolutely, thank you so much. Okay. And I might even uh, uh, depend on you, Chair Schwartz, to help me uh, guide the questions to the right person if I'm not quite uh, aiming at the right, at the right person. Um, so I just wanted to start, um, by mentioning that this conversation, this uh, series, these series of questions that Vice Chair Wiscombe has asked has really brought up uh, a number of very interesting, um, quite exciting plans and ideas from the PNO team. And I'm interested to know, um, perhaps I missed it, maybe it's there and I overlooked it. Could you direct me to any of the financial analysis that's been provided in this um, agreement packet that actually demonstrates some of these plans and development ideas in writing is was it in there in some fashion that I missed are you is this directed to to the PL group probably it's, it's probably more directed to our staff and our team at the city who maybe drafted up the staff report? Because I'm, I'm particularly interested in understanding um, whether or not there's some form of development plan that really highlights these ideas that they're that they put into into verbiage today. Because I believe that it really supports the direction we're going with this, and I'm wondering if it's in here somewhere that I overlooked. Um. Oh. Commissioner Bonderson, if I could just address that a little bit. So the requirement with regard to the expenditure of the $20 million, um, there is a condition that the city audit the expenditures of those funds. So um, once the agreement were to take effect, if it were to take effect, they do need to submit audit statements to us so that we can confirm how that money is spent on, and on what it's expended for so that we can confirm that the, the capital expenditures are made and the TI expenditures are made. So that is in here. Um, also with regard to the maintenance obligations, there is a requirement that they um, confirm to us that we have auditing requirements on those kind of expenditures as well. Is, is that what you were asking about? Yes, perhaps. I can re 
phrase the question to you in particular and, the, and, and explain the reason I'm looking for this. Ordinarily, when, when two entities go into a contract together, there's a, a, some kind of a business plan, there's some kind of a project description which hides a value to it. And for me to be able to review a document of this caliber that is so vital for us to understand in order to go into an agreement, I, I feel like we really need to understand these milestones and where these ideas are coming from, I, especially considering how many quite exciting ideas have been presented today. I'm, I'm curious to know, perhaps the city already received some form of business plan model that uh, you used to draft this development agreement? Does that exist? Um, well, so so going back, um, many of these costs that that we have, the city has shifted over to PNO in this agreement. For example, and, and and this may not answer your question, so I apologize for that. But but many of these costs, for example, the trash collection costs and the parking costs and the PBIA collection costs. Um, those costs are contained in old agreements, like they're contained in the ground lease or they're contained in city other city agreements. And um, so those exist in other agreements that um, the city has been paying over the years that the redevelopment agency has been paying over the years. Um, and we have just taken those documented costs and you know transferred them into this agreement. Um, so that's where those are. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the new costs that PNO is going to be taking on, we've, we've tried to lay that out and document that here as best we can. And then, as I said, there's auditing of the new um, obligations that they will be taking on. Um, you know, and then in, in terms of like um, the 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 basis on which we've kind of tried to estimate what the return to the city will be some of that is based upon um the sales that we the sales from the center that that we um expect to come in the future and that that is based upon information that pno has provided to mr coton in the past so, um, you know, that's that's a little bit where that information comes from. D does that help at all? It, it, it does. I think this is more of a, a dialogue that we're going to get ourselves to the right place. So I'll just kind of. Okay, keep on. Question. Yeah. Keep if I may, um, I, I, I think I can add, I think I can add slightly to this dialogue. Okay. Uh, your, your initial uh, premise, uh, Commissioner, uh, Bonderson was actually correct. Yes, we, do, we, we when we began this, uh, I was provided under very stringent confidentiality uh, arrangements with their business plan uh, for the retail center. And uh, I analyzed it. I reported on it in a very general way to the uh, to the city staff. And it seemed at the time, uh, and I, I, this is, uh, it seemed at the time to make a fair amount of sense uh, from two points of view. Number one is they, the uh, piano projected significant improvement in their leasing. And based on that, we also projected significant improvement in sales tax. The combination of sales tax and the benefits that we were going to get from the transaction seemed to make a rational return. Now, those projections were made over two years ago and have never been updated uh, to, uh, to, to account for, uh, they, did, they did account for the closing of Macy's, they did not account for the closing of Nordstrom, nor, nor obviously for the, for the pandemic. Uh, and part of the modification to the staff recommendation is that we, we wanted to be very careful not to overstate the benefits of the PBIA uh, thing because of the change in sales tax, and that is driven by sales tax. It's a, it's a sales tax formula, and which is part of the reason it, it, it has gone down. Uh, 
the other thing I can attest to, I think, because I've basically been a pretty close part of the negotiating team, is we have never seen any projections for the other two properties of any sort. All right. So, Actually, I really appreciate your answer, and I'm gonna I'm going to follow up with a perhaps a personal <laughs> question directed at you yourself, sir. Um, I think that was very insightful what you said is that you had this opportunity to review the material that was presented to you and make the best decision you could based on that. And that was just over two years ago, I understand. And I think you said it yourself that those those ideas don't reflect the current situation we are today, that we're all in today. Um, do you on a personal level feel that this uh, development agreement would need to be updated to reflect those changes? since we are really dealing with a significant amount of uh, of issues that impact and change the way we look at this project? I almost, I knew that question was gonna come up, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> uh, and let me share with you my, what I will attempt to be a balanced response to that question. It is very clear that were we negotiating a development agreement at any time in the last three or four months, it would be very different than the one that has been presented to you. The one that was, pre was presented to you was the underlying assumption was continuation as a major retail center, perhaps a single anchor center rather than a tool anchor center. But, and I think Mr. Plenji was very, very accurate in saying that the future of this property and the future of very many properties is not as a regional center, but as a mixed use project. Were that to be the case, the agreement would be very different. Were that to be the case, there would be no way that the agreement would be made only for uh, the PO property. It would also have to, have to cover the uh, Ortega building and arguably, if depending on who gets control, uh, the Nordstrom building as well. That being said, let me give you the counter to it because you know, one needs to be fair. Uh, we negotiated this in, in, in good faith, uh, notwithstanding the very careful uh, caveats inside the uh, term sheet. Uh, based on the term sheet, they went forward and spent a bunch of money. So then the question that you have to deal with as a, uh, as a public decision-making body is quite frankly, what is the balance between the inapplicability of some of the elements of the current uh, in the current situation against the fact that this was a deal that was negotiated by both sides very hard, very, you know, it was hard negotiations, but it was done in good faith and, uh, and relying on it, uh, uh, they made uh, significant investments. So I can't tell you where that balance lies, I can, but I think, you, I think you captured something that's very relevant. Had this agreement been negotiated anywhere in the last six months, it would be very different. You know, can I comment from the <laughs> PO side, if you don't mind? Um, I think a couple of things. Uh, one, you know, look, we've tried to show the city and the community some excellent good faith by putting our money where our mouth is, doing something that we think is really beneficial for the city. Um, we're not trying to renegotiate the ground lease. The ground lease is what it is for the next 46 years, and we could not even be having this conversation right now and just kind of going on our way. And the city would be stuck with the various provisions that are, exist within that ground lease, and that would be that. Um, we think, and we came to these initial discussions with the city um, in good faith from the standpoint of looking to relieve the city from various financial burdens. Uh, we think we've accomplished that. We think that even if this was renegotiated today, those provisions would be the same and nothing would change. I, so I, I don't think there would be really anything differently from our side as far as this side of the table uh, negotiating with the city on changing where we are with the proposed development agreement right now. Uh, we still think this is a great deal for the city. Um, we are simply looking for the ability to um, take on a number of liabilities that don't currently exist for the lessee, which is us, under the ground lease, and that in return, in 46 years provided as uh, the staff has pointed out, we perform under the development agreement and under the ground lease 
and we meet all those obligations 46 years from now, we're allowed to extend for another period of time, a uh, small period of time. Um, we think this is a reasonable trade-off. So just to be clear from the Pacific retail side of things, um, we would not change our position at all. Um, we think this is one of a zillion different things that will be coming down the road with the retail evolution. It will not change. Um, we, will, we are on the forefront of the development of retail and the redevelopment of retail. Um, we are pivoting as we need to. Um, we think the mix of uses is going to be a great boon for the city. It's going to make this a super viable um, project for the city over the long term. And we think it'll be financially successful. So, you know, we think what we're doing is nothing will change that thinking. I mean, that's the way we're going to proceed. So, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, people understand how we view this. Oh, yes. No, absolutely. I actually feel like that is a good thing for all of us to hear. And what my takeaway is, is that even if we do move forward as a as a city and have to reorganize this deal a little bit to to really allow it to accurately reflect the current situation that you're not in any position to want to change the the general underlying uh, conditions of the agreement and at that that's really great to hear. Um, I want to take that back to uh, Mr. Cotton for a moment. As decision makers who are ultimately speaking on behalf of the public, our, our taxpayers are, are, you know, this is an agreement that a private party is going into with us, with the city, with the people who, you know, are part of our community. What do, what do you need as part of the process from us today in order to be able to update and really bring in some of those accuracies that are currently lacking in, the, in this document? Do, do you need us to make this recommendation to council that just says, let's do another, let's do another draft? That's a toughie. Uh, I, Mr. Plenji is correct in much of the, what he said. And in fact, and he is, would not like to see, and I fully understand why, any major renegotiation of the terms. Uh, so I, I don't think that the terms as you have seen them would materially change. What has changed, and I can't make this decision for you, I can only point out your, your what it means. What has changed is that the economic benefit, two things have changed. One is that the economic benefits uh, associated with this are, are still real, but they are much smaller they are not likely to get anywhere near as big. The retail uses that may or may not apply to the two adjacent properties are not going to in any way replace the volume of department stores from a sales tax or, or perhaps from a property tax point of view. I don't know about the property tax. I haven't spent that much time on it. Uh, so the deal is different. We're not going to get a lot of the things that we had hoped for out of the original transaction. There is one other aspect of the transaction which resulted from the negotiations, which has actually been mentioned in passing in, in the staff report and in some earlier uh, presentations, which probably would change because I, I've been listening to you and, and the other council. In a much earlier version, the intent was that the lease extensions would apply to both the Macy's lease and to the PNO lease. We proposed that and it was rejected by the lessee who said he would not go forward because of the uncertainties he felt with respect to the outcome of any redevelopment of the Macy's property. And we respect- Actually, that. Alan, that, that's not accurate, Alan. The, the deal cool. was, the, the deal was bifurcated at the insistence of the city. We had no. started down the road we had started down the road of both the Macy's building and the main mall and at the city's insistence because the feeling was that it was going to be too difficult to accomplish both in one, we bifurcated and we agreed with the city to do that.
Well, I, I don't think, sorry, I, I don't think we want to get into this um, no, I don't think we, discussion we want about the facts right now, because I think there's a significant disagreement about that. By the way, you just turned yourself off, Sarah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, but no. I think there's a disagreement about the, the bifurcation on that, yeah. because, yeah. so I don't think we want to engage in a, dis, in a discussion on that. No, but what I, where I was going with it, Commissioner Bonderson, was the fact that I think the most dramatic change that would happen if we were negotiating this in the last six months is that I don't think in any way we would have negotiated just the PNO. I think that, yeah, see, at the time, and I, I, I do understand, at the time we wanted certain commitments from, from them about Macy's project that they felt they could not make. And we acknowledge that. And without those commitments, we did we did bifurcate that. I'm just without going into great detail. But at this point, because of the fact that uh, we're we're dealing with a very different retail environment, um, I mean, uh, I, I think it was one of the uh, I think it was Steve or one of the people from PNO pointed out there there is no history, there's no precedent for the. Uh, the blows that the retail industry has taken in the last six six months or so. I mean, it just there's nothing like it. Given that, I would I would think, uh, quite frankly, and this is what I think you asked, what would change? And I think the most important thing that would change is it would have to be would have to be for the combined properties. They have already been talking about the combined properties. Now that's a personal view. I don't, I'm not saying that they would agree to that. I'm not, I, but I'm merely saying that. From the city's point of view, and I can say this very factually because the whole team has discussed this at various points of view, from the city's point of view, it would be about the two properties they control and not just one. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the dialogue, um, especially the feedback from both sides. I think it's really important for all of us to, to know what's going on um, in this situation. and. You know, based on where we stand today, of course, things have changed. I think we're all, you know, understanding of that and, and sensitive to that. Um, I'm, I'm just curious to know, based on the, um, um, I'm trying to remember the recalculation that Ms. Connect mentioned during the presentation and you referred to a moment ago, there seems to be a, uh, from 300,000 to approximately 130 to 150,000, um, estimated, um, that's about half. We're looking at about half of the return. I'm, I'm interested to know what the city, um, like, could you speak to us from your perspective on how this deal benefits us considering this loss? What do we continue to, to see as a positive? Well, there are two things and they're, 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 they're very simple. One's pretty small and one's pretty big. One okay. is pretty small is the money you're going to get every year. I mean, uh, I know you're hurting for money, all the cities are, but in the last analysis, $150,000 isn't gonna move your needle. Uh, it just won't. Uh, uh, the, but the second part of this, which is, and was originally both your city manager's view and when we entered the negotiations and such like, is that we got a commitment to spend a whole lot of money improving a, a part of the city that really needs improvement. And what we thought at the beginning was that we would not get that commitment uh, unless we negotiated an extension. Uh, we were somewhat surprised, but uh, they, the PNO has already explained uh, that uh, they went forward with it anyway. So the, the the pluses and minuses here are from the pluses are they went forward and spent a whole bunch of money and you are going to get some more money, not a lot, but you're going to get some more money. Uh, and that's what you get out of it. And that's what you, you, you have to decide whether that's worthwhile. That's that I was about to say, that's why you're elected, but we're not at council now. We're, we're that's why you were appointed. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and so as, as the negotiators of the deal, my understanding is that um, we were able to use this moment in time to shift some of those. How did they say it? They called it a cost shifting. They shifted some of those costs onto the 
the, the private owner, uh, private leasee, I'm sorry, um, this partnership. And so my, my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, ordinarily, and maybe this is a question that goes to the people who do this kind of development every day. Ordinarily, I would assume these costs are actually held by you in this kind of a mall environment, correct? The, these costs are normal? Is that what you're asking? Um, I don't have the list open in front of me, but the trash enclosure, uh, the trash uh, uh, parking. Um, trash parking and PBIA, those are the three. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. It would take me a minute to look that up. Um, you know, are those things that are ordinarily part of the agreements that you guys get into when you're acquiring and redeveloping? We, 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 we uh, rarely do ground leases, so it's it's not normal. I mean, typically we have fee ownership of all the properties. In fact, this is the only ground lease that we're involved in. So I can't really speak to what's what's normal and customary. Fair enough. And, and, and Commissioner, some of the costs that we've agreed to pay for on the development agreement, for example, like trash, those are for building and tenants that we don't even own. That's an obligation that the city has been paying year over year that we, we agreed to step in and, and defer the burden onto us versus the city. Those aren't our tenants, those aren't our buildings. So these aren't the these aren't the tenants that you plan to have on your list. These are other tenants on the property that have nothing to do with you. So you're taking on the entire block? They're no, just a, por a portion of it. I guess I'm confused about that and I and I, I'm really glad you brought it up so we can clarify it. Could you give us a little bit more detail? Uh, uh, I can because I basically negotiated the original ground lease. <laughs> Don't uh, <worry. laughs> the, 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 the two buildings would not sell out at the original time. So the, basically the original developer of this made an agreement with them that, that basically facade their retail and have their retail work with the center. And that, 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 that agreement has survived to the present time. Functionally, in terms of creating the, the critical mass and volume, they are part of the center. Legally, they are not. So to, to carry on with that idea, we're, we're talking about, thank you so much for putting the slide up. We're talking about a, a, a fairly small exchange of financial um, return. Can yeah. you talk to us just very briefly, um, just kind of put it out there for us, um, what, can you help us understand exactly what that exchange is? They're putting in, PNO is putting in 2 million and we're looking at approximately 400,000 a year in this in this cost shifting arrangement and maybe about 150,000 estimated a year. Is that it? Is that the well, extent of it? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think that's correct. And I think maybe Scott Schumann can elucidate this um, in a sure. In a Sure, sure. Our, our initial commitment is for 20 million. I think you probably looking at your notes and said 2 million, but you, I'm sure you meant oh, 20 million. 20 million, right. absolutely. So, right, yeah. So our original commitment is for 20 million uh, to be invested into the property immediately. And in fact, as has been pointed out here numerous times, we went in good faith and have already invested the vast majority of that. In exchange for that, the, the, uh, the direct, sort of monetary uh, recovery for the city is this um, trash recovery, currently at about $62,000 a year. The, uh, the parking subsidy that the city has provided to the workers of uh, the tenants at Pase Nueva. So um, the city subsidizes part of their parking in the city parking lot, I guess, it's expensive to park in downtown Santa Barbara. And so um, the city picks up some of that for for retail workers. We would pick that up. That's about $32,000 a year. So that gets you to about between 90 and $100,000 a year. And then in addition would be this PBIA where we would go from 100 to upwards of an upward limit of 300 increasing for, um, for, for um, CPI, which um, at this point, uh, what we're finding out, I guess, tonight, last night, is that that number is substantially reduced with the closing of Macy's and Nordstrom's, but frankly, it's really temporarily reduced um, until we can get 
the Macy's reactivated and until whoever ends up controlling the Nord Stream gets that reactivated, at which point there would again be that tax that we would be on the hook for up to the 300,000. Thank you so much. Um, excuse me. And also there's the $200,000 one-time payment Correct. for the homeless assistance. Um, and, and then I also just want to point out that we are getting um, increased commitments to the ma maintenance obligations and um, the assignment provisions have been enhanced as well. So there are maintenance and operation requirements that are enhanced in the development agreement. Right. And, and to that end, thank you for pointing that out, Sarah. I was just focusing on the strict monetary obligations, Commissioner. I thought that was your question, but but to Sarah's point, there are additional operational obligations in connection with with uh, the development agreement, and further additional uh, enforcement rights and abilities for the city that don't exist in the ground lease uh, currently. So not only do we have a higher standard to live up to. Um, you also have an easier ability to enforce that higher standard. But Scott, why don't you also go into the assignability provisions that currently are not in the, in the Sure. Lease. So currently in the in the assignment section of the ground lease, um, and um, it's it's not quite a free right to assign, but it's a very low standard. We could assign the ground lease. Uh, we have to get the city's consent, and it's a reasonable standard, which is an extremely low hurdle. In the uh, development in the development agreement. We could, um, in order for us to be, um, as a condition of the development agreement, the city wanted to make sure that there's always a high quality, um, highly experienced and well-funded um, operator on the project. In other words, um, the city didn't want us to turn this around and assign the deal to um, three wealthy individuals who have never operated this kind of project. Uh, that's kind of a recipe for disaster and it would and it would ruin the city's downtown potentially. So as a part of the development agreement, there are very specific um, and detailed requirements um, that the city still has a right to approve in every instance, any transfer of the ground lease and the development agreement. Um, but the city has an absolute right to say uh, no to individuals, companies that would take over that don't have the requisite operating experience or don't hire um, an operator or a manager with the requisite operating experience and that don't have uh, a particular net worth standard so that um, they're able to weather a time like this the way that we have. Thank you. I, I actually want to kind of build on what you've all been adding to the conversation and maybe go back to our city uh, representatives for a moment obviously this is a deal that to the average viewer they might not understand how it's balanced I, I had a lot of difficulty understanding the balance but since you are both have spent so much time and you have information that perhaps we're in some ways not privy to why would you as a city member um, put together a deal that on paper doesn't look balanced, what do we gain out of it? I would really like to know because maybe there's something that would really help us understand this, this opportunity. If this, if this is a positive thing, can you share that positive with us? Where's the exchange? Is, is that for me? Because I'm happy to, to speak to that. Uh, for um, the city staff members, please. Mr. Thank Cotton. you, Commissioner. Oh, okay. I thought- You wanna go first? Uh, no, you go first, then, then okay. I'll go. Okay, I'll start. Um, thank you. So um, I, I think it's been alluded to several times already um, that this has been um, a long road and many things have changed over time during this road. And um, when the city first inherited this property and these leases from the redevelopment agency, there were a number and are still a number of obligations contained within those lease agreements that the city inherited. And um, that was, you know, assigning those obligations over to PO, I think is 
what part of this agreement that makes it something that is um, a benefit to the city. Um, enhancing those maintenance and operation operational requirements in the mall is a benefit to the city. Um, I, I, can, I can say those things are. I think that's, that, that the monetary shifts um, have been diminished over time. I think that um, particularly with regard to the PBIA, uh, we set that cap at $300,000 um, on the basis that the retail element uh, would come back, that this would be a regional mall, and that this would be, that we would reach that cap at $300,000 with CPI um, over the long haul. I don't know that that will happen. I don't know that this will be a regional mall with retail, that cap is based upon retail sales. Um, if it's office, if it's residents, that's not gonna happen. So I think there's been a, I, I think there's been a big diminishment. Um, it's not for me to say whether or not it provides adequate value to the city. I can only say that this is a legal document that it's been negotiated in good faith we went forward on the basis that the city council approved a term sheet and said, you know, on this basis, go negotiate. We did our best in that vein. And we bring it to you um, with that recommendation. Beyond that, it's um, to the discretion of the legislative body. Sir, can I, when you mentioned a, a big diminishment, can you uh, be more specific on on exactly what what you're defining as a big diminishment on that on that front, because uh, you pointed out the PBIA, but what what other things have you seen as far as a big diminishment as, as a change? You know what? I don't actually take questions from the applicant. I take questions from the commission. Commissioner Balderson, back to you. Back to you, please, to continue. Yes. And um, if there's any way, I don't want to cut you off. If you're wrapping things up soon, we're then going to go, um, actually, we are going to go to Commissioner Escobedo. Commissioner Higgins uh, has moved something around. And so we're going to keep going. Again, I'm just looking at the time. Thank you. Thank so you. Me, I have a few may questions may left. May I, can may I augment uh, yes, Sarah's please. answer very slightly? What, what are we getting out of this? You have to go back and you have to look at the situation at the time that this transaction began. We had a declining State Street. We had an owner who said that notwithstanding the long history of no investment in the process, he would not go forward with a reinvestment unless he got an extension. We got the reinvestment. You have to figure out what that's worth but that, that in addition to the benefits, and they are quite real, but they're monetarily not very large, but they're quite real uh, in, the, in the development agreement. Uh, if you go back to the core of it, that's why we did it. Thank you. Would you please remind me, um, what, what year did P&O take over? When, when, when did this what, change? They bought in at 20, they bought in at 2015. They started in 2016 to work on uh, on this center. They had a very long time with the Historic Landmarks Commission, and by 2017, when we were when we were engaged to start with the DA process, they had largely, or they were well on their way to getting approval from uh, the Landmarks Commission. So let me ask a different question that doesn't have to do with PNO, but with whoever was. Um, in charge prior what what was the reason or maybe it's the maybe the question has to be asked a different way but why wasn't that um lisi um taking responsibility to oh. have the keep and uh maintenance and so on that's naturally hard the, the, of a that 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 issue came up and okay. let me let me give you my take on it and i i I have to, you know, full disclosure, this is my my view of it, but it's based on a lot of experience in looking at ground leases and retail. 
the first three owners of this project were all shopping center developers. In 2002, it was sold to a pension fund or to a, a, an advisor fund to a pension fund. The problem with that, and it's my experience and I'm not characterizing anything about the particular people involved, but, but the course of events tends to support my view is particularly in that era, pension fund investors tend to be custodial and not entrepreneurial. One consequence of that is that they were not paying as much attention as I think an entrepreneurial owner would have done to the need for periodic reinvestment to keep your center exciting, to keep it attraction. And the, even when retail was healthy, the character was, what have you done for me Re lately? If you don't have a center that kind of partially reinvents itself every decade or two, uh, you're going to fade. And this, is, this has happened. I've been doing real estate for quite a long time. I think they finally woke up in the mid 2015s and realized that the pattern of just hiring managers was not going to work. And they sought somebody who could rescue them. And P, uh, PCRP, Pacific Retail Partners, has an excellent reputation for rescuing centers. It's kind of what they do. What, at least at the time they joined us, it was kind of a critical element in their business model. So I, I think that they basically, you know, were they weren't minding the score. They weren't entrepreneurial. They didn't make the investment. And then they kind of woke up and realized they needed to do something. And they, at that point, they made a pretty rational decision and brought in PCRP, not as a manager, but as a partner. That was the critical distinction. That's, that, that's how I think we got here. And, and Commissioner, sorry, and yeah. Commissioner Ponderson, just, just to, to, to elucidate a little bit further, because we are in this space and we have 12 assets of the silk, the, it is not uncommon as we come in to these assets, it is not uncommon to see, and a lot of these are owned institutionally, most assets that are large department store anchored retail with anchors like Nordstrom and Macy's are owned by real estate investment trusts. It is not uncommon when we come into these assets to, to find that they have not been reinvested in for longer than you know the cycle is. Cycle should be about 10 years, maybe 15 years arguably, and we've come into assets that haven't been touched for very much longer than that. It's not an uncommon thing to see. Yeah, and I'm really sorry to hear that. It probably shouldn't be that way, and, and we got ourselves into a jam here. Uh, this comes right back to a contractual question that I have for the city. At the time of the original agreement, we're not looking at that today, but was there any sort of like enforcement or you know risk uh, portion to the contract that that allowed us as a city to hold them accountable. I'm talking about the previous, uh, whatever, 25 years before this group joined us. I was there's there. The, <laughs> sorry, there's the the typical um, default provisions, but actually the the lease has um, after the first 10 years. Uh, I think it's 10 years. I have to go back and look, but I, I think it's after, well, after the first 20 years, um, I believe there is not even an, an operating clause. And that may be wrong. I'm thinking of Macy's You're right. actually. You're right. I, I remember. Yeah. You're yeah. Right. yeah. So the, the, the actual um, provisions in the leases are fairly, um, relaxed in terms of operating, which is, it, 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 am I right? It, yeah, let, let me jump in for a moment. Yeah. You have to realize what you're, you're in Santa Barbara. With all due respect, I've worked in a whole lot of cities. Santa Barbara is a tough city. They want a lot. They have incredibly high standards. It's a very expensive place to develop in. That was true in, 1980, in the late 1980s when I was hired by the city to help negotiate that first lease. There are two people in this organization, and I wonder if she'll endorse what I'm saying or not, uh, in this meeting that, that were there, myself and Sheila Lodge. Now, here's what happened. You put out an RFP for a shopping center. You got three bids. Two of them were from really big, well-established shopping center developers. 
And one of them was from a kind of no-name no guy in the Bay Area named John Reinecke. The problem was that the two, two big guys insisted on building a fortress, the classic enclosed mall, and the city just didn't want to deal with them. So they picked the other guy because he was the only one who really understood this Santa Monica dynamic. And he built this wonderful, beautiful open air center that actually wound up getting a whole bunch of awards for how, how well designed it was. But the problem was that cost a whole lot more. And so the city was very anxious to make this design thing work well. So it kind of bent over backwards. That's why the free rent, that's why we paid for all, the city paid for all the parking. That's why there was no rent charged and why we even accepted certain costs and uh, certain costs that are not typically paid for by a ground landlord. They are typically paid for by a, uh, by, a by, by a ground lessee. This was done to get a very particular, more expensive, less profitable project. I mean, all that wonderful open space that you're looking at was was regarded at the time as being rentable space. And uh, and as a consequence the city got the design it wanted in consideration for making the getting the design it wanted. It basically wrote a very, very relaxed ground lease. Also, ground leasing was pretty new in that era. We didn't, we didn't know. I mean, I, I, I've been doing ground leases since the early 1980s and the, 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 the level of landlord control has really changed during that period. Landlords get a lot more now. So, but you have to understand why we, we're, we're, we're in the situation we're in. You know, I can't even tell you how much I think, I, I think I speak on behalf of everyone, how much that story benefits us. It's important for us to understand how this started and how we got here. And my question now is, we I, I, I hope <laughs> we've learned from this and we're at this crucial moment where we are looking at renegotiating a, a deal going into a, a, a looks like what looks like a positive partnership what can we do as a city to make sure we do it better this time so my question is do we have any language in here if it's in there i didn't see it so please direct me do we have any language in this uh development agreement for enforcement if for any reason something doesn't go as we hope you know for me let me let me rephrase that i would assume that any project like this has this business plan has you you mentioned before it's confidential but it has milestones it has you know timelines that things are expected to happen and goals are supposed to be reached if those don't happen we as a city do we have enforcement in place do we have some some language in there that allows us to hold our partners uh, accountable and, and make sure that we don't fall into those previous habits that we got stuck in before. Um, Commissioner Bonderson, we have, uh, that was one of the goals in this DDA is, or DDA, sorry, DA, is that we have provided for um, stronger enforcement mechanisms with regard to the maintenance and the operation provisions. We've um, included liquidated damages in the maintenance provision so that if they do not comply with the maintenance requirements, we can, through our inspection provisions, impose $100. It's, and it's not a lot, but it's only $100 a day for each item that isn't maintained according to the standards. And we have um, imposed a requirement that we have a a third party inspector go out once every three years at the expense of, of PNO to do an inspection and provide us with a report as to how the maintenance obligations are being complied with. Um, and it is a default under the DA if they don't comply with those provisions. And if they do default, then they lose the, the opportunity to extend the lease. Same with the operating requirements. So, um, and, and and so we have, you know, that was 
really an important part of this is we have upgraded and made more stringent these maintenance and operating requirements. Commissioner so, Bonderson, I'm going to do a time check. Excuse me for a minute. Um, it is five. It is five thirty-five, and there are uh, we have um, four remaining commissioners with questions. And I'm. I thought I was going to be able to maybe conclude at six. I'm now looking six thirty. I would really like to get everybody back to their respective dinner hours before we take uh, a vote to continue the motion. So. Um, let me ask you, are, are you in comfortable wrapping up? Uh, I, I, actually soon? Have, I actually have uh, uh, two follow up questions to this to this particular uh, discussion we're having, and I think I can wrap it up. Yes. OK, and then we'll go to Commissioner Escobedo. Thank you. Thank you as well. Um, I'll keep an eye on my uh, time here. Um, so I, I, I hate the fact that I think I forgot where we were going with this, but I we were just talking about enforcement. So let me rethink this. Um, Ms. Connect, based on what you just said, uh, is that information that you just uh, presented to us, is it in this document? It is. Can you bring us to that area, please? Sure. I can try to, let's see. Um, so if you look at, um, and I would have to go to your bigger packet here to get the actual page numbers here. But if you look at section uh, 2.5.4, no, that's, sorry, that would be, um, sorry, take 3.1.6. Yep. Section 3.1.6 is the maintenance requirement. And that would be on page. Uh, 35 yep. out of 35 of 118. 34 beginning on 34 of 118. to 35 of 118 that describes the maintenance requirements. Um, do you do find we, that? Yes, I have it in front of me. Do we, do we have a, I, I assume it's confidential, so we don't have the opportunity to see it, but do you have some form of like long, you know, short to long term goals and milestones set out for let me do that one. No, let, 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 let me ask you. Okay, let me answer that. Uh, we have been shown we were shown a business plan. And I analyzed the business plan. And based on my analysis, which was done under considerable confidentiality restrictions, I, I made recommendations to the city. That business plan is largely irrelevant. It's irrelevant because of both the pandemic and Nordstrom's closing. Uh, we have never gotten another one now. The performance that we were asking for when that we focused on was the core reason that the city went forward with this, which was the investment. They wanted to make sure that they got the investment in reviving center and reviving State Street. And in a sense, the, uh, the, the lessee PNO has overperformed in that regard. It's, it, it's, it, it has been done and it costs more. Uh, and and I, you know, the, we, we should acknowledge that. But when we were looking at performance, we were not looking at what you're thinking of which was a long-term business plan. I did look at that, but it was not a condition of their approval. It was just basically, did it make sense? And was it in the city's interest? Was it in the city's long-term interest to, to, to grant this transaction? And after I provided my report, the city concluded that it was. But the, the only true performance thing in, in the document, they done. They made, they made the investment that they promised them. Now it it, 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 it it changed somewhat in form, but they they, they have done that. Uh, we we have in, we have 
Separately from that, we have enforcement provisions in the that would normally have been in a tough ground lease, which we which are not in our ground lease, which we put in the development provision. And the two most important are maintenance and resale. And they're both really tough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Commissioner, if I could comment as well, please, if you wouldn't mind. Um, a, a couple things. One, uh, I, I think it's inaccurate to say our business plan is uh, no longer relevant for what Mr. Coden uh, reviewed. That's simply completely false. Um, what we've done as far as the business plan that we put forth to the city is we implemented it. We basically set forth the first stage of that, which was the renovation, which we spent more than we initially budgeted to do, but we've, we've done that. And the business plan though is still exactly what we wanted to do, which is revitalize the main mall, period. We had plans on figuring out um, most likely a movie theater in the Macy's at that particular time, and we assumed Nordstrom would be there. If Nordstrom stays or goes, and they're gone now, to us is somewhat irrelevant. We think that that space, that building has utility, that building has adaptive reuse capabilities. We think that the city will benefit because we are gonna focus, if we end up acquiring it, uh, being able to go after a grocery store. A grocery store such as Whole Foods could be every bit as productive sales-wise as Nordstrom was as far as total sales. Therefore, it brings back the sales tax revenue and it brings back the uh, the three hundred thousand dollars that we were we were talking about. If we don't use a movie theater on the uh, the Macy's side, we still envision having the ground floor as retail, and it's just simply the upper floors would be office, and you'd still, I would think, get business use taxes and the like out of that. But we we have a. a a direction and a vision and strategy on the main mall that was not dependent upon the anchors on either side of us. And that vision and strategy is still relevant and is still moving forward in the general direction that we have. The retailers are certainly changing, but the entertainment, the restaurants, uh, the local flavor that we're trying to curate to is all the same. Nothing has changed on that. So since you brought this up, let me ask you a question. How relevant do you consider the, the pandemic to the plan that you have um, previously provided us? How how much do you think that's that's been impacted? Your original plan has been impacted. Um, I, I think it slowed us down in implementation just because the retailers are not doing much right now. They're being very cautious. I mean, as you can see, um, CPK, um, is declared bankruptcy. They're going to reset. You know, I, we think they're going to continue to operate as a as a restaurant, but they're going to restructure their debt. Um, so bankruptcies are one big thing that's putting a pause button on all retail right now. Um, Eureka, great great retailer, great restaurant. Um, nothing's going to change there. Orange Theory is still a tenant that we would have gone after pre COVID and post COVID. Um, again, the, the lineup of, of tenants that I outlined before, as far as the curation, that was true months ago. That was true years ago. And we're still are going to go after those old tenants. So I think that my, this just kind of naturally leads into my very final question. I'll be wrapping it up back to our city representatives, our attorneys, um, knowing where we are in this pandemic, knowing that we clearly are dealing with, um, the, the issues that the PNO team very logically bring up with, with bankruptcy and, and, and tenant loss. Do we have that clause? Is there a performance and enforcement clause in here or can we add one so that we really cover ourselves as a city, as, a, as an entity in going into such a uh, unique uh, contract at a moment that is so, so, unusual in time. So um, I'm not quite understanding what you would be at, what we would be enforcing against. Maybe you could just explain a little bit what, 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 what you anticipate we would need to enforce. Absolutely. So a concern that comes to my mind, I'll use it sort of as an example, is if for any reason, after this initial uh, capital investment that they've, you know, really pushed forward and gone above and beyond. It's fantastic. But 
from here forward, if for any reason they cannot meet the financial terms, they cannot make uh, this, uh, this mall into the vision that they foresee um, with all this anticipated excitement, if for any reason they don't hit these goals and milestones, they have to bail out on the deal or they're just not succeeding as planned. Where is the provision in the agreement that ensures that we as the public are not left holding you know, the weight of this deal? How does this, how do we assure, ensure that things don't get slowed down, that the, the mall is not again um, maintained and, and, and taken care of for 30 years? You know, we've seen it before. How do we ensure that doesn't happen again? I'm I'm really concerned about how you know what the repercussions might be. There's always risk. We all know it. How does this agreement reinforce our safety? How how can we right. okay. hold them accountable? And right. Connect, excuse me, Miss Connect. As soon as you sure. answer, Commissioner Bonderson. I'm going to ask her to um, step back, and we're going to have Commissioner Escobedo come forward. Um, again, thank you so much. Just a little time management. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so the specific requirements in the DA, all of the specific requirements, all of the covenants that the PNO are required to comply with, all of the money obligations and the $20 million investment and all of the payment requirements, the maintenance obligations, um, any one of those that they fail to comply with would be a default or a breach under the agreement. If they fail to comply with any one of those, we would put them on notice that they were in breach of the agreement. They would have an opportunity to cure that. If they fail to cure it, we would terminate the agreement. They would then lose their ability to get the extension of the lease. We would be done. That would be it. They would still have the ground lease however. Um, so all of those definitive obligations have, have those enforcement mechanisms behind them. The, the larger plan that they're talking about in terms of, you know, the reinvestment in the mall, you know, those kinds of less specific things that are not actual covenants in the DA, are not enforceable obligations in the DA. Thank you, Ms. Kniff. Thank you, Commissioner Bonderson. Commissioner Escobedo, could you please uh, turn your webcam on? I'd like to go to your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a, a quick question for you, Madam Chair. Um, we're at 5.50 approaching, and we have four more commissioners. Uh, do we still plan on getting all of our questions in before adjourning today? Well, that's an excellent question, which is why I've been trying to balance allowing everyone due time, but also moving us forward. And all of these questions are important. And of course, the answers of are course. as important. Um, why don't I do this? Um, Commissioner uh, Higgins, are you still with us today by audio? Yes, I am. Okay. Sure. And yes. Uh, and if I may, I think that's a great question by Commissioner Escobedo. And just a, a comment, I've learned a ton, uh, way more than what's in the staff report. And, and while I have some questions, I, I probably would have a lot more um, after I really think about <clears throat> some of what I heard today. So um, if, if it's, um, you know, I, I, I'd be interested in and continuing to try to keep to our, our or newer sort of protocol of six. I'm uh, sorry, Commissioner Higgins, I didn't hear. I didn't hear the last part. I'm sorry, Commissioner Higgins. Could you just repeat the last part of what you said? It was yeah, a little difficult. Have, um, waiting until we reconvene for my question. Okay, thank you. We might need to do that. Um, Commissioner Lodge, before I come back to Commissioner Escobedo, did you want to respond to his question just for our consideration today? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Wiscom did an excellent job of asking just about all the questions that I have. So, uh, but I do have a couple left for Mr. Coden. So <laughs> I would like to ask those. 
Okay, well, I just heard, uh, let me see if I can balance this. Um, Commissioner Higgins said he wouldn't mind waiting till the continuation date to ask his questions. Uh, I, as chair, typically do go last, so um, I may not be able to ask my questions today. Commissioner Escobedo, do you have a sense of how much time you might need? Again, I wouldn't want a shortcut uh, from all the preparation. I know that you and every commissioner has done. I have about 10 to 15 questions. Okay. Um, Commissioner Lodge, if you're all right with this, and I was hoping to get through questions today, but it's not looking as though that's feasible. And I appreciate everyone's patience and stamina uh, in the course of this. If we could conclude, uh, Commissioner Escobedo, your questions today, um, and then I'd like to do a time check and we may need to take Commissioner Lodge's, Higgins, and my questions um, because uh, at the continuation, I do not want us to go past 6.30. It's been part of my commitment to my colleagues, uh, discussions with staff. Um, that's, that's where I'm headed. Commissioner Lodge, did you have one more thought before we let Commissioner Escobedo proceed? As long as Mr. Coton will be available. Yes, so let's thank you, Commissioner Lodge. Mr. Coton, um, we, oh, he, he is going to make himself available and thank you, Mr. Coton. Of course, that's for I staff to me. coordinate. I, I, I right. can't sign yeah. on to a blank, but, but assuming it's another Wednesday and it's not in the too distant future, I can be available. Well, it'll probably be a Thursday <laughs> just to give you Thursday. a heads up, but yeah. there you go. <laughs> um, and staff will coordinate all of that. So we will make sure that all the pertinent parties are available. Our staff is excellent at that. Okay, let's go to Commissioner Escobedo, and then it's uh, very likely that I'm going to ask for a motion for, to continue. When we do continue, we will uh, then have Lodge, Higgins, and myself take up questions. Uh, thanks again to everyone. Commissioner Escobedo, back to you, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll keep an eye on the time as well. Uh, so for Mr. Coton or Ms. Connect, one of the questions that that came to mind is how is it normal for the terms of a development agreement to be executed before there's an official agreement and so what i what comes to mind is we had a term sheet it was non-binding and it had one of the main centerpieces to this agreement was a 20 million dollar investment into the property and that has been executed to date or it's almost complete so is that is that a normal does that happen often? Uh, th thank you, Commissioner Escobedo. I can't answer that. Um, I've never seen that happen before. Um, and it was done entirely at the risk of the developer. Mr. Connect, do you uh, have any comment or thoughts on that? Uh, I'm Alan Coton. Not, I'm not oh, Mr. Coton, sorry. sorry. We work sorry. together. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. My apologies. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I have done many, many statutory development agreements uh, in my, in my, in my history of consulting to public agencies, and I quite frankly, I, I've never, I've never seen one where the major performance obligation was met prior to the official adoption of the of the DA. Thank you. Um, and for the PO group, um, so the $20 million investment, I've heard a couple of times today, was contingent on a lease extension or the option. Uh, is that true? First, and um, was it that a, a member of your group misspoke during the 2019 meeting in which then council member Dominguez asked that exact question and the response was no, that it was not contingent on the extension? Well, go ahead. No, it's the word contingent is probably not the right way to describe it. We, um, again, the, the kind of the constituencies here on the investment side would be the investor and the lender. What we did is we presented to the investor and the lender that we have a term sheet, non-binding, 
from the city of Santa Barbara uh, unanimously approved by the council members. And that what that indicates is that we have a willing partner in the city of Santa Barbara with respect to investing dollars in renovating the main mall. And so we were clear that it is not a contingency. The fact that the city council approved the term sheet unanimously does not, there was no, there was no obligation there, right? We move forward in good faith based on the fact that there was unanimous approval. That was our decision. Now, we did that, again, because we felt that waiting to invest the dollars was the wrong answer, that we needed to invest dollars in this asset as soon as possible, and Pacific Retail as being the group that was brought in to kind of, you know, not rescue the asset <laughs> per se, but really improve it and change the, traje the trajectory of the asset. Our recommendation was that we should move forward we see the city of Santa Barbara as a willing participant and, and a great partner in this effort. And the term sheet is evidence of that. And that's the basis that we move forward on. And just to put a finer point on that as well, prior to the pandemic, retail was very challenged as well. Um, we saw Paseo Nuevo in great need of repair and attention and redevelopment. We, we basically equated it to a melting snowball that if we continue to wait much longer, this was going to melt completely and it was going to really be hard to pull it out of uh, the dive that it was in. So again, on good faith and because of just requirements of trying to, to turn this asset around as quickly as we could, we can't get retailers to look at this asset in the condition it was. No, no retailer was interested in coming into the property. They all looked at it as something that was dilapidated and falling apart unless we had done something that was meaningful to reposition it and to reinvigorate it, we were going to get no traction whatsoever on the leasing, which means from a financial standpoint, this was going to be a disaster. So we had to move forward. We couldn't wait any longer. Okay. One of another question that comes to mind is where did the $20 million figure come from and how was it decided on where it would be allocated and what sort of improvements would be made? Well, we had an overall vision for what we wanted to do to improve the asset from the standpoint of landscaping, signage, lighting, um, seating areas, um, interactive areas and the like. And we engaged Gensler to come up with a conceptual plan, uh, which we liked. Um, we worked on that plan um, until we settled on something that we thought was appropriate and then engaged with the city and the HLC. The uh, HLC gave considerable comments that uh, were time consuming and uh, costly to revise. And we came up with a plan that uh, we ultimately thought was a good plan. It was a good plan that worked for the HLC um, as well as for us and met our overall direction that we had initially put forth. Um, on top of that, the investment, our investors uh, were comfortable with where we ended up, but that took two years to get that completed. It was a much longer time frame than what we thought. Uh, we originally, for example, only thought we were gonna have to spend $12 million. Um, we ended up having a major storm drain issue, um, which was an improvement of the overall in infrastructure of, of the, uh, the property that cost almost $5 million to, to add, add that work into the property. So there was you know, just a lot of unforeseen circumstances that occurred. Right. Um, and, and what I'm struggling with right now is that there, this term sheet had limited review. It did have review by city council and it got unanimous approval, but part of the development agreement process is that it, it goes, it gets vetted. And this is one of the bodies in which it gets vetted. And so because one of those terms is executed, it puts us in a hard place of there has been a substantial investment but very little public vetting in terms of what that investment is and and where it's going so um i had it's more of comments so I'll, I'll i'll move on uh this might be for misconnect uh so early um or or mr coton uh, early in the negotiations, it appeared that the Ortega building was uh, a part of the discussion. And one way or another, it doesn't matter who decided, it got bifurcated. Circumstances have changed. 
quite a bit since then. Is there a vehicle in which the Ortega building can be reincorporated into this development agreement or, or are we in too deep? We're too far into the process and it would have to be its own development agreement or otherwise. Uh, thank you for that question. If we went back, we certainly it would take a lot to add it into this development agreement, but we could do that. Um, it would it would it would slow this particular development agreement down, um, or we could you know re re revamp and restart the negotiations on the Macy's our Ortega building discussions that we had, you know, actually gone down quite, quite far in discussions uh, originally on the Macy's plan before, you know, we separated the two. So it, it could go either way. Um, you know, uh, it, it could go either way. And there's, there's and nothing to preclude that. Commissioner Escobedo, just to, just to kind of give you the P and O um, perspective, you know, if you think of the fact pattern here, JP Morgan owned this for 20 years. You know, we came in as a partner. We have expertise in doing this. We've renovated quite a number of centers. Um, and so we come in, we recommend a renovation. Uh, we start with the, you know, Historic Land Use Commission in 2016. In January of 2017, we approached city staff for an extension of the ground lease. So, you know, we come in, we recommend a renovation, we start the conversation with the city, the Historic Land Use Commission in 2016, and city staff for the ground lease extension in 2017. Uh, we move forward all the way to January of 2019, and we get, you know, city council uh, unanimous approval of the term sheet, again, non-binding, so acknowledging that fully, but we get city council approval of the term, unanimous approval of the term sheet, and we immediately move to start to invest dollars in the asset because we felt it was a situation where you needed to act quickly. And so we go through that, we finish the $20 million investment. And if there were a wholesale renegotiation of the term sheet, you know, four years after the commencement of the process, after bringing us in, after us convincing the investors and the lenders to move forward on, on the basis of good faith with the city of Santa Barbara. And if there's a wholesale renegotiation, uh, you know, it would, it, would, it would be a chilling, that would be a chilling effect on the ability of at least us as the folks that come in and renovate these types of assets and add other uses to these type of assets. Would, there would be a chilling effect on our ability to raise capital in an already difficult environment for any renovation or development of any type. There would be a chilling effect in us being able to go to the next group of, you know, next equity investor and say, this is a good place to invest dollars, especially if this is after four, this four-year process. Specifically can, I, can I just add? Could I just add one point um, to that? That 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 in our view, the reason that uh, the two deals did not go forward together was a timing issue, and that was because we had uh, requested that the Macy's renovation follow a certain time time schedule that was tied to the 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 Pisano Uevo deal and um pno was not able to to commit to that time schedule on macy's and so that is why the two the two deals separated so i i think that that would be the same problem today if the, if the two were combined yep correct thank you thank you for that um jumping around a little bit so i apologize uh this would be for really anyone, but I think it's going to be the PNO group. Uh, so I went back and I watched the council meetings. I watched both the 2019 meeting and I, and I watched the April update. And during, during the meeting, there were requests by council members and, and I'll throw one out there. A specific one is uh, council member Snedden requested that solar be incorporated or that we look into incorporating solar. Um, and I have two questions. One, did we look into that and, and was that investigated? And if so, what was the outcome? And then two, if it wasn't, what that reason was and it, was it because it wasn't explicitly stated in the term sheet? Hey, Jonathan. I can, I can yeah. Um, so we, we did 
look at that. We've always looked at all of our buildings from an acquisition point of view and all the way through redevelopment. Uh, it was too costly. We've also looked at the, the Ortega building as well. Uh, we ended up doing an LED retrofit for energy conservation for the entire project. And then as uh, Oscar pointed out earlier, we're actually one of the first projects uh, around the country that from a, a repurpose and a renovation became LEED certified. Um, and so we took that initiative because it's a, it's a gold standard for us as a company for water conservation, energy efficiency, et cetera, uh, to make sure that we have that. So we were at the forefront of that. And so we weren't, we weren't able to incorporate solar energy but the lead initiatives and we incorporated a giant study that we were initially did not plan on investing in, but since it was um, very important to Pacific retail and to our investors, we did that and we were successful in achieving that lead certification. And to put and a finer point there, sorry, to put a finer point there is the primary reason that solar didn't work is because this is not an enclosed mall. So there's not enough roof area to generate the proper wattage. Number one, number two, the portion of the roof that we control is too small to generate enough wattage for it to make sense. And so what about the Ortega building since uh, it looks like you looked into that building as well? So for the Ortega building, we didn't know what the plan was for the building. It's still a possibility in the future. And John, I'll let you, yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, since it's a fluid conversation as we discussed before, we look at all different energy efficiencies, including solar for all of our projects and redevelopment. So that's certainly a viable uh, potential for that project, just depends on what the uses ultimately are. In that building. And what level of uh, lead certification did you get approved for? We received a silver. Silver. Um, this is likely for misconnect. Uh, Obviously, this is a special circumstance, but when we're looking at the PBIA numbers, um, and uh, as you noted earlier in the presentation, that uh, we can expect lower PBIA returns, but how, how, uh, how, by how much does it fluctuate? And obviously, we're in a very special moment right now, given just the state of retail and the pandemic, but um, does it fluctuate quite a bit from year to year? Uh, Commissioner Escobedo, that's difficult for me to answer um, because I don't actually review those records. They come into finance and um, I'm not privy to them. Um, okay. So I can't really answer that okay. in terms of the fluctuation, fine. but I think they do. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, no worries. And and I guess a somewhat related question, but do we know what the value of this extension is? Have we calculated if, for example, we collected what a uh, market rate rent would be, or a minimum rent, whatever whatever that would be, that's uh, competitive with even if we just looked at the the malls that we are using to compare as uh, first class examples. Um, do we know what that value is and what a uh, another company in some other city would pay on a yearly basis? And the reason I ask is I want, it would be nice to know that metric and be able to compare that to what we anticipate in, in returns in regard to the PBIA, the trash, the um, parking, and then obviously also factor in the $20 million. Well, let me take a little crack at that. Number one is we actually discussed whether or not we should bother computing the market rent of this project and we didn't. Uh, I, I, I brought up the issue was the, the lease is what it is. We have, we have, 40 some years left of no rent. And the thought was that we would just be raising a, a red flag if we um, went and calculated what the market rent would be. Uh, the market rent for this project is difficult to uh, estimate. It would be at a very, at a, at a minimum 
several hundred thousand dollars to a, between one and two million if it were functioning as a full scale regional shopping center, but it isn't. <laughs> and so uh, that's a really tough recommendation. Uh, the ground lease itself, if we own the ground free and clear, and we got a four to six percent return on on our on on, on the nominal ground value, it would be, it would be a, a few million dollars a year because it's a very valuable piece of land. Uh, but I can't answer it with any precision because basically it it, it, it it's a careful calculation, and uh, I've never been directed to do it. The one thing I can say, which I think is 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 relevant here uh, to your decision is that there is some value, but not a huge value, but there is some value in the extension because the extension means that their property is worth more because it doesn't have an expiring lease. And I need to amplify that just a little bit briefly because it was the question of an expiring lease which created the requirement that we extend in order to get the uh, to get the investment, the $20 million. And uh, I was asked, and if you read the council meeting me memo, uh, you probably saw it, was asked to value that. Uh, that's probably worth at least a couple of million dollars. It could be worth as much as $10 million. And it's very variable because you have to make two very big assumptions. One is what is the growth rate between now and the exp uh, uh, ex uh, expiration of the ground lease? and to what would be the capitalization rates that would apply to uh, the use of this property in the future. And they, they were both guesses, which is why the range is so, so wide. Uh, now I do wanna, I wanna remind you, and it's not my job to make the case for either side here. I wanna remind you that at the time, it appeared rational to, to create at least the result of which is we don't get any ground rent. And couldn't couldn't we? I guess there's multiple ways to 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 do this, but there needs to be some inherent value that would exist in this extension, and that's where all negotiations kind of start. Is we have a an asset, it has value, and and both sides negotiate what that value is, but even if we looked at what the minimum rents used to be and calculated that out for just that, that term lease, doesn't that give us something in, we could say that uh, that's generally what it's worth and compare that to what we're getting in return for PBIA parking trash. Would that yes, not be a logical? Yes, we could. And if you so direct the staff to do that and they direct me to do it, I, I can do that. I can't do it while 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 we're talking here, though. Correct. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to swing. Uh, I, I I I want it to be well documented. So Absolutely. yes, it is, it is possible to make that estimate. Yes. And and related to that, and this might be for misconnect is. Uh, I believe this is what Vice Chair Wiscombe was getting at earlier uh, in her questioning, is. Is there a mechanism for us to say for the remaining ground lease that you have currently, it stays at no rent, but for the extension, if it's executed on, that we then have a minimum rent for that those 28 years so that there's not free rent or it's not, and I understand the distinction, but so that there is this uh there is not zero minimum rents in perpetuity mm -hmm. so at some point there's an end a termination point commissioner es escobar um escobito i'm sorry it, no? sure i think we could negotiate a clause to add to the da that provided that if that the extension is exercised and we get to that point that there'll be some mechanism to calculate some formula to calculate a rental provision that it, at that point we'd have to do an amendment to the lease to add that clause into the lease and a, a calculation to formulate what that rental provision would be. But 
you know, we would, we could, if, if the commission so directed us, we could uh, try to negotiate that with the applicant. Okay. And, and commissioner, if I could comment on that, I mean, you know, the, the lease for the next 47 years um, has no rent because the rent was prepaid at the, in 1990. Um, but we feel that we are quote paying rent from the standpoint that we spent $20 million. Um, we have obligations under the DA to continue to make payments and then totality those add up to something. And as uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Bowden points out, um, it's hard to figure out exactly what that is. If it's, you know, 5 million, 10 million, I don't, I don't know what that is, but it's a significant amount of money and we are going to continue to spend money on the property. And, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be around for 47 more years, but the, uh, the ability for the next owner and the requirements of the next owner, owner to provide, you know, a first class place for the city, um, those all go into it. And I, I think those are meaningful considerations as, as you think about this. Definitely. And I, and I agree with you and I get, get that, that portion, um, which is why I think it would be helpful to have some sort of a uh, comparison to what it would be had we had minimum rents and compare that to what uh, you're paying for PBIA, trash, parking, because if it's comparable, then yeah, it makes, a, it makes sense. It's a slam dunk. But if it's not, then that's where I think we need to have a discussion and revisit some of those topics. Um, this question is for Ms. Connect. I'm gonna, uh, I believe this is also what Vice Chair Wiscombe was um, discussing as it pertains to the use covenant. And uh, this is on page 34 of the staff report, page 15 of the development agreement. And it it's that discussion or comparison to other, um, what we have deemed as first class malls. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just hoping uh, maybe you could walk me through what that process looks like when we are um, maybe comparing it to a Victoria Gardens there has to be some sort of objective measure, right? It's not that um, I decide to go to Victoria Gardens, I had a better time, so I come back and I say, oh, this is not a first class mall. Uh, it what is that objective measure and why is it not outlined in this, this clause? Um, so what we're looking at is similar size and type. Um, and, and we thought that actually identifying and, and you know I, I I admit maybe we're we were wrong in in using identifiable locations that we could look at and say centers like these similar to these are what we are because we think that these centers are well maintained and that they have management companies that maintain them to a certain first class um, standard. And I believe, and, you know, Mr. Coton can confirm and also, you know, that the Mr. Plenji can also confirm they are in this business. And when you say a first class commercial retail center in Southern California, that means something. Um, and they can look at these centers and say, yes, those centers are maintained to this specific standard. And, I think that when that, oh, so, sorry, ahead. I think that that's what we meant. And maybe we didn't get there by this, and maybe we could go back and try and do a better job. But it, in my mind, that's what we meant. And if, if the San Nuevo falls below that in terms of its maintenance standards, then you know, we could go and say, you know, and and, and it, it does provide that these centers can be changed out too. Like if these, if these centers aren't operating anymore or if they fall below whatever that first class center means, then we can change them out. But, you know, I think to people in the business, and I'm not, you know, but I think to people in the business, it does mean something. I'd agree with that. I'm more wondering what is, where's the threshold and when do we figure this out? Is this the every three years when we send somebody to assess 
the property and they're objectively comparing it to some of these other what we've deemed first class uh, malls. When when will we know that they are out of compliance? At right. what I threshold? Think it, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think it is every three years because that's when we do the evaluation and that's when we have teeth in it mm -hmm. to say you're not complying. Okay, so every three years, the the property will be assessed by a, a professional. They'll have a report. That's that's what we're going to use to as the objective measure to decide whether or not this is operating the way that the development agreement explains. Correct. Okay. And Thank and, you. and and if I could add though, every year. The applicant PNO has to do an annual report to the development uh, development director, community development director, to say they're in compliance with the development agreement. So in that report as well, they would have to say, yes, we're maintaining the center to these standards. So it would be, you know, that annual report would, would have to say, yes, we are complying. And, you know, if the community development director disagreed with that, then that would, would also be a violation of this development agreement. And then every three years, we would have this audit. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Give me one second. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm finishing up pretty soon here, so um, we should be able to hit that 6.30 deadline. Um, for the, the P&O group, uh, one of your slides had mentioned that um, you highlighted the fact that there was no uh, no change of use, no increase in density, um, and uh, no change in zoning. And, and I, I think I heard you earlier that uh, currently housing is not, um, we would have to change, uh, we would have to amend the ground lease in order to incorporate housing. But... Yes, please. Yes, sorry. Um, uh, the CBD is one of the, f the few areas in which many people agree that that's appropriate for increased density, increased height when it comes to housing. And so my question to you is, did you investigate whether or not it was feasible to put housing on uh, this property in particular, not the Nordstrom's, not the Macy's, but this property? And uh, if so, what was the outcome of that? And if not, why not? Uh, we did not investigate that because ground floor housing in the configuration as currently laid out in the main mall makes no sense for housing. Um, and I mean, I mean, not ground floor housing. Uh, if any of those buildings were feasible to add a second floor, add more density so that you can have a uh, mixed use in, in that Paseo Nuevo? Um, you know, given, given the severe restrictions that exist on the site with zoning and talking with the city regarding um, getting height variances and density variances, it, was, it was, would take years to be able to get even approval um, and the cost of carrying that and the cost of doing that made no financial sense. Um, we did look briefly at the Macy's building. Uh, if we could knock it down and build something that's probably six to eight stories, um, that would be very commercially viable uh, for housing uh, on a brand new structure like that. Uh, we were dissuaded by the city in our general conversations to pursue that route because it would take years and would require, require a public vote uh, to amend the specific plan. So we, we opted not to go down that sort of brain damage. Um, on the, the main mall though, again, um, the, the structural integrity of those buildings will not allow for um, floors to be built on top of those. Um, it's just, it's very cost prohibitive with the structural engineering that has to, has to go on. Um, we, we love the idea of mixed use. We think it's, it's absolutely the way for the future. Um, we think, the kind of the beauty of the main mall as it is, and it's certainly the way it's been renovated is fantastic. It's a great amenity for whatever goes in Nordstrom's or, or the Macy's block. And it stands by itself as something that's uh, attractive, uh, works for the community, 
will be a good drawing and, and central um, gathering point for the community in that area. Where on your priority list would you put acquiring the Nordstrom's building and putting housing there? Uh, number one, number one. I mean, you know, we 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 have a great relationship with Nordstrom. Uh, Jonathan Rood, who heads our development, has a direct line into the head of real estate. Um, he's been communicating with them on a on a regular basis. Uh, Nordstrom has made the decision to hire a consultant, which we're in contact with, um, to sort out what the value of their leasehold interest is. They have um, some leaseholds and they have a number of fee positions that they've, they've closed. And now they're just figuring out what if any value is associated with that. Um, we hold up the fact that there is an REA in existence. Um, they have to work with us. Um, we are a, a group that they can't necessarily dismiss. Uh, we'll take an aggressive posture with them in those negotiations um, to try to work out as good a deal as we can with them, but we think it's super, super critical to acquire that piece and maintain control over that. It's the same reason why we acquired Macy's. Uh, we spent a lot of money on the Macy's building. Uh, we did not want that to go to somebody that was not part of the overall um, um, mall project or the retail project. Uh, our goal is to have a cohesive project. I think, you know, in our long-term view, um, if we're successful in this, we'd love to look to acquire other pieces of the blocks surrounding us that we could also incorporate and look to revitalize. Uh, the Balboa building, I mean, that looks like a no-brainer to convert to, to residential if you could. Um, it'd be something that if we don't do it, somebody else will probably do it in the future, but it would be a great fit for it. And we think housing in the downtown core is an absolute essential to have that 24-7 sort of uh, activity. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, last question that I have is for uh, Ms. Connect. We're going to end this meeting and we're going to have some time to, to think about all the good information we've gotten today. Uh, what is what is within the Planning Commission's purview to change or add to this agreement? Uh, could we add something that is not in the agreement? Does it have to be have a direct nexus to what's in the development agreement currently? The recommendations that the uh, Planning Commission can make are to recommend to the City Council approval of the agreement, approval of the agreement with modifications, or to deny the agreement and denial is final subject to appeal to the city council. So and, in my oh. view, that means that approval with modifications means that you can recommend approval with modifications. So I think in my opinion, if you wanted to recommend modifications to the agreement, that's what that means. So if you wanted to ask staff to go back and negotiate any parts of this agreement, you could do that or add that would, things to this agreement or take things away to this from this agreement. I don't see that you're limited in, in any, any way. Okay. Thank you. And so that would be the process. It would be you may not, would we may not be successful in negotiating <laughs> any of those. <laughs> Um, we're, as you can see, we're up against tough adversaries in this process, so they may reject those and just, you know, so, but we can, you know, so that's tough partners. I, I would not call us adversaries, tough please. Partners. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, partners. <laughs> <laughs> and Commissioner uh, Escobedo, we can, we can take that up during deliberations, certainly. Yes. Sounds, sounds we're gonna, good. We're, we will do in our continuation hearing. And, we and sure that's it, that's did it you, for me. Did you, it is? Okay. All yeah, right, thank you, again. everyone, for, for a long and very good hearing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank um, you. So thank you. This, is, this was part one. Uh, there's going to be a part two. And I want to ask uh, Ms. DeBust if the, before we uh, go to a motion, I'm going to ask my colleagues um, 
So let me just, first of all, say for those, um, the staff, uh, Connect, and our consultant, Mr. Coton, and the PNO team, you can go ahead and close your webcams. We're going to come back uh, to the commission for a motion uh, and a vote to continue this item. And I do want to ask Ms. DeBus if there is any continuation uh, information, such as a date that we already may be considering. And if that's premature, that's fine as well, because I know you need to check with a number of parties, Ms. DeBus. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. Um, yes, our agendas are quite full for the next month. Um, the first opening that we have would be on October the 8th. Um, so that would be a regular planning commission meeting. Um, so if you wanted to continue to a date certain, that would be the first available agenda. Alternatively, you could um, continue indefinitely, um, which means we would need to re-notice the project and return um, at the date that makes most sense. Well, Ms. DeBust, let me ask you, I would like to move this along. Um, and before I go to Ms. Ostranger, if we include in our motion a recommendation to continue to uh, October 8th pending coordination, that is availability of all the key parties, could we include that? Or maybe I should ask Ms. Ostranger, could we include that in a motion with some of that language, Ms. Ostranger? Chair Schwartz, um, yes, you could. I would say it would be a recommendation to um, I suppose the date that Ms. DeBusk just mentioned. And if that was uh, not a date that was workable for all necessary parties that you give staff the discretion to choose um, the next available date. Very good. So we heard it here from Ms. Ostranger, very well said. Um, and I hope Ms. Ostringer won't go away. We may need to come back to her for that uh, excellent articulation of a motion. Um, and then I see uh, Commissioner Wiscom, would you like to um, kick this off perhaps? Yeah, yes, Madam Chair. I, I just wanna say, um, is there any possibility of doing a special meeting on August 27th of, of this? Um, Mr. Busk, uh, you can come back on. While Mr. Busk is coming back on, let me comment if I could. Uh, I've been in discussion with Mr. Busk about trying to give all of us, that is the Planning Commission and staff, some breathing room. We have such momentous hearings back to back. Uh, we have an all day, literally all day hearing next Thursday, the 20th. So we're trying to allow for recharge and to maintain our stamina. Um, did you have a thought in response to Commissioner Wiscom's question, Ms. DeBusk, from what I just said? Chair Schwartz and Commissioner Wiscom, I was just going to say that that is at the discretion of the Planning Commission. Um, you don't have a hearing that date, so if you wanted to continue to a special hearing, it's at your discretion. Well, I, I guess, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess, um, Madam Chair, I I think this is fresh in our minds. I think this is a, a meaty document that, that we've gone through and we've had a lot of really, really relevant commissioner questions. And um, although I hate to build up our schedule, I think that that a, a special meeting on, on uh, the 27th might be appropriate to finish this item and move it back to city council. That's okay. my feel. Thank you. Um, let me just, before we go to commissioners, uh, Mr. Bus, before we ask the commissioners for their response to that, is there, or are there any other obstacles uh, that from the staff perspective on a, hosting a special meeting on the 27th of August? Any staff members absent or otherwise unavailable? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I haven't had the opportunity, obviously, to check with City TV um, to confirm with them. Um, but okay. um, I believe, and, and perhaps you can ask um, Ms. Connect and Ms. Kennedy just to confirm their availability as well as the applicant, you'd wanna check with them. Hmm. 
Well, let's do this. Um, Ms. Commissioner Wiscombe, since you offered that up, how about if we craft the motion, which I think Commissioner Wiscombe was willing to make in such a way that we sort of tier our recommendations. In other words, our first preferred option would be special meeting August 28th, pending availability by necessary parties. Uh, if that is not feasible, can we go to a, uh, October 8th, something like that? Ms. Ostranger, did you wanna jump in before come back to Commissioner Wisdom? Yes, Chair Schwartz and commissioners. Uh, I think if we start tearing off those dates, I, I, it wouldn't necessarily be a date certain and we okay. would have to re-notice the, the project. So I would okay. suggest that um, if you do want to do the special meeting that um, we do the similar language, like I suggested that it's a um, to move to the meeting to the next special meeting date. And uh, that if that is not available for all necessary parties, um, that staff uh, will take the next available date and then we okay. will release the project. Okay, very good. Um, is, does, is, are you comfortable with that, Commissioner Wiscom? That recommendation? Yes. Okay. Yes, um, I am, and, but I see yes. Commissioner Lodge and uh, Commissioner Bonderson and Commissioner yes. Escobedo on here. Do they have any yes. comments about uh, before I make a motion about that? No, other than I, I agree with it. I'd, okay. I'd, rather not, I'd rather not put it off six weeks. Okay, yeah, I, I uh, that's that's my feeling too. So if if it's okay. all right, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion. Um, and we and still have, I think we still have Commissioner Higgins by phone, so we're going to include him in the vote when we do okay. that. Thank you. Okay, so I move that that um, we continue this item to um, um, uh, hopefully, uh, I'm sorry, we continue this item to a special meeting on, on August 27th, Thursday, August 27th. And if that date is not available for parties to participate, then the next available date that staff determines is appropriate for uh, the continuation. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, hearing none, Ms. Rydell, if you've been patiently still with us, could you please do a voice vote on that continuation motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I'll begin the roll call vote. And I'm sorry, Heidi, can you put your microphone down, please? Sorry, I snack in between these motions. Um, Commissioner Lodge? Yes. Vice Chair Wiscom? Yes. Commissioner Higgins? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Absent. Commissioner Bonderson? Yes. Commissioner Escobedo? Yes. Chair Schwartz? Yes. Thank you, that is unanimous with uh, Commissioner Reed absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Rydell. Uh, we would ordinarily conclude our hearing with our administrative agenda, which would be committee and liaison reports. But in the interest of the hour, which is almost a 6.40 p.m., we're not going to cover that today. Ms. Ostringer? Yes, Chair Schwartz, I just wanted to uh, let you know or remind you that we did have one unusual item that the commission had asked us to put on the agenda, which was the consideration of options uh, for acceptance of public comment. I think it would be rather short. Um, we do have a staff recommendation, which is generally just to go back to the way we used to have it. We inadvertently left out language that used to be in our agendas when we went to the virtual meeting. But I'll leave it to the you. Um, and when you say short, you mean five minutes? Ms. Ostringer? Chair, Chair Schwartz. Um, yeah, it's two slides, one to show you what your old language used to be and one to show you what the new recommended language that I, I actually believe that the commission will find acceptable. Okay, and then we need to take a vote on that, correct? Because then we're changing our process, correct? Well, yes, sir. Technically going back to what the process used to be. We're revising it nonetheless, 
and so we still need a, a motion and a vote on that. Okay, let, let's wrap that up. Uh, staff has been so uh, responsive in doing this for us. Thank you, Ms. Ostringer. Go ahead, proceed, please. Thank you, Chair Schwartz. Um, and commissioners, uh, you asked us to come back uh, with some language or a recommendation regarding um, noticing the public that they need to get their public comments in on a certain date so that you have the opportunity to um, review them. The language that's on the screen now uh, is the language that was in your um, agendas prior to our change due to the COVID and the virtual meetings. Uh, if I can direct your attention to what is in red, it says, please note that the commission may not have time to review written comments received after 4.30 p.m. the Monday before the meeting. However, it will be added to the project file and you are welcome to bring written correspondence to the meeting for distributions, provide uh, 12 copies. So that's what it was. It, um, if Mr. Bolton could go to the next slide. So I've, this is your current written public comment language um, that addresses our COVID and the bolded language at the bottom is what I added uh, back in from your prior language that we inadvertently left off. I've um, removed the language about bringing 12 copies to the meeting. Since we don't have book meetings. Uh, and then I've the red language is for you to decide if you want to go back to the time that you had before, which was the 4.30 on the Monday, or if you wanted to choose um, a different time closer to Thursday or farther out. Um, and so I'm going to just quickly leave it to uh, Ms. DeBusk to give you a quick summary of how we accept public comment and it gets um, transmitted to you. Thank you. Um, yes, so the way that we submit public comment to the Planning Commission is at the end of each workday, um, Ms. Rydell collects all the public comments received and sends an email to the Planning Commission, which is why a 430 cutoff means that you will see all of those comments on that Monday. We'll send it out Monday evening. Um, for example, if the cutoff were end of day Monday, you would get all those comments um, Tuesday evening. So that's the way it currently works is we wait till the end of the day so that you can receive all of the public comment at once. Um, so just so that you're aware of that process in case that affects your feedback on what time of day or what day you'd like to use as the cutoff. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I wanna ask Commissioner Wiscom who initiated this change, this administrative change, because I have a different recollection of what I thought we were going to use in a revision. Commissioner Wiscom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I thought we were using Tuesday and Commissioner Escobedo recommended that we use the end of the business day on Tuesday, um, which for you know, a variety of reasons makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm That's just my trying to- election also, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to understand this. So if, if we use Tuesday at the end of business and we get the, will we get the comments from the public on Wednesday morning? That's my question, which gives us basically a 24 to, you know, 30 hours to review it before our meeting. Uh, Ms. Dubosny, I can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair Wiscom. That would be different than our current policy, which would be to wait till the end of the day. Um, but I believe it's something that we could adjust to in order to get you that correspondence early Wednesday morning. Um, but I would like Ms. Rydell to um, answer because she's the one whose schedule it would be impacting. And I know she also has HLC on Wednesdays. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Wiscom, while we're waiting for Ms. Rydell, I don't wanna parse this too finely, but this phrase end of day, uh, the spirit, uh, 
in which I think I heard, I think it was Commissioner Higgins and Commissioner Escobedo, some combination. When we say end of day, those who can't get to their emails until let's say after the dinner hour, after okay. five o'clock, that was our intention to allow okay. a full day for those who wanted to send us written public comment on that Tuesday before the Thursday. So maybe you could help us with some language, but um, you know, one's business day, there, there are all kinds of ends to a business, a work day for, for folks. Yeah. So Ms. Rydell, could you, could you comment on your ability to, to um, reach us by Wednesday morning at a certain deadline or a certain time or um, to, to, for us to receive written correspondence? Um, well, and the, what helps our section um, process public comment is um, just having a little standardization across the boards um, in case I am for some reason absent or I you know, may not always right. be a, the PC commission secretary or might not always staff HLC. Um, so just the consistency, um, the reason that the Tava suggested that we, we have this language is it's consistent with our other boards. And so that would help um, just make the process um, yeah, just consistent so that if someone else in the section, another secretary needed to take over and process it, they would be familiar with that. We can make a special procedure for planning commission if what would work best for this specific board is that we process comment or public comment on Wednesday morning rather than Tuesday at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I'm not really, I, I will do my best to make whatever decision you come to work. Um, so it's really. Uh, May I comment Commissioner Wiscombe? Yeah, and I, I also have a comment on that. Go ahead. Um, so I've received um, a great deal of verbal feedback from the public, those who have called me, uh, et cetera. And when we receive our packets, which is when the public does end of business day, Thursday, basically right. 5 p.m. If, if the city staff are absent on Friday and then people need to be allowed to have their weekends, Monday comes around and regardless of people's work days, this is just too short a period of time for the public to review, just as it is for us, uh, significant documents uh, to then submit written comments by this date that's in red. That's why I think in the spirit of true public engagement and wanting public feedback, we need to push it to Tuesday. And then I'll go back to Commissioner Wiscom as to how to phrase all this. But that's the spirit and the intent. And and um, Chair Schwartz, I totally agree with you, but I would like to have a cutoff on Tuesday, if we're going to do that rather than by the end of the business day. So I, I agree with 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday before the meeting. Um, I think that's a lot clearer than people that submit comments at 9 p.m. and Ms. Rydell or whoever is the commission secretary, you know, doesn't get to them on time and has a lot of work. So. I, I guess my recommendation would, would be, please note that the commission may not have time to review written comments received after 4.30 p.m. Um, the Tuesday before the meeting. And yes. that way that gives uh, public commenters all of the weekend and Monday um, and Tuesday until 4.30 p.m. to receive their comments, to, to uh, uh, okay. give their comments. And, and if I may clarify um, to Chair, Vice Chair Wiscombe's point, um, I, I would be, and any commission secretary would be processing public comment at 4.30 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday um, regardless. So you will re be receiving any public comment that we receive on Monday 
you right. know, before 4.30 p.m. that day and on Tuesday. Um, so just it, it's more of a matter of the language that you want on the agenda just to advise the public that if they submit the comment after 4.30 um, on that Tuesday, it, it's just, yeah, yeah, how much time you want to give them and make them aware of on the agenda. So hey, if it you, just Rydell. needs to be changed to Tuesday, that's... Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I think easy. that gives the public ample okay. time to submit their comments and gives us the ample time to actually review the comments because we've been receiving very meaty letters after, you know, on Wednesday and Thursday morning and it, it's frankly too much. And, and so, we want to give the public consideration. So that's- So we would just be comments. changing the word Monday to Tuesday, Commissioner Wisdom? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, I'd like to move this along now that we have that understanding now. Um, I could do this, let, I could just try this. Well, why don't I try this? If you make a motion, Commissioner Wiscom, to that effect, let's see if there's a second. Oh, Ms. Osteringer, did you want to? Yes, please. Yes, Chair Schwartz um, and the commissioners, you know, I don't think it needs to be a formal motion because uh, this is a really an administrative thing that the staff does when we craft the agendas, but I think a straw poll just so that we know that the commission is in consensus with this would be helpful for us. Okay, and I see Commissioner Escobedo's raising his hand. Did you wanna first say something before we ask Ms. Rydell to do a straw poll vote? Commissioner just Escobedo. a quick question, just a quick question. Um, if someone sends a public comment after the Tuesday 4.30 deadline, it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't receive it, right? It's just right. us letting them know that we might not consider it when right. before the hearing. That's correct. You will still receive all emails at the end of the day Wednesday of anything that we received okay. during the day Wednesday. And then again, anything before 10 a.m. on Thursday. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, very good. Um, let's go ahead in the interest of time and ask Ms. Rydell to do a, a voice vote on a straw poll. changing the word Monday to Tuesday, looking at the language in front of us, the red highlighted language. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is um, Heidi Rydell and I will begin the roll call vote. Vice Chair Wiscom. Yes. Commissioner Higgins. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Reed, I believe is still absent. Uh, Commissioner Bonderson. Yes. Commissioner Escobedo. Yes. Commissioner Lodge. You can't Commissioner hear you, Lodge, Commissioner Lodge. Lodge. Yes, and I do want to add that it's so nice to see Heidi Rydell that I'm just hearing her voice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chair Schwartz. Yes. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, and thank you, Ms. Ostringer, for reminding us about this. So we were so eager to conclude only because of the hour. Um, so that's gonna wrap up our administrative agenda. And uh, we all need uh, to take a few days now and we're gonna turn right back around and prepare for a, a special meeting Thursday, August 20th. I want to remind the public about this is again, 9 a.m. to 5 or 6 p.m. entire day joint hearing with the Montecito Planning Commission on the roundabout at Olive Mill and Coast Village Road. Uh, so you can find that on the Planning Commission website, the pertinent documents and the agenda. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much to everyone.